Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. Senators, before I go to the next item, I did commit to taking from the chamber um, some objections raised to language in part of the chamber's proceedings yesterday with respect to the national apology. I have reviewed the language that was objected to. Um, and after detailed consideration, including consideration with Senate officials, my determination is that there was not a breach of standing orders in that language. That said, that does not in any way say that the language was appropriate because the standing orders set the outer limits of what we are supposed to say and how we are supposed to act in this parliament and in this chamber. I will repeat a plea I have made on numerous other occasions, that if we seek to maintain courtesies towards others and seek to avoid giving offence, then the debate in this chamber will be much more reflective of our higher aspirations and indeed the aspirations of those who send us here. The rules are the outer limit. They are not an aspiration for us to, to run around the edge of. So can I ask senators again, that particularly when we are dealing with matters about which there are very strong feelings held, that we actually seek to avoid giving offence, rather than to pick at issues that we know will provoke strong feelings in others who may have had very different perspectives based on very different life experiences. Thank you. I thank senators. Order. Order. Senator Thorpe. I'll now call the... No, absolutely. Are you seeking leave, Senator Thorpe? Is leave granted for Senator Thorpe? I'll take it leave is granted, there's no objection. Senator Thorpe, you are entitled to remove your mask if you wish to, to speak. Thank you, we don't want to get into any more trouble. Uh, I seek leave uh, to make a short comment uh, on the um, workplace safety in this chamber and the fact that uh, I've endured racism since I started my role as a senator for Victoria. Uh, there have been numerous comments uh, coming from numerous people, but obviously there's one that uh, refuses to stop uh, the racism that is entrenched in that person's um, being. I need to do my job as a senator for Victoria. I am a woman, I am a mother, I am a grandmother, I am a sister, auntie, cousin, you name it. And a lot of people are watching this place and they are seeing their parliament divided through racism. And if we are going to represent the people in this country at the highest level, then we also have to ensure that racism isn't part of this chamber's business. And we all have to call that out. It is a responsibility of everybody. So please, can we leave racism out the door? I'm happy to talk to people if they want, even, um, what's her name? I can't, I, I just can't because Racism is an illness it, and it also makes people sick. 
My child's just started year seven last year and she experienced her first bit of racism. My five-year-old granddaughter is experiencing her first bit of racism. When are we going to unite this country and stamp out not just systemic racism, but the racist comments that certain people are making in my workplace? This is a workplace, and I have a right to feel safe in my workplace. Thank you. Senator Wong has the call as Leader of the Opposition. I'll then go to you, Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. Uh, first, um, can I thank you for the consideration uh, you uh, took with this matter, Mr President, and I thank you for uh, your comments about which reprise, I think, comments you made from memory after Mr Senator Anning's unfortunate first speech or something like that, where you did remind us that the standing order set the outer limits of appropriateness. Um, uh, and I would endorse those comments, and the Labor Party supports your comments and your ruling. Uh, I would, however, make this point. Um, we are, you know, this is a combat of ideas, a contest of ideas, at times a pretty hard political combat, um, but we ought, I think, uh, seek to try and ensure that we remain uh, respectful of the institution that we are part of, the positions we occupy, uh, and, as I said, I think in Senator Cormann's valedictory, uh, that there are areas of there is a no-go zone. There are you know, rules of contained debate. There's a contained conflict, uh, and I think it, we we should have outside of the zone of conflict uh, personal uh, reflections, particularly those that go to people's race. And Senator Hanson yesterday did uh, make some personal comments, including describing Senator Thorpe. I apologise that I'm going to repeat it, but I'm making a point as a self-styled Aboriginal elite. Uh, and uh, I think those sorts of comments are divisive and they are hurtful. Uh, and they really have no place in a debate which is about a very, very clear difference of views. Uh, so I would. Uh, I understand Senator Thorpe's um, and respect you know, her, her response to this, uh, and I, I would urge us all. I don't think anybody suggests in this place that I'm not prepared to have an argument and have a debate, but I, we all should observe some boundaries around that, uh, and we can only do that if all of us, or as many of us as possible, seek to observe those boundaries. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to make a comment that our party abhors racism. Oh, uh, can I take it that Senator Roberts has been given leave? Thank you. Apologies, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Our party abhors racism. I want to put that on the record. We also believe in data and being objective because there is another thing that is not quite as bad as racism, but it is nasty, and that is to accuse someone falsely of racism. So I would suggest that anybody in this chamber, if they want to maintain the decorum and the prestige and the status of this House and the whole parliament, then they should put up, with, put up by putting forward evidence, documented evidence of racism. That is, that is the, the least we should expect from anyone who's making such an accusation. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I set leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, firstly, thank you for your ruling uh, and the leadership that you provide in this place, uh, and indeed in providing that leadership. Uh, the words that you have reminded senators of again and again in terms of, where necessary, reflecting upon their conduct and being mindful that uh, their conduct uh, can undermine confidence in this place, and indeed in doing so, undermine the achievement of the very policy outcomes that people come here seeking to try to secure. Ours is a robust parliamentary democracy, as Senator Wong acknowledged. We fight fiercely for our ideas, our principles, our values, our policies, as we should. And we do so, at some points of the chamber, from greater extremes than at other points of the chamber. But those extremes should not 
inflame in ways that undermine the standing of this place. And I urge everybody to make sure that they take up their fight for their principles, their values, their policies, their positions as passionately as they possibly can, but to leave the reflections upon one another at the door, to respect, to respect each other. All 76 of us were elected by the peoples of our states and territories. We're chosen by fellow Australians to serve in this place. And we need to respect that whilst seeking to persuade, because the other ongoing element of this part of this parliamentary chamber is that nothing is achieved here without persuasion, without working with other parties to achieve a majority to get things done. And so that respect and power of persuasion from your different positions is a crucial element. There's no place for racism, there's no place for vitriol, there's no place for abuse and there's no place for sexism, there's no place for anything that undermines the position of individuals going about their work, be it here or in any other workplace. But here we are meant to set a standard and in setting that standard we ought to start with how we conduct the debates between one another, argue passionately, argue persuasively, but keep it to the issues. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senators. And I call the clerk. Government business. Government business order of the day number one: Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Bill 2019, and an associated bill, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Watt, I believe. When you're ready, Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Just some last-minute instructions from uh, the reliable Shadow Attorney General's Office. Uh, the Family Court of Australia is a proud Labor legacy. It shares that in common with most of the great social reforms that have occurred in Australia. Reforms like Medicare, our world-leading superannuation system, the anti-discrimination law framework and the provision of free legal assistance services to Australians in need. These reforms have something else in common, and that is that the Liberal Party never misses an opportunity to attack or undermine them. The Liberals are always looking for ways to undermine Medicare and the principle of universal health care in Australia, even as they pretend to support it. The Liberals are always looking for opportunities to attack superannuation. Look no further than the Morrison government's policy to force Australians to raid their retirement savings in the middle of a global pandemic to make ends meet. And one doesn't have to look far for examples of the Liberal Party attacking the legal assistance sector or seeking to water down Australia's anti-discrimination laws. The Labor Party is the party of doing. The Liberals are the party of wrecking. And that brings me to the bills before the Senate today. The Family Court was established by the Family Law Act 1975. That act instituted two major and complementary changes. It instituted no-fault divorce and it established the Family Court of Australia, a specialist multidisciplinary court for the resolution of family disputes. In 1974, the Senate Standing Committee on Constitutional and Legal Affairs, which had been tasked with, review with reviewing the Family Law Bill, said that the Family Court would be, quote, essential to give substance to key aspects of the Family Law, Law Act, including no-fault divorce. And shortly after the passage of the Family Law Act, the then Labor Attorney General Kep Enderby wrote that in public discussion of the Family Law Act, most of the attention has understandably and quite properly focused on the ground of divorce and, to a lesser extent, the maintenance provisions. While not underrating the magnitude of the reforms to the divorce and maintenance laws, I feel sure that, in time, the provision for the establishment of family courts will come to be seen as a reform of equal importance. Kep Enderby was right. The family court's essential distinguishing feature is that it deals only with family law matters. This bill would rob the family court of its essential distinguishing feature by collapsing it into one of Australia's busiest, 
most poorly resourced and overburdened courts, the Federal Circuit Court. The reason why specialisation is so important is that family law matters are not like other matters that generalist courts tend to deal with. The parties to family law matters are not like the parties that generalist courts tend to deal with. As Gough Whitlam said in 1974, the essence of the family courts is that they will be helping courts. Judges will be specially and carefully selected for their suitability for the work of the court. There will be attached to the court a specialist staff, notably marriage counsellors and welfare officers, to assist the parties at any stage and even independently of any proceedings. These courts will therefore be very different from the courts that presently exercise family law jurisdiction. The family court will, of course, determine legal rights, which it is bound to do as a court, but it will do much more than that. Here will be a court, the expressly stated purpose of which is to provide help, encouragement and counselling to parties with marital problems and to have regard to their human problems, not just their legal rights. Parties will not be driven to the court by their own despair as a last resort. They will be encouraged to come to the welfare and counselling staff of the court whenever they have a matrimonial problem, even if they are not contemplating proceedings of any kind. This help would also be available after divorce proceedings, and this would, as I have already indicated, be of great importance where there were young children. The Whitlam government's vision of a specialist family court was of a court with interrelated, co-located services and resources. It was not just about specialist judges. It was about creating an environment that would have regard to what Whitlam described as the human problems of couples and families, including children, and not just their legal rights. And I might observe that anyone who has been near a family court building uh, will have seen that efforts are often made even in the design of those courts um, to in ensure that they are an inclusive uh, atmosphere uh, to address the very real emotional issues that family law matters stir up uh, in participants in those proceedings. The realisation of that vision has never been more important especially for vulnerable children and families who need, family court, uh, need a family court system that is not only efficient but also safe and sensitive to their needs and vulnerabilities. The bills before the Senate today are fundamentally at odds with the vision of the Whitlam government, and that is because this government's radical proposal to merge the family court and the federal circuit court is fundamentally at odds with the principle of specialisation. You don't have to take Labor's word for it. Just ask the, ex the experts. The experts say that these bills will exacerbate many of the problems in the family law system and address none of them. The very first Chief Justice of the Family Court, Elizabeth Evatt AC, has warned that merging the family court into a generalist court will undermine the integrity and the structural specialisation of the family court. The impact of losing this institutional specialisation is not properly understood and has been downplayed. The increasing number of cases in which issues of family violence and child abuse are raised has led to an even greater need today for family law jurisdiction to be vested exclusively in specialised judges who can give their full attention to the needs of family law clients without being diverted to exercise other unrelated jurisdictions. The current bill undermines this principle is not in the public interest and should not be enacted. Alastair Nicholson, the second Chief Justice of the Family Court, who served in that position between 1988 and 2004, has expressed disbelief about the government's proposal. It is worth quoting him in full, and I urge those opposite and indeed on the crossbench to take note of his remarks. Mr Nicholson has said, it is unbelievable that government would propose the dissolution of a federal superior court in this fashion without the most careful and searching public inquiry and without car carrying out significant research and without consulting the many experts in this field. I am firmly of the view that the passage of the Family Law Act 1975 and the setting up of the Family Court were some of the most significant social legislation ever to be passed by the federal parliament. 
What those proposing this merger do not seem to understand is that family law is complex and nuanced, and it is not to be judged by the output of numbers of cases as if the courts are sausage machines. Throughput is important, but so is the quality of the decisions made. Cases can be extremely complex and require specialist knowledge of the type that has always been available in the family court, which has provided leadership in the proper interpretation and principles to be applied by other courts with family law jurisdiction. Many involve the determination of important issues relating to children, including their rights and need for protection, not only from individuals but also from government in its myriad forms. Many also involve problems of family violence and the effects of it upon the parties and their children. Others involve extremely complicated property disputes, either alone or combined, with the above issues and requiring other important specialist levels of legal knowledge, whilst understanding the important family issues that may be affected by the decision. The Family Court is a court that has been envied throughout the common law world and its judgments have often been cited with approval by the courts of many countries including New Zealand, the UK, Canada, the USA and others. Its significance of the, as the only specialist family court set up as a superior court of record, and particularly that of its appeal division, cannot be overemphasised. And it is not just former Chief Justices who are opposed to this proposal. Over 110 family law experts, ranging from the Law Council of Australia to women's legal services, community legal centres, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, child protection advocates and disability services from across Australia have called on the government to abandon this proposal. That's a pretty solid effort to unite that many different groups against a piece of legislation. The President of the Law Council of Australia, Pauline Wright, has said that the proposed merger would result in the effective abolition of the Family Court of Australia, a respected, specialised and focused court dealing with family law issues. The 2019 merger bills, if passed, would also mean that Australian families and children will have to compete for the resourcing and hearing time with all federal matters, that is, other matters like migration, bankruptcy and those sorts of things that the federal circuit courts and the federal courts deal with. There must be an increase, not a decrease, in specialisation in family law and violence issues. This is critical for the safety of children and victims of family violence. Family law experts have tried to engage constructively with the Morrison government on this bill. They have even offered an alternative proposal to restructure the Family Court and Federal Circuit Court. Under that alternative proposal, which has been described by the New South Wales Bar Association as Family Court of Australia 2.0, firstly, a specialist and standalone family court would be retained. Secondly, judicial officers who currently hear family law matters in the Federal Circuit Court would be relocated into a second, lower division within the Family Court. And thirdly, the Federal Circuit Court would continue to exist in its current form, except that it would only hear general law matters. Appeals from that court would continue to be heard by the Federal Court. In other words, unlike the government's proposed merger, the alternative proposal would mean increased specialisation in, in the family law system. The Family Court of Australia 2.0 model warrants careful consideration. Instead, it has been ignored completely by the Morrison government. Given what is at stake for Australian families, including children and some of the most vulnerable adults in the country, that is nothing short of a disgrace. Now, none of this is to say that our current family law system is perfect, but abolishing the family court is the wrong solution. After seven years of neglect under the Liberals, there is no doubt that the family law system is in crisis. For contested family law matters in the Family Court, it is currently taking, on average, 19.9 months from the date a matter is filed to the date on which the trial even commences. In the Federal Circuit Court, the average is 17.8 months. And even after trials come to an end, Australian families are having to wait many months for judgments to be, de to be delivered. These sorts of delays are not mere statistics. In its landmark 2019 report on the family law system, which the government has so far ignored, the Australian Law Reform Commission referred to a number of concerns associated with the present delays in the family court system, including the potential for children and parents to spend long periods living in limbo while waiting for trial, 
the safety risks to parties and children arising from delayed resolution of disputes that involve protective concerns, including contributing to homelessness, the scope for delay and uncertainty to exacerbate conflict, and the potential for clients to consent to outcomes that fall short of the security and protection a court order could provide. Now, having deprived the family law system of resources for seven years, the Prime Minister and his Attorney-General claim that these bills will fix the mess they have presided over. The Morrison government claims that merging the family, law, family court and the federal circuit court will reduce delays and backlogs by creating a single point of entry for federal family law matters, ensuring the development of common rules of court, forms and practices and procedures. But like so much else with this government, this justification does not withstand even the slightest degree of scrutiny. The creation of a single point of entry and the development of common rules, forms, practices and procedures across the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court is widely supported, and all of those things can be and are being achieved without these bills. The Attorney-General knows this. The Prime Minister knows this. They do not care. The Morrison government claims that the proposed merger has been informed by independent reviews and inquiries over a decade. The Attorney-General's department website lists five reports under the heading The Evidence Base for the Reforms. The only problem with that is that none of the reports listed on the website recommended these radical reforms. None. The evidence base for the reforms, according to the Attorney-General's department website, is blank. None of those reports even considered these reforms. And in fact, the only one of the five reports that recommended restructuring the Family Court and Federal Circuit Court recommended the alternative proposal I referred to earlier, an entirely different model which would have maintained a standalone Family Law Court. The Attorney-General and the Morrison government in ignore all of this. The arrogance of this government is breathtaking. Australian families deserve so much better than this. Labor will oppose this bad law. And I move the second reading amendment circulated in my name on sheet 1205. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to speak against the bill and to make absolutely clear that the Greens will be voting against the proposals in these bills. What the Morrison government is trying to do by merging the family court into the federal circuit court is outrageous. No one asked for this merger. No one wants this merger. This merger is almost universally opposed. And yet here we are with this absolute brainless plan to abolish the Family Court of Australia. It was the Whitlam government that had the visionary idea of establishing the Family Court, back in the day when we knew what the Labor Party actually stood for. The Family Court was established to protect people before it, particularly children, families and survivors of family and domestic violence. The Family Court did this by being a standalone specialist family law court working in a system of collaborative, culturally safe and co-located services. The model that the Family Court operates under is unique and has been held up as a model of best practice internationally. The radical and misconceived changes in these bills would effectively put an end to that. The government is claiming that this merger will help reduce delays and backlog backlogs in the family court, but there is very little evidence to support this will actually happen. The government always trots out their completely discredited PWC report as proof that this merger will be more efficient. That PWC report is nothing more than a six-week desktop review of operational data by two accountants. Yes, the family law system needs fixing, but this bill is not a fix at all. I know firsthand and personally that the system needs fixing from my own personal experience. I know what it's like to rock up at the family court uh, not having uh, childcare facilities and, and going with your children to fight for them and for your rights and your protection. 
I know what it's like to stand in a queue and have your name called out over a loudspeaker and feel embarrassed about that. I know what it's like to be put in a little room because a perpetrator is in the building and so is his family. I know what it's like to feel scared. I know what it's like to uh, be a victim of family violence and certainly a survivor of family violence. And we do have a lot of work to do in the current system, but getting rid of the current system is not the answer. We know that we need to have more culturally safe uh, support services for women and children. And we know that there's not enough funding and resourcing available for good and competent, culturally safe services to get women and girls to safety, as well as provide counselling, financial counselling and safe and secure public homes. What the Family Court actually needs is more resourcing, more public money to employ more judges to have better support services particularly for the women and children who are appearing in these courts, many who are victims of family and domestic violence. This proposal won't fix the problems in the family law courts, which have arisen largely out of a Labor and Liberal government's neglecting of the family court. Better alternatives have not been considered, otherwise we would not be here having this discussion. What families need and what they look to the parliament to provide is safety, security and as much certainty as possible during the pandemic and beyond. At the core of so many of the issues confronted by the system is a chronic and sustained lack of proper funding and resources for the family court and the federal circuit court and a mismanagement of those resources. This includes a failure to appoint and maintain sufficient and appropriately experienced judges and associated staff and insufficient funding to maintain the counselling and assessment services previously provided by the courts. Failing to strengthen the system has produced unacceptable delays and costs that directly impact on the accessibility and quality of justice. In, and in my own personal uh, situation, I waited two years for any justice and any letters back from the system that was meant to be there to protect me. Two years. Unlike the flawed merger proposal in this bill, the government should have properly considered the much better Family Court 2.0 model. The model that is actually favoured by key stakeholders, the people who actually work this every day, this is what they're saying, propose a straightforward lift and shift of the federal court, circuit court's family law jurisdiction and judges into a new lower division within the standalone specialist family court. This would mean that the family court judges would be in Division 1 of the Family Court of Australia. Federal, federal Circuit Court judges who are hearing family law matters would move across to Division 2 of the Family Court of Australia. This model has been in force for many years in the Attorney General's own state of Western Australia. It was good enough for him when he was the Attorney General, General of Western Australia, but somehow it isn't now? Go figure. This Family Court 2.0 model was also recommended by the 2008 Semple Report and has been endorsed by key stakeholders, again, people who know their job better than the people in this place, including the Law Council of Australia, Women's Legal Services Australia and former Chief of the Family Court, Justice Elizabeth Evatt AC. Unlike the government's merger proposal, the Family Court 2.0 model would have the significant advantage of promoting safety for children and adults by preserving access to services of a specialist family court. It is particularly important that we build the safest, strongest, most caring system for the groups of people that are disproportionately 
impacted in the family law and family violence systems, like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and children. The need for increased and culturally safe specialisation of courts to improve decisions and outcomes for families is supported by the evidence of the many inquiries into the family law system. The Family Court 2.0 proposal would instead produce what people clearly expect of their legal system, a single specialist family court to address the needs of families within an integrated system of collaborative, culturally safe and responsive support services. The alarming prevalence of family violence in the system makes specialisation critical to promote safe engagement for survivors with the courts and our justice system. From the time a matter is filed through appropriate triage, active case management and quick resolutions, all while providing excellent, culturally safe wraparound services. A specialist family court must not be destroyed on a mirage that this will, be, this will fix the problems, which in reality actually require more resources and holistic reform. The merger proposals in these bills are nonsense, and you cannot make sense out of nonsense. If the government was serious about fixing the issues in the family law court system, then they would be properly considering the alternative of the Family Court 2.0 that is supported and preferred by stakeholders. They would be given an additional $310 million a year in funding for legal assistance providers, as identified by the Law Council, to make up the shortfall of successive cuts. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, community legal centres, women's legal services. And if I may, I will read out a statement uh, that was put out 35 minutes ago from the legal fraternity. The legal fraternity has come together to protest against the merger of the family court with the federal court. From the joint release, more than 155 stakeholders in Australia's family law system have now signed an open letter to the Attorney General opposing the government's flawed bill to abolish the specialist standalone family court. These signatures represent a range of professions and community organisations who work with Australian families and include 11 retired family court and federal circuit court judges. In addition to former Chief Justices, the Hon. Elizabeth Evatt AC and the Hon. Alastair Nicholson AORFDQC, the merger bill would collapse the family court into the generalist, chronically under-resourced and overburdened family court, family circuit court. The bill was listed without warning overnight as the first item of government business on Tuesday, despite not being included on the government's draft legislative program for the Senate this week. Stakeholders have called for three years for the merger not to be passed out of concern. It would have devastating impacts on families, resulting in a loss of structural, systemic specialisation and dismantle, dismantling the appeal division. So my final word is, who are the experts in this space? Why aren't we listening to them? And the Australian Greens will not be supporting the bill. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the Federal Circuit Court and Family Court of Australia Bill 2019 and the Family Court of Australia Constitutional Amendments and Transitional <coughs> Provisions Bill 2019. Uh, these bills bring together the Federal Circuit and Family Courts into a new court, which will be known as the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. Now, this is a change which has been called for by many parts of the family law sector and cannot be achieved without legislation. 
cannot be achieved without legislation. Now, unlike what uh, previous speakers have falsely asserted, uh, this cannot be achieved without this legislation. Uh, in just one example of this support, the New South Wales Bar Association has stated that the experiment of sharing jurisdiction between two federal courts and running family law matters in separate courts with separate rules and procedures has failed. And so I welcome, as a senator for Western Australia, the, the government's commitment to this change. Uh, the Consequential Amendments Bill will facilitate the transition for court users from the Family Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit Court of Australia to the new FCFC uh, as soon as the provisions commence. Uh, the bill does not abolish the Family Court. It does not abolish the Family Court, as some are falsely claiming. Uh, nor does it reduce the specialisations of the courts. The Family Court will continue to exist as Division I, and the government is committed to a minimum of 25 Division I judges, uh, consistent with the recommendation of the Semple Review. The FCFC will be an improved and streamlined process for those who need to access it, and will provide the significant benefit of creating a single point of entry into the federal family law courts. This structural reform has the potential to allow for up to 8,000 cases to be resolved each year, and it will significantly reduce the delays uh, currently experienced by families, which of course uh, provides and burdens families with so much frustration. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, that's more than 8,000 families each year who will be able to readily access the dispute resolution provided by this court. Uh, thanks to the administrative and structural changes that this bill provides for. Uh, so this is a big one for those that need to access justice. This will make an enormous difference to Australian families, and it will be far more accessible court uh, for Australian families to resolve their matters with as little complexity as possible. So it will be simpler, more efficient and more effective. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, most importantly, uh, it's also, uh, and also the, uh, what, what I should note uh, standing here today is I've been involved on the Joint Select Committee uh, reviewing the family law system. And I've got to say, in the 18 months or so that I've been here, the work that this committee, very diligent committee uh, from uh, members and senators from, from all sides of politics uh, have applied themselves in this process. Uh, it has been uh, you know, one of the most confronting aspects of, of my role since coming in here, because you hear of the stories, the trauma, the, the difficulty that so many families have faced uh, in dealing with separation. The vast majority of, of separations, so as, as you know, difficult and tragic as they they are, are, are dealt with um, privately and without the need of the court system. But for those that, that do find themselves needing to go through the system, it's an incredibly frustrating process, incredibly time-consuming uh, and very, very costly. And so these amendments uh, you know, won't solve all of the issues that have been identified, and I look forward to uh, the soon tabling of the report and the culmination of the work of that committee which will outline a, a, whole, a whole range of recommendations which will go to improving the system more generally. But this, this change uh, will go a long way to um, providing some of the relief that is necessary, uh, particularly around streamlining and ensuring that there are uh, efficient processes for families, that they can avail themselves of that. The, the Morrison government is committed to ending the unnecessary costs and delay for thousands of Australian families that arise from a split uh, federal court system. The structural reform of the Federal Family Court that are outlined in this bill will ensure that families are able to have their matters dealt with as efficiently as possible. The reforms enabled by these bills will improve user experience for those Australian families that unfortunately need the assistance of the courts to resolve their disputes and promote uh, improved practices by both courts and legal practitioners. Now, by way of history, uh, neither the Commonwealth nor the states or territories have exclusive jurisdiction over family law matters. 
Uh, the Australian Constitution gives the Commonwealth the power to make laws with respect to marriage and divorce and matrimonial cases and in relation to parental rights and the custody and guardianship of, of infants. Uh, but states have uh, referred their state powers to the Commonwealth, uh, I must say, uh, with the exception of Western Australia, uh, my home state. Uh, this has had the effect of the federal parliament having jurisdiction over marriage, divorce, uh, parenting and family uh, property upon separation, while the state and territory governments have retained jurisdiction over adoption, uh, child welfare and same-sex couples. Now, currently, two federal courts deal with matters under the Family Law Act. Uh, the Family Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit Court of Australia. As I said, Western Australia uh, has established a, a state family court, the, the, the Family Court of Western Australia, which exercises both federal and state jurisdiction. Uh, so this structure that exists uh, introduces unnecessary duplication and complication for families. And the merging and streamlining of these courts will make a significant contribution to reducing the burden that families face when needing the support of the courts to adjudicate their separation matters. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, the government does not pretend that these changes enacted by the passage of this, of this bill uh, will be a silver bullet, uh, nor does it suggest that this will magically fix the issues that uh, are present within the family law system. As I said already, uh, uh, issues which uh, necessitated uh, and, and that we're dealing with through the uh, family law inquiry. Uh, but it is an important step forward. Uh, the structural failings of the current split family law system are widely agreed, and continuing to do nothing to fix this problem is, is not the solution, is not an option. Reform for any long-standing structural problem is challenging. There's no doubt about that. Uh, whether it be laws relating to taxation or family law, uh, big reform is never easy. Uh, this is perhaps the most sensitive area of all reform. There is no doubt when families are dealing with separation, uh, it is of course you know, some of the most traumatic moments of their life, the stress that it imposes upon families and, and of course their children, uh, where children are involved. It's immense. It is immense. And having sat on the family law committee looking at the system, uh, the number of testimonies that we heard. Uh, you know, we had over 1,500 submissions, I, I recall. Uh, one of the, the most um, you know, subscribed, if you like, uh, uh, um, committee um, you know, submission processes that, that uh, I understand uh, has, this parliament has seen in, in a long time. Uh, and every single one of those stories, every single one of those cases is, is, uh, is, is of course, very, very challenging. Uh, so these reforms uh, here, uh, while, while you know, very streamlined, uh, are proposed uh, are the least radical path uh, to end the unnecessary confusion, the additional costs and unnecessary delay for thousands of Australian families that have arisen by virtue of this, this split system. And so it's, it's necessary uh, for this bill to pass to help streamline the, uh, the, the court system. Uh, there's some bigger issues that must be dealt with, uh, but this is just one thing that can be done to alleviate some of the pain and some of the frustration and, of course, the cost and the delays uh, that are preventing people from just ultimately moving on with their lives. Uh, we've heard uh, the previous speaker calling uh, for more funding, more resources and more public money. Now, the, the government has actually been delivering that. We've been delivering that. Uh, the government has funded the establishment of the Family Advocacy Support Services. And since 2016, we've committed over $48.9 billion in funding for the Family Advocacy Support Services. Now, those services operate in family court registries across Australia uh, to offer integrated duty lawyer and social support services to persons affected by family violence who have had cases in the family law courts. Now, this includes $7.8 million that is committed in the 2019-20 budget over three years for dedicated men's support to be engaged in all FAS locations. And this is, of course, very, very critical uh, that everyone is supported when dealing with uh, the, the, the challenge and the stress of, of a separation, that, that everyone is supported, including men. And I'm a, an advocate for, for even more, even more support. 
support uh, for men, uh, for women and, and of course for, for children, uh, all parties involved, that support needs to be there. And this government stands proud uh, of providing that support. Uh, as part of the 2018 Women's uh, Economic Security Package, the government provided funding for family law services and initiatives, including funding to 65 family relationship centres across Australia on an ongoing basis to help families reach agreement about splitting their property after separation and to legal aid commissions for a two-year trial of law-assisted mediation for property matters with asset pools up to $500,000, excluding the debt, in each state and territory. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, as I've said and stated already in this, uh, in my, in, in this speech here today, th this is by no means a silver bullet. No one in the government, uh, the minister down, is, is calling this uh, the panacea to the, the challenges that are faced. Uh, but it certainly will make a significant difference. It certainly will make a significant difference in, in streamlining the process for families that need to deal with the, the multiplicity of the, the challenges and the issues of a separation uh, to enable them to uh, deal with it in a more efficient in a less complicated way, uh, importantly in a, in a, in a more cost-efficient way uh, and ultimately in a way that just enables them to uh, process the challenge uh, that they're facing in a very private matter uh, in relation to their family and their living situations and their children and being able to do that through a streamlined court process, amalgamation, centralisation of that will just go uh, a part of the way. And in fact, uh, in many respects, a long way to helping families deal with it and to, uh, and, and to, to be able to move forward in their lives uh, without that unnecessary burden of a very complicated system. Thank you. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Federal Co Circuit and Family Court of Australia Bill 2019. Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Consequential Amendments and Transitional Provisional Bill 2019. The government should really own up to what they are seeking to do with these bills. They are seeking to abolish the Family Court as a specialist and standalone superior court. The Family Court of Australia was established by the Whitlam government in 1975 to serve as a specialist court to resolve complex legal disputes relating to family law or for families in crisis. The Family Law Act, which established this court, also instituted no-fault divorce. This system is one of Australia's most important pieces of social infrastructure and plays a vital role in resolving the legal aspects of family separations and other disputes and in protecting children and victims of domestic violence. Like most of the great social reforms that have occurred in Australia, from Medicare to our world-leading superannuation system to free legal assistance services for Australians in need, the Family Court of Australia is an institution that has served our nation, its people, very well. As some resolve, the Morrison government is not proposing to reinstitute fault-based divorce, but what it is proposing to do is undo the second of the major changes introduced by the Family Law Act, which was to establish uh, the Family Law Court of Australia as a specialist superior court. A specialist superior court. The government's bill would combine the Federal Circuit Court and Family Court into one court with two divisions. That court would be called the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia, FCFC. The current Family Court of Australia will become the FCFC Division 1, while the current Federal Circuit Court of Australia will become the FCFC Division 2. Like the courts that they would be replacing, the Federal Circuit Court and Family Court Division 1 would deal exclusively with family law matters, including the complex matters, while the, uh, the Federal Circuit Court and the Family Court Division 2 
would deal with family law and other federal law matters. The FCFC Division I and II would operate under the leadership of a single Chief Justice and Deputy Chief Dust Justice with a single set of rules and a single point of entry. The Appeals Division of the Family Court would be abolished. Instead, all uh, Federal um, Circuit Family Court Division I judges would be able to hear appeals either as a single judge or as part of the full court. Attorney General Christian Porter has previously expressed an intention not to appoint new judges to the FCFC Division I as they retire. That would amount to the gradual uh, abolition of a specialist family court over time, and that work being absorbed by the FCFC Division II. Now, the Attorney General has now backed away from the position and promised to keep appointing judges to Division I. But nothing in this bill would guarantee the continuation and the existence of Division I. The Attorney General made his intentions for this merger very clear in the last parliament. And yet now he's saying, trust me. Well, I'm sorry, uh, Mr Porter. As the Attorney General of this country, unfortunately, we can't trust you. In my home state of Tasmania, the Morrison government has failed to appoint another judge to hear family law cases. This is causing delays across the whole state, exacerbating the anguish for families who are already going through a difficult time. Now we have the situation where one judge is doing the work of two, and this just isn't acceptable. The proposal, to, the proposal to merge the Family Court with the Federal Circuit Court is not based on any consultation with Australian families or family law experts. It is principally based on a six-week desktop review by two accountants from PwC. Not even this report endorses the government's proposal. As the authors of that uh, report informed the committee inquiry into this legislation. They were not even asked to consider detailed ref reform opportunities as part of that review. In my work on the Family Law Committee, we have received over 1,700 submissions, and the overwhelming majority have expressed the harm that is proposed by this merger and the uh, additional. Uh, hardship and harm that could be and will be afforded to vulnerable children and their families. In the interim report, which was released last year, we found there is no persuasive evidence that these bills and the proposed merger would address any of the many problems plaguing the family law system. Since 1995, there have been 11 investigations carried out into the family law system. 11. More reports, obviously still gathering dust in the minister's office. These inquiries have returned recommendations with similar themes regarding the need for improved resourcing, the need to reduce the time it takes to resolve disputes, and the importance of having a specialist jurisdiction to deal with family law matters and family violence. Further, in late 2018, the Australian Law Reform Commission completed the most comprehensive review of Australia's family law system that has ever been conducted. The Australian Law Reform Commission did not recommend the proposed merger of the Family Law Court and the Federal Circuit Court but it did make 60 recommendations for the improvements to the family law system. That's 60 recommendations. I wonder how many of those have actually been implemented. I would suggest, in fact, I know zero, none of them. The government has yet to respond to, let alone implement, the Australian Law Reform Commission's recommendations. And yet, in direct opposition to these recommendations, the coalition is pushing for the merger of the Family Law Court and the Federal Circuit Court. 
Overwhelmingly, the advice states that a loss of specialist family law court would increase the risks of harm to children and victims of domestic violence. And witness after witness from experts, from former family law court judges, have given that evidence to the inquiry. We need to question the Morrison government's emphasis on increasing efficiencies, as well as their claim that their proposed court merger will achieve this. Reform should strengthen the system and not be there to undermine the quality of services being provided to families in crisis. If anything, the need for a specialist court has only become more pronounced over time. And what has become increasingly obvious is that the key issues associated with the family law system is the costs, delays, the, adver the adversarial nature of family courts and how family violence is considered and the role of independent children's lawyers and the overall appropriateness of the legal framework. There is a need for an increase in specialisation in the family law and in family violence to facilitate an increase in safety, especially for those who are disproportionately impacted. This is supported by the evidence on many government commission inquiries. The process should be streamlined so that there is a single point of contact for families, but this shouldn't be at the loss of a specialist court. That's not the way to do it. There are many benefits associated with having a specialist court system, which is widely regarded as delivering better results for families having to use it. The benefits include higher quality decisions and legal consistency and efficiencies. The specialisation enables members of this court to be appropriately qualified and trained to do better and to understand the nature and the features and the dynamics associated with family law and family violence. This acknowledges um, and allows those individuals to be better assisted uh, and to not become even more damaged victims of the system itself. Since 2012, the number of cases in the Family Law Court has grown by 34 per cent, and the Family Circuit Court has increased by 63 per cent. There is a real concern that the proposed merger would compound current issues associated with the lack of funding. We need to question the emphasis of this move at increasing efficiencies, where realistically it will be taking funding out of an already chronically underfunded system. Instead, we need to focus on the reforms that can be better delivered safely for children and adult victims of family violence. The proposed merger fails to address the systematic issues entrenched within this system. Everyone accepts that there are serious problems in the family law court presently. The main cause of those problems is not a mystery. As the Australian Law Reform Commission found, the family law system has been deprived of resources to such an extent that it cannot deliver the quality of justice expected of a country like Australia and to whose family law system other countries once looked and tried to emulate. Family court and federal court judges have not been replaced in a timely manner. Funding has not increased in response to increasing demand and review after review, including many dozens of sensible, measured recommendations have been ignored. But instead of working to fix the family law system, the government remains determined to restructure the family court and the federal circuit court in a way that will make a bad situation worse for Australian families, including vulnerable children. Australia has developed a world-leading family law system. However, chronic under-resourcing by successive Liberal governments has resulted in long delays and increasing costs for families in crisis. This has resulted in harm for those who are already some of the most vulnerable members of our community. There is a wealth of recommendations and resources which the government has to enact meaningful change and prevent victims from falling through the cracks. 
Why won't they? This bill will do nothing to help fa Australian families, and the fact that the government is trying to rush through this legislation before the Family Law Committee releases its final report is very telling. They know that this report will not recommend a merger of the Family Law Court and the Federal uh, Circuit Court, but they want this legislation to go through regardless. There's nothing in this bill that will increase the number of judges, registrars and other court staff. There is nothing in this bill that will force the Attorney General to do his job, even something as basic as appointing new judges as vacancies are created. Now, former Speaker spoke about his work on the committee, and I will agree that all members of that joint um, committee have been working diligently and taking evidence. But you cannot have sat through any of those public hearings and not felt deep sadness for what is happening in this country when families go through a breakdown of their relationship. The impact on those families, and particularly those children, are just devastating. The cost to their mental health, you cannot put a price on. You cannot put a price on. So these continual delays is doing more and more harm to those children who have already been greatly affected by separations of their parents. So therefore, rushing this bill through without waiting to that final report has been handed down. They've had plenty of evidence already from the interim report is irresponsible. But to have the amount of reports, 11 reports, all gathering dust with the, uh, the um, Australian Law Reform Commission, 60 recommendations, and not one of them has been acted upon. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise uh, in support of the government's legislation uh, to merge the uh, family court into the Federal Circuit Court to create uh, what will be known as the F Federal Circuit and Family Law Court. Now, in doing so, I, I think it's worthwhile going back through the history of this legislation. Uh, when this legislation was first introduced into the last parliament, uh, it was actually a proposition that involved the abolishing of the family court. It involved putting uh, family law responsibilities within uh, the, the federal circuit court and appeals uh, from, that, from matters in the federal circuit court would go to the federal court where indeed there were no specialist judges uh, in family law. It also had some other characteristics about it, such as uh, a passing of responsibility for the making of rules to the Chief Justice. Now, in late 2018, there was a Senate inquiry examining that legislation. That Senate inquiry travelled uh, across five days to Perth, Adelaide, Sydney, Brisbane and Townsville, um, uh, examining uh, those changes. And I'll uh, provide a little bit of background history. Uh, that was close to Christmas. I spent some of my pre-Christmas period uh, sitting in my office writing a scathing, a scathing uh, draft dissenting report that was going to uh, go to, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, into the committee report. Uh, but I, uh, out of courtesy, I sent it to the Attorney General. Uh, the Attorney General considered it and actually came back to the Parliament with a substantially altered bill, substantially altered. And uh, this bill actually almost gained support of uh, the Parliament. I, I seem to recall in the last Parliament uh, that uh, it might have been Senator Hinch that uh, was the last uh, person to resist uh, the bill on the crossbench. Uh, otherwise, uh, support was there for the government to, uh, to, to pass the bill. So I think it's very important that when we listen to contributions, and I have listened to the contributions made by uh, Labor senators, that 
we are not talking about the bill that, uh, that came to the, parla the uh, 45th parliament. We are talking about a substantially modified bill. So when the uh, you know, when senators when Labor senators stand and say that this bill involves the abolish, uh, abolishing of a superior court, it does not. The provisions of this bill are very clear. It retains a superior court of family court justices uh, or, or family law justices, specialist justices. It also retains a specialist appeals division. So to stand up and suggest that uh, this, this bill in any way is abolishing or breaking up a, a superior court is just simply wrong. That is not what the, le the, the provisions uh, say. So I'll come back to uh, perhaps some other things that have been said that are, in my view, uh, misleading uh, or, or ill-informed. So let's talk about what this bill does do. Currently, we have a situation where family law matters are dealt uh, in sort of two jurisdictions. One of them is the, the Federal Circuit Court. In actually what is a, a specialist division of the Federal Circuit Court, it's the family uh, law section of the, of the uh, Federal Circuit Court. That generally deals with relatively simple matters. Now, I'm not suggesting anything about family law is simple, but uh, in the spectrum, the more uh, uh, simpler matters are dealt with by the Federal Circuit Court in their family law division. The more complex cases are sent to the family court, where superior court justices deal with the matter, and appeals from both of those original jurisdiction courts do go to uh, the appeals division of the family court. That's the way it currently exists. So just to make it simple, there are three, uh, uh, if you like, jurisdictions. The FCC uh, jurisdiction, the family court original jurisdiction and an appeals body. Now, what this bill does is simply takes those three um, uh, jurisdictions and puts them under a common roof. So there will remain a federal circuit court that has a specialist family law division and has uh, requirements for the, the, the types of judges that are appointed to that division. They must still have experience and be appropriate, uh, uh, appropriate in terms of appointments by way of their background knowledge. The current bill also has a superior court, Division 1, uh, which is effectively the transfer of the family court into uh, the, the, the new court. It is all the same judges, justices, I, I beg your pardon. It is all the same justices. And there will be an appeals uh, division of family uh, law justices, superior court justices, who will hear matters uh, on appeal. There is a subtle difference in that right now in the family uh, uh, law, uh, in the family court, uh, there are specified appeal justices, you know, people who sit only on appeals matters. That will now change under the new arrangements. The uh, the new um, uh, arrangements will have appeals from either Division 1, the Superior Court Division, or from Division 2, uh, which is the old uh, FCC uh, Family Law Division. They will go to a full bench, or to a bench, I might say correctly, uh, that is uh, drawn from justices uh, in Division 1. So no longer do ju justices get to sit only on the appeals bench. They will have to come down and do original jurisdiction matters, but uh, any justice may find themselves now on appeals. And you know what? That's exactly how the federal court works. That's exactly how the federal court works. So it actually, in, in some sense, uh, harmonises the way in which appeals are dealt with across, uh, across the two uh, federal superior courts. So. Uh, we need to recognise that that is what this bill is, is doing. Okay, it also permits common entry points. So when you have a family law matter, you can simply uh, make application to the one court and then 
uh, based on arguments that might be presented by people who are represented or by, by uh, lawyers representing people, or indeed if people are self-represented litigants, based on uh, the, the nature of the application and the data associated with that application, they will either go to Division 2, which is the judges uh, uh, of a court of record, or alternatively they will be referred to uh, Division 1, which is the superior court. Again, depending on complexity. So we will have a streamlined uh, entry port. Now there are those that are saying that's happening anyway. And that is true, that is happening. But at the moment, uh, if I wish to uh, lodge a matter in the federal in the in the family court, I can do that. So even though the court might suggest I should do it in the FCC, in the Federal Circuit Court, I have a lawful right to make an application to the family court. So this bill changes that so uh, everyone is funneled through the same system. That creates some efficiencies. There's also uh, rule changes now to harmonise the rules between the, uh, 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 what was the Federal Circuit Court and what was the family uh, court. Now I can tell you, having been involved in, in matters in both of those courts, uh, there are two volumes to the family law rules. And there are the different set of rules in the Federal Circuit Court. So if someone is a self-represented litigant, they have to switch to a completely different context as they go from court to court. Uh, the arrangements will now be harmonised. There will be a, a single set of rules. Now, uh, the original bill sought to grant the power of, to the Chief Justice to change uh, those rules unilaterally. Uh, that has now changed. Uh, uh, I understand the government will move amendments that restrict the time period at which the Chief Justice makes the rules, only for the transition period so that the rules, new rules can be established, the new common rules, and then it will go back to changing rules in the manner in which uh, the courts do it uh, presently. So um, uh, you know, th there is a necessity in respect of this bill, both in relation to harmonising the, the, the rules of the court and also uh, streamlining through a single point of, of entry. So that's what the bill does, and it's the, the efficiencies that flow from that that I am in support of, because we do need to uh, have a, uh, a court system uh, that removes uh, some of the inefficiencies that are there at present. I will go to some of the claims that have been made uh, in the contributions thus far. Um, you know, a claim, Senator Watt stood up and said that now we're seeing matters shared between the immigration, uh, immigration matters and family law matters will be mixed. That's simply uh, not, not, not uh, the case. Right now there are two divisions of the Fe Federal Circuit Court, the Family Law Division uh, and the General Division. That's exactly what is there now and this bill does nothing to change that, nothing at all to change that. So status quo in that regard. Um, the uh, other contributions have su suggested that this is the erosion of specialisation. No. The same judges that are in the family court right now will sit in the new court. The same uh, judges that are conducting appeals will sit in, in the court. They are specialist judges. And indeed the legislation, if people bother to read it, does state a requirement in respect of the expertise that must be uh, present before someone is appointed uh, to those courts. Um, but even further, and uh, uh, the, uh, I understand amendments will be circulated shortly, um, uh, the government has agreed to, to put in the primary legislation uh, a minimum number of Division I justices, a minimum number. So just understand right now, the Attorney General could, if, if he or she, a future uh, Attorney General chooses, simply not appoint judges to that court and eventually it would disappear. Uh, the changes we'll see today, by way of an amendment that I understand the government will circulate, will introduce a minimum number of Division I uh, justices, which means only the parliament can rid us of that specialist knowledge. Okay, so there's a strong commitment 
uh, uh, and a, in fact a, a strong change. We're actually doing the reverse of what is being suggested, which is the erosion of the specialist court, to embedding it in law so only the parliament can ever change that. So that's another aspect of this uh, bill. So when people talk about an erosion of specialisation, actually this strengthen, strengthens it. It ensures that we never lose uh, a core of uh, uh, justices, superior court justices, dealing with family law unless the parliament permits it in the, uh, going out into the future. So um, I just ask people when they're listening to the debate to focus on the provisions of the bill, to focus on what the bill is trying to do, which is to streamline uh, matters as they uh, pass through the court to make sure that we have uh, common rules, but also making sure we have the right uh, uh, and appropriate levels of skills of, uh, of uh, judges and justices dealing with these matters. There are still specialist justices. There is still appeals to uh, specialist justices. That does not change as a result of this bill. This bill is about making efficiencies. Now, I'll concede that I think more resources are required, um, and I, you know, the government, I, I'm hoping, will, uh, will, will over time expand uh, the resources, because that's absolutely necessary. But this is a change that seeks to gather efficiencies, and it is for that reason that I am supporting it. Senator Carr. Very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, the uh, Senator Patrick uh, says that Labor senators uh, have been misrepresenting this bill and have no understanding of the detail of uh, the uh, bill. I can just say to him, I'm currently the Deputy Chair of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee, which was tasked with reviewing these particular bills, uh, and I think therefore we're able to do with the evidence that's presented um, to this committee in regard to these specific measures. And I might say that if you think the Labor Party is having trouble understanding these bills, well, you'll find that just about every legal organisation in the country is supporting the contentions that are being put forward by the Labor senators about the actual intent of this bill. And given the history of this legislation, it's not surprising that people would be so suspicious and so doubtful of the minister's alleged conversion to the need for a specialist court system for family law. It's not surprising, just given the maladministration of family law in this country under this attorney general that people would be concerned that the minister has to now come forward with amendments to actually specify that there will be judges of a particular type in this court. Why wasn't that in the original bill if the government was so committed to it? See, it's one measure after another, one backstop after another, one backflip after another by this government in regard to this legislation. Remember the original intention of the government was not to appoint judges to this category of jurisprudence, to let it wither on the vine. That was the whole point of this political exercise. But, Senator Patrick, you have had this conversion of the road to Damascus and you have been able to persuade the minister, right, because of your brilliantly worded minority report, and he suddenly found that this is the need for change to his bill. Now, you should be congratulated. But if you think that's actually how this government functions, uh, you've been here long enough to know that's simply not true. Now, a simple facts here. On the current arrangements, this is the 21st of January this year, there's one federal court, uh, circuit court, judge in Brisbane, there's over 600 cases on their docket. 600 cases. There are 18 judges across the country who have between 400 and 500 
cases. That's including in Adelaide and in Sydney and in Rockhampton. There are, on the 21st of January this year, the average number of cases across all the federal court circuit judges is 330. That's an average of 330 cases per judge. Now, these are the people you think we should be trusting, we should be relying upon in terms of the administration of family law in this country. We should just take their suddenly discovered conviction that they're going to be committed to the proper administration of family law in this country, given the gross underfunding of family law in this country. Now, the government senators on this inquiry, and we know the job of the government senators in these types of inquiries, is of course to find the defence of the government, no matter how indefensible the government's position is. We all understand the nature of their task. The senators themselves indicated on their report, on page 33 and 34 of their report, that there were, there were weaknesses in the government's approach and there had to be amendments to it. Now, we have the support of over 110 organisations at the time we actually produced the minority report. 110. And of course, just today, there are many more organisations on top of that calling for this bill to be rejected because there are fundamental flaws in the approach that's been taken by the government in terms of the, this legislation. And we've got a problem here where the government simply has been negligent when it comes to family law and has been negligent for some time. So it does actually pay us to go back to talk about why it in fact, the, the fundamental principles here, and I, you know, I think this is one of the great achievements uh, in terms of the family law, going back to with the Whitlam period. You know, the, the two great major and complementary changes from '75, Family Law Act of 1975, where we were instituted a no-fault divorce principle, and of course the establishment of a family specialist family law court uh, in this country which is a multidisciplinary court for the resolution of family disputes. I, I think it is generally understood that in terms of family law matters, it's probably the most stressful point in people's lives. And it does require us to pay particular attention to just how serious these questions are. And with delays in terms of the processing of family law cases at the moment, um, you know, of many, many months uh, just to get a consultant organised, let alone to get a judgment, you can understand just how deeply distressing the consequences of the maladministration in this area are for people directly concerned. That, you know, it's nowhere near as bad as it was when the original uh, divorce proceedings were on before the, uh, before, prior to the Family Law Act in the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1959, um, which set out there were 14 grounds for divorce. I remind senators that might be looking at these issues, and those grounds included adultery, desertion, habitual drunkenness, imprisonment, and insanity. And to get a divorce, the spouse had to prove that the other party was, of course, at fault. Uh, private investigators did extremely well out of the divorce law as it existed prior to the Family Law Act. But Australian men, and especially Australian women, did not. And so I, you know, it helps to remind ourselves of what Whitlam actually said back in 1975, he said, let's keep in mind that marriage is essentially a human relationship between two people. It takes two people to make a marriage, but it takes only one to break it. Idealists might wish that it were otherwise, but it is not. It's time society acknowledged that simple fact. We have no right to condemn two people to live together in misery and suffering for a a moment longer than are necessary, and ultimately the only test of a marriage is whether both parties agree to maintain it. If one party is unwilling to maintain it, 
the marriage has broken down. And so I think since the commencement of the Family Law Act in January 76, the only grounds for divorce appropriately has been irretrievable breakdown. And that's why the supporting jurisprudence around that issue was so important. Spouses no longer have to go through the pain, the expense and the humiliation of trying to prove that the other person was at fault. So while the government doesn't condemn people, and I presume the government's not planning to go back there, but you never know with a government like this, uh, I presume that's not the case. The, what we ought to have, though, is an understanding that the government should ensure that the Family Law Act is administered properly and is, lives up to what its stated position is of efficiently, and one would expect that if it's going to introduce substantive changes that are contained in a bill like this, there is sound evidence to support the claims that are being made by the government. And I think anyone that does actually look at the evidence to cite Senator Patrick should be prepared to be disappointed. And that's the basis on which I looked at the inquiry. And as you know, I go into these inquiries with an open mind and and guess what? There was no evidence to support this bill. A lot of hollow rhetoric, but no evidence. The Attorney General's Department's website listed five reports under the heading "Evidence to Base to Support the Inquiry," to support the reforms. And so, when we looked at those reports, what did we find? None of the reports had even considered these changes. And only one of the five reports recommended any structural changes to the family court and the, f the federal circuit court at all. And it was an entirely different model that they had proposed. So there are about 70 reviews now, the family law system, since 1974. 70 reviews. And not a single one of them has recommended that the family court be structured in a way that the government is proposing in this bill. And I think the supporters of the bill are simply ignoring that fact. The government, and the Attorney General specifically, tries to cite the findings of a six-week desktop review, and other Labor senators referred to that. Madam Deputy Chair, you did refer to that on the basis of two accountants. Now, I know accountants are brilliant, but they're not specialists in this field. And in my direct experience in, recently in Victoria, they're the last people you turn to if you actually want expert advice. Uh, now, making a radical change to the family court system, and probably the most radical in the 40 years it's existed, on the basis of a desktop review by two accountants strikes me as a little short-sighted, subject to being argued as somewhat discredited, easily discredited. And I know PwC does very well out of this government. You know, one of the great beneficiaries of this government. And you can put forward a whole series of heroic assumptions and you can suggest that there's enormous levels of complexity on these matters, but it's a simply a series of patently ridiculous assertions that don't make up the facts in terms of the way in which people actually live and the lived experience of the way in which family law is actually administered in the country. This will undermine the specialist nature of family law in, the, in this country. Over time, there is just no doubt in my mind that's exactly what will happen. What the government's claim, without evidence, is that the merging of the two courts will help reduce delays and backlogs. And while I'm sure everyone will say, well, we need a single point of entry on family law 
And of course, we need common rules and forms and practices and procedures. And of course, we need to enhance the way in which judicial appointments are made. The reality is very simple, very different in the practice, given what I've already said about the backlogs that exist at the moment and the workloads that individual judges are having to deal with at this point. Now, the Legal and Con Committee heard from no lesser authority than the Chief Justice of the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court himself. And simply, these things can all be done without legislative change. We also heard from many other former Chief Justices of the Family Court, Elizabeth Revett, um, I think it was Alastair Nicholson, who all said this was unnecessary, inappropriate. And in fact, if I might quote Mr Nicholson, he said, it's unbelievable that the government would propose a dissolution of the Federal Superior Court in this fashion without the most careful and searching public inquiry and without carrying out significant research and without consulting the many experts in this field. Well, I'd actually have to take some issue with Mr Nicholson. You simply can't say things like that about this government because it is quite believable. They do do things like that. It is disgraceful. It's unconscionable, it's irresponsible, and it's very believable, because this is a government that acts without evidence and without listening. And that's what the legal fraternity across this country is telling us. We should pay attention to them. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. This is the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Bill 2019. Over the past year, it's been an immense privilege to be in the role of Deputy Chair of the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System. The work of the committee has revealed what many of us know, that the proceedings, structure and systems of the Family Court profoundly impact more Australians than any other part of our legal system, and too often that impact has devastating effects. I first brought up many of these issues and problems in and around the Family Court back in 1996, and I have never wavered in my belief that the Family Court requires far-reaching and a thorough overhaul if it is to properly serve the millions of Australians who come under its influence. This bill and the changes recommended are close to my heart and I speak with the benefit of first-hand knowledge. I have personally experienced and survived the family court as a wife, then as a mother, and later as a grandmother. And yes, I have experienced domestic violence. I have described the scope of these impacts previously in this place, and I can think of no better way to focus our, our minds on the human motivation for this bill than to quote my words from Hansard. The family law system has been and continues to be plagued by deep emotions, sadness, financial hardship and bankruptcies, long-term psychological damage, abuse, stress, suicides and, in some cases, murder. And I paraphrase here, including the murder of children by both male and female parents and extended family members. Unfortunately, there are those in the community who thrive on the pain of those going through separation and the courts, lawyers who charge exorbitant fees to the point of bankrupting clients, feminists who relish the toxic anti-men rhetoric, and jaded partners who will stop at nothing to use their separation and the court system to crush their rivals, including unfounded claims of domestic violence. <coughs> Unfortunately, they are also harming their children in the process. Put simply, we need to revamp the system to make it better for everyone involved. The family court is in an unusual position of being a rigged, formalised judicial body that is tasked with overseeing challenges that are human, all unique, emotional and characterised by vulnerability. 
And as I've said previously, a one-size-fits-all approach in this arena will always fail." End quote. Participation in the family court system, whether willingly or when a person is dragged in and compelled to defend allegations, has taken an all too often terrible toll on potentially millions of people in this country. This bill is the product of a series of reviews that began when the simple review in 2008. The simple review produced a report titled Future Governance Options for Federal Family Law Courts in Australia. This report found, and I quote, there exists a significant level of duplication of administrative structures and corporate services across the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court, end quote. The report found that the structure and costs were not financially sustainable. It also found the structure took up resources that could have been used more effectively to assist people appearing before the court. The 2012 Ski Hill Review looked at a number of options for action designed to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of court administration. The 2014 KPMG review found the current funding model for the courts was not sustainable and simply throwing money at the problem was not a solution. In 2018, yet another review, the PwC review, looked at the operations of the courts in relation to family law matters. Which brings us to 2019, when the Australian Law Reform Commission review, commissioned by then Attorney General Randis, handed down its report. And if, following report after report and review after review, you didn't already think there was reason enough to be here today, just listen to the Commission's report, which said the family law system has been, and I quote, deprived of resources to such an extent that it cannot deliver the quality of justice expected of a country like Australia. There is a chronic lack of funding for the appointment and proper training of judicial resources, court-based social services professionals, including family consultants and Indigenous liaison officers, and legal aid services, including independent children's lawyers. As a consequence, children and families are deprived of sufficient time and attention being given to the matter at all stages of the process with the obvious risks that this entails." End quote. So a decade of reports and reviews confirm time after time the system, the structure and the funding of the courts in this most critical of areas were all wrong and proved that tinkering at the edges left a trail of devastated families in its wake. At the time of its interim report last October, the Joint Select Committee, on which I serve as Deputy Chair, has received more than 1,500 individual submissions as well as 169 submissions from organisations, academics and other professionals, all of which brings us to today and the bill before us. We are told by the Attorney-General that the structural reforms contained within the bill will help Australian families resolve their disputes faster provide appropriate protection for vulnerable people and ensure suitability qualified and experienced professionals are available to support families in need. I also note that the proposed structural reform of the federal courts is intended to create a consistent pathway for Australian families in having their family law disputes dealt with in the federal courts improve the efficiency of the federal court system and ensure outcomes for Australian families are resolved in the most timely, informed and cost-effective manner possible. We are told also the long overdue structural reform has the potential to allow an extra 8,000 cases to be resolved each year. That's 8,000 cases. Just last year, we had an extra 45. We had 45,000 cases become, come before the federal circuit court. That will so resolve an extra 8,000 a year, which no doubt will reduce the significant frustration felt by so many families. There has been criticism of the bill from some legal quarters that does not surprise me. I believe it's fair to say that being appointed judge of the Family Court of Australia has, until now, 
been regarded as a golden ticket within the legal profession. Any alteration to the current system will probably upset the long-term retirement and pension plans of some in the profession, and I don't doubt that's where a lot of the squealing and resistance is coming from. This legislation will provide a single pathway for Australian families to have their family law disputes dealt with within the federal courts. That's our first priority, is the people of this nation that are going through the hurt and pain, not only of a separation from the, their loved ones and the families and their children, it's the fact is they have to face our family law courts. They are our main priority. And if we can address this system and clean it up and make it easy for them, that is our job. I'm not interested in what the law fraternity want and their comments. It's all about the people in Australia. Under this reform, there will be a single set of rules, procedures, case management and practices. But as the law currently exists, these changes cannot occur without the agreement of a majority of judges in each court agreeing to respective rules. That's why this bill has been drawn up, because they can't come to any decision because it may affect them personally. That's why we have to make the decisions on the behalf of the people of this nation. And I turn my a lot of people in this chamber, and I've explained to you, I've gone through the family law courts as a wife, as a mother, as a grandmother, and I've seen my children go through the pain and ang anger and what they've had to go through. How many in this chamber have actually experienced that? How many have actually experienced domestic violence? That's a question that we need to, to ask, people need to know. And to sit here in judgment of people that you have no, you know, you've never worn their shoes. All people tell me all the time, pull me up, is that, please do something. I can't see my children. I have you know, this long system of waiting. You can't get to see your kids or it's under supervision. The pain and anger that people feel, the suicides, the murders, the murders of children, filicide. It's always raised about, and I can constantly talk about the fathers out there because they have, they have forgotten ones in many cases, and it shouldn't be. We talk about filicide, which I've raised. The stats show that filicide is committed by women more than what men are. That's the murder of your children. But no, don't discuss that. These facts need to be open to the public, because I will not have any man wrongly accused and pointed at or downtrodden by feminist organisations or people with their own agenda. It's not about the sex, it's, it comes down to the children, it's about the marriage breakups and what's happening, that we have to address all this, wholesome, that we can find the answers to it. This action takes it out of the hands of judges who have been appointed for life and puts it in the hands of the people through their elected representatives, us. In other words, it takes it out of the hands of those who have a vested interest in maintaining the system and retaining extraordinary well-paid jobs for life and puts it in the hands of politicians who remain directly answerable to the electorate. And this restructuring, we are told by the Attorney-General, will not lead to a diminishing of specialisation. In fact, in the federal circuit courts, we have about 63 judges. Fifty of those judges are specialised. They have an average of 25 years' experience in family law. And a lot of the fed, fed, um, federal circuit court judges go on to become family law court judges. They hear an extraordinary number of cases a year, not only family law but migration, civil matters, other matters as well. But in the family law court, they don't have the workload as the others do in the Federal Circuit Court. If you want a decision in the, in the family law courts, you're waiting over 26 months. In the Federal Circuit Court, averages 23 months for a decision to be handed down. No wonder there are so many suicides and depression and, and problems. And it's not only the parents who are going through it, 
the children are going through it as well because they don't have that contact with, the with their parents. They're denied that right. And the court system, and I've got to say that it was one nation that brought it to the government's attention over three years ago with the Lighthouse Project, which has now been installed into the, into the law system, into the courts. And this is working to help with domestic violence. It was one nation that actually brought it because I could see the potential that this was a wonderful thing to, that we have. And it's been utilised now, and I'm pleased to see that. Many other changes that I will be proposing to the um, committee that I'm deputy chair of. But this needs to happen. We need to merge the two courts. The restructuring has to happen. I can't accept that this restructure will in any way diminish the experience or the expertise of judges involved going forward. The restructuring proposal in the bill is long overdue, and it's intended relief for families before the court is urgently required. I have maintained my efforts to reform the family court for over 20 years, and I am genuinely happy to strongly commend and congratulate the Attorney General for presenting this bill in its current form. It represents a significant step forward, and I confirm that One Nation will be supporting the bill. Yeah. Senator Carr, Scar. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Firstly, I'd like to say that I take it as given that every single person in this chamber simply wants to do their best to make sure that Australian families going through family law issues get the best outcomes for themselves and for their families. Secondly, I want to say I deeply respect the members of the legal practitioner who have raised concerns with respect to this bill, and I have considered those concerns. However, upon reviewing the bill, I cannot help but come to the conclusion that this is a necessary reform. And I say that for six fundamental reasons. First, at the moment, family law matters are being dealt with by two courts, the Family Law Court and the Federal Circuit Court. That's the reality now. And those listening to this debate um, outside of this place, if they were listening to some of the contributions being made, they would have thought that we had a system where all family law matters are being dealt with in the Family Court. They simply aren't. Nearly 90 per cent of matters dealing with family law are being dealt with in the Federal Circuit Court. Not the Family Court, the Federal Circuit Court. That's fact today. One of the fundamental aspects of the reform which is contained in this bill is to provide a single entry point, a single entry point when claims are made or proceedings initiated with respect to family law matters. A single entry point, and that's important. Secondly, it will provide a single set of rules. I cannot understand why we cannot have a single set of court rules dealing with family law matters. At the moment, we have the Federal Circuit Court rules, then we have the Family Court rules. Why can't we have one single set of rules on the basis that this will promote efficiency and decrease costs? It's common sense. Third, specialist family law skills will be maintained. They are maintained under this bill. That is not put in jeopardy by this legislation at all. Fourth, all of the services which are currently provided in the context of family law matters by the Family Court will continue to be provided and, in fact, are already provided in the Federal Circuit Court when it's dealing with family law matters. Five, there will be a more efficient appeal system. And as Senator Patrick commented, I cannot see why in the family law jurisdiction that judges who are hearing appeals can also not hear matters at first instance. That occurs in the federal court. I see absolutely no reason why it should not happen in, in all family law matters. And that reform will be brought about by this legislation. And six, and I think this is a really fundamental uh, point in this legislation, and that deals with the legal profession. 
The bill will create a new obligation imposing a duty on parties to act consistently with the overarching purpose of facilitating the just resolution of disputes according to law and as quickly, inexpensively and efficiently as possible. And I want to read that again. Facilitate the just resolution of disputes according to law and as quickly, inexpensively and efficiently as possible. And I was listening to Senator Watt's contribution to this debate, as I always do, very carefully. And I couldn't help but notice when he referred to the term efficiency and throughput, he did it with a measure of disdain, as if those are things, well, we shouldn't be totally concerned with throughput and efficiency. Well, we need to be absolutely concerned with throughput and efficiency. We need family law matters to be dealt with as efficiently and as quickly as possible so that the families and family members can get on with their lives and not spend years, years in the system chewing up family assets, going through a process to try and get resolution. The current system is simply not working for hundreds and thousands of Australians. Two important amendments were made to the bill in relation to specialisation and also in relation to the formulation of the court rules. And Senator Patrick touched upon these two important amendments, and I wholeheartedly support these amendments and congratulate the members in this place who made representation seeking those amendments. The first is that there will be a minimum of 25 Division I judges, and that's the division which constitutes a continuation of the family court. It will have to continue to have a minimum of 25 judges, and that's in the legis legislation. It's not in the regulation. It's in the legislation, and that's important, and I support that amendment 100 per cent. Secondly, there will be only a period of 18 months for the Chief Justice on a transition basis to develop one set of court rules. And then, after that 18-month period, the position will revert to the usual situation with respect to input and decision-making across the judiciary. And that, again, is as it should be. And I support that amendment and can see absolutely no reason why those opposite would oppose a situation where there is a merger of the family court with the court, the Federal Circuit Court, which deals with nearly 90 per cent of family law matters. And then, as a transitional, on a transitional basis, the Chief Justice has an opportunity to develop one set of court rules to apply to the merged entity. To me, it's common sense, absolute common sense. I can't see the downside in terms of this reform. I've looked for it. I've looked for it. I've truly looked for it. But I find it extraordinarily difficult to find any downside whatsoever. I can find a downside if I went back to 2010, which those opposite proposed, the Labor Party, and I know my friend Senator Watt wasn't in this place in 2010, but there are those opposite who were, and that was an abolition of the Federal Circuit Court, an abolition of a court rather than a merger of two courts, an abolition. And of course that was a failed reform, an absolute failed reform which got no currency, got no traction and was not proceeded with. So I think those opposites should reflect quite carefully on the history of these matters before they attack this reform. The second point I'd like to make in relation to Senator Watt's contribution is, as I stated, he talks about throughput as if, as if that, uh, with almost disdain. We don't need to consider the throughput of our court system. The efficient delivery of justice to Australians seeking orders that can be legally enforced to allow their families to get, up, get, 
move ahead in their lives is absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial, and that is not occurring at the moment. We need to do something to correct the efficiency of the system. As I stated, the family court is not the only court that deals with family law matters. Nearly 90 per cent of family law matters are actually dealt with in the federal circuit court. This is not a case where we have only judges in the family court dealing with family law matters. And as been mentioned by previous speakers, close to 50 judges on the federal circuit court have over 25 years' experience Order. in family law Senator matters. Senator Scar, you will be in continuation. We'll move to questions without notice. Senator Sheldon, with his... Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Anne is uh, an aged care nurse who has been in her profession since 1978. She has said, and I quote, the proposed legislation doesn't make things better for us and our residents. It makes it so much worse. And to be honest, I don't think I can handle any more cuts. Can the minister guarantee Mr Morrison's industrial changes won't see workers paid less? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank the Senator for his question. Uh, I can absolutely guarantee that the industrial relations reforms our government proposes, alongside indeed all of the measures our government is proposing, are about ensuring that Australians have access to more jobs, to more job opportunities, to be able to work in an economy that is growing faster, more strongly, in creating those jobs, creating and putting pressure on wages over time to drive wages growth too, and that indeed what we want for Anne or for any employee across Australia is to have more opportunity overall, Mr. President. To have more opportunity overall, and so our determination through this passage, having spent many hours, many hours engaging with the union movement, engaging with employer organisations is to try to find efficiencies within the operation of the industrial relations system Order. such that there can be far greater confidence far greater confidence for employers to grow their businesses to hire more people to create more opportunities because that is precisely what we have been driving at as a government and as we've worked through this pandemic period we've been able to save according to the reserve bank some 700,000 jobs saved as a result of some of the direct policy actions of the government. We have been able to bring back more than 90 per cent of those employees who found that their hours went to zero or lost their jobs during the depths of the pandemic. We have been able to see around 800,000 jobs recreated, jobs growth over recent time and, pleasingly, very significant jobs growth among women. Because one of our greatest achievements prior to the pandemic was to see women's workforce rec participation reaching record levels, and it's fantastic to see it driving Order. back Senator to that Birmingham, point yet again. The answer expired. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Karen has been a registered nurse for 12 years. She says losing her penalty rates under the coalition industrial relations changes, and, and I quote, will have an impact on my income and that of my colleagues. This will mean a drop in our standard of living and spending power. Why does the coalition government want to inflict pay cuts on our nurses in the middle of a pandemic? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, it's just not the case. It's not the case that there is any intention for those sorts of outcomes from the legislation that is before this parliament and upon which a committee will report in a few weeks' time Order. and which this chamber will have its opportunity at that stage to debate and to Order. pursue. But our intention is fully that there are more jobs, more job opportunities, and from that, from that, better Senator income security for Australians into the future. And we want to make sure, we want to make sure through this that there are the maximum incentives for new jobs to be created for Australians, be they on greenfield sites, for example, where there have long been concerns about the operation of the system. And what's distressing is that those opposite have decided to check themselves out of the debate completely in favour of a scare campaign. They've said, 
We are voting against this bill holus bolus, even the parts that the trade union movement have argued for. They are not even going to vote for tougher penalties on wage theft. It is remarkable Order, to think that that Senator is the case. Senator Birmingham, time for the answer has expired. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. Aged care nurse Belinda has pleaded, and I quote, it is already so hard for us. Please do not make things harder. Why is Mr Morrison and his government ignoring the pleas of workers like Belinda and instead choosing to suppress wage growth and exacerbating insecure working conditions in the middle of a global pandemic? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, a better question would be why is Senator Ciccone and the Labor Party so intent on trying to scare people with falsehoods, with lies, with mistruths? Why is it, Mr Order. President, why is it, Mr. President that those opposite have checked themselves out of Order any sort of rational left. policy debate and instead Senator they Wong. just want to try to Senator run another Keneally. scare campaign? Well, on this side of, in this Order. side of Parliament, we are about trying to get things done that create more jobs. And our government succeeded. Senator Watt. Through our first six years, Senator Watt, we created one and a half million more jobs for Australians. Order. One Senator and a half Birmingham. million more jobs. Senator Birmingham, please resume your seat. I doubt anyone in the chamber can hear me with my open microphone. There was so much noise. I'm going to ask for some restraint. Well, I couldn't hear him either, Senator Farrell. There were too many interjections. Senator Birmingham. I'm pleased Senator Farrell could hear me because I was talking about the more than one and a half million additional jobs created through the first six years of our term in government. Workforce participation hitting record levels. Women's workforce participation hitting record levels. We want to make sure that we get back to that point post-pandemic. The only Senator thing in our way is you lot. Time for the answers expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister inform the Senate of the government's plans to roll out the COVID-19 vaccine into aged care facilities across the country? The Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Van, for the question, an important one, especially given the Prime Minister and the Health Minister have just advised of the TGA's provisional regulatory approval of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is, of course, central to our vaccine strategy. Mr President, rolling out the COVID-19 vaccine to our frontline health care quarantine workers and our most vulnerable is the highest priority of the government. We saw the first delivery of Pfizer vaccines touch down in Sydney yesterday, and we are working to have those vaccines distributed to those priority groups across the country. Vaccination for residents and staff will be made available through residential aged care facilities where they live or work. The, the vaccine implement in implementation plan for residential aged care plans aims to administer doses to more than 240 aged care facilities in the first week. Vaccin vaccines will be delivered by Commonwealth-led teams. Mr. President. Healthcare Australia will provide vaccination workforce in New South Wales and Queensland, and Aspen Medical will res be responsible for the other states and territories. The vaccination program will be supported at local levels by the primary health networks, and everybody, Mr. President, responsible for providing vaccine, uh, the vaccine in aged care settings, will be required to have completed the relevant tr training, including the use of multi-use. Uh, multi-dose multi vials, cold storage and, of course, infection control. In the coming weeks, Mr President, the vaccination program will reach more than 2,600 res residential aged care facilities, more than 183,000 residents and 339,000 staff. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government is supporting providers, residents and their families for the vaccine rollout. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. An important question. Information has been sent out, Mr. President, to aged care facilities for residents and their families, carers and loved ones about what to expect in the lead up to and on vaccination day. Our clinical workforce will work very closely with each facility in the lead up to vaccination day to plan and to make sure each vaccination day runs safely and efficiently. Each residential aged care facility will ask residents and their substitute 
or their substitute decision maker if one is in place to consent to receiving a COVID-19 vaccine. Clinical staff at facilities will check the health of residents prior to administering the vaccine, and if families have any concerns about the health of residents, they should consult a GP. As always, safety, safety, safety is uppermost in our minds as we embark on our vaccination program across the country. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister also update the Senate on the phased national rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, COVID-19 risks the lives of the most vulnerable in our society. We have prioritised the, those most at risk, our senior Australians and our frontline workers. They will be part of phase 1A. It is on track, as planned, to roll out next week. Phase 1B will include adults aged over 70 years and over, other healthcare workers, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 55, younger adults with an underlying medical condition, including those with a disability, critical high-risk workers, including defence, police, fire, emergency services and meat processing workers. Phase 2A Mr. President, includes adults aged 50 to 69 years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aged 18 to 54 years and other critical and high-risk workers. Phase 2B Mr. President, extends to the remainder of the population uh, within Australia over the age of 16. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Yesterday, the Minister stated that the grant to the National Retailers Association was made, and I quote, in response to that terrible terrorist attack in Melbourne. Does the Minister stand by this statement? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, yes, I do. And I'll reiterate the advice that I received yesterday. So, uh, the National Retail Association, as I noted yesterday, does donate to both sides of politics. But I did also note that there was the Burke Street terror attack on the 9th of November. Uh, on the 9th of November 2018, one male attacker, whose name I won't mention, set his car on fire and stabbed three people and attacked police in Melbourne. Of those three stabbing victims, as we all know, one was a much beloved Melbourne identity, uh, Sisto Malaspina. A retailer of the type, of which the National Retailers Association provides advocacy for. Later the same month, on the 20th of November, three men inspired by the Islamic State terror group were arrested on suspicion of plotting a terror attack in Melbourne. They had tried to source a semi-automatic rifle to kill as many people as possible in a crowded space, police will allege. The National Retailers Association applied for funding for a Protecting, protecting Crowded Places project to assist retailers to deter, detect, delay and respond to a terrorist attack. Now, noting the significant events affecting the public and retailers over the months of November 2018, uh, the Minister for Home Affairs Office asked the Department of Home Affairs to consider this proposal, and, I've, and he has asked also, and he asked the Department of Finance uh, to cost it to ensure it was suitable and it was value for money. Uh, the proposal was subsequently assessed and recommended to be funded as it represented value for money and a proper use of Commonwealth resources, consistent with the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act 2013. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. I thank the minister for that answer. Documents released under Freedom of Information show that on 28 September 2018, almost two months before the Burke Street attack, Minister Dutton directed his department to consider a proposal for a grant to the National Retailers Association for protecting public spaces. How could the minister request his department to consider a grant in response to a terrorist attack that had not yet occurred? Senator Reynolds. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. And Senator Keneally, I think you have completely misunderstood, so I might go, I'll go back over the answer I've just given. Order. It, I'll just give you yeah, Order. Sorry. This is, all, this is all about the politics of this issue, and this is really, this is really not a grant or a grant program to take, uh, to take that out. So again, this grant was for the type, for the type of these activities. The National Retailers Association who represents left. businesses like those who were impacted by that terrible attack, seeking for crowded place protection. That is exactly Senators, at the heart Keneally. of what this grant was all about. Senator Scar, Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Public documents reveal the minister received a direct political donation from the National Retailers Association a week before he asked his department to fast-track a nearly million-dollar grant. The Burke Street terrorist attack was a national tragedy. It saw one victim lose his life and two stabbing victims seriously injured. Is the minister really using this tragedy to cover up his conflict of interest? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And there is only one side of politics in this chamber who is playing politics with this issue. It was very clear that this was funding for protecting crowded places, which is exactly what Order. you said, what Senator Keneally said. Senator Keneally. It was vetted by finance, it was vetted by the Home Affairs, Order. and this was to protect retailers from terrorist attacks. It is that simple, and there is only one side who is playing politics with that, and that is that side of the chamber. Order. I'm going to ask senators to recall my re Senator Keneally. Senator Keneally, while I'm talking, please. I'm going to ask people to respect my request that when they're called by name to at least count to ten slowly before they start breaching standing orders again. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. I refer to Brittany Higgins's allegations of rape in this building almost two years ago. I asked you yesterday whether the Sex Discrimination Commissioner would be tasked with a culture review of Parliament, but you didn't answer me. The Prime Minister this morning announced that a Liberal MP will undertake a culture review and that the Deputy Secretary of PMNC will undertake a review of the handling of Brittany's complaint. Given the secrecy with which previous reviews have been undertaken by PMNC, will the Prime Minister guarantee that the findings of these reviews will be made public? And how can women have confidence that change will flow from two internal reviews when the culture of silencing is part of the problem? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Waters for her question. It's essential uh, in matters such as this that uh, the support provided to uh, employees uh, members of parliament uh, or any other uh, individual in this building uh, is support that uh, is timely, uh, is effective and uh, is ongoing or enduring wherever necessary. Uh, it's important that in ensuring that we can provide such support to individuals, everyone has confidence in the processes and support and systems that are available to them. And that's why the Prime Minister has asked in particular the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet to assist and advise on how those processes uh, can work to support people. It is my full expectation uh, that in relation to the conduct of that work, uh, Ms Foster, the Deputy Secretary, uh, will engage with Kate Jenkins, the Sexual Discrimination Commissioner and author of the Respect at Work report. I also note that in the other place, uh, the Prime Minister has indicated a willingness uh, and openness to working with party leaders uh, across the parliament in relation to how these processes can be strengthened, uh, including the type of work uh, that Ms Foster will undertake uh, and any additional assistance or work alongside her that will be necessary. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. Uh, noting the Prime Minister's previous empathy training, will the Prime Minister now undertake training to become aware of the victim blaming implicit in his statement about Brittany, quote, being found in a vulnerable situation, end quote, as opposed to men's bad behaviour causing that situation, and training to understand the sexist underpinnings of his statement that he had to think of his daughters when thinking about how Brittany's rape case should have been handled? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, respect is crucial at all points of considering these matters. And ultimately, uh, respect in this particular case for Brittany, her wishes and the support that she needs is the most important factor. The government, through different, uh, through the minister, as indicated, sought to provide a support for Brittany. It is with deep regret and deeply distressing that despite those efforts, including Minister Reynolds facilitating discussions with the police and the offer of assistance through the Department of Finance, that that support was not adequate. And we have to address that and rectify those issues. That's what the processes that will be undertaken will seek to do to ensure that whilst we will continue to offer whatever support to Brittany and to the police investigation, that also in the future we make sure that Order. staff can have greater Senator confidence Birmingham. in the support that Time is available to them and utilise it.
Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. This morning, the Prime Minister said that Brittany should be listened to. Will he listen to her call today for an independent body for staff to take complaints to? Senator Birmingham. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I imagine that, uh, that uh, the robustness uh, of the Department of Finance procedures that are available at present uh, will absolutely be part of uh, investigations and discussions that ensue in relation to these matters. Uh, and where uh, gaps exist in terms of the confidence uh, that staff have in utilising those processes, well then options will be on the table to fill those gaps. And the government is not seeking to rule out uh, options in that regard. You know, the most important thing is that the support is there for individuals like Brittany to feel empowered to make the best decisions for them, to feel supported, empowered and respected through the decision-making processes uh, that they wish to make. And clearly, clearly, the systems need to be in place to support individuals feeling that way, and we want to make sure that the systems are enhanced to achieve that outcome. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Birmingham as the minister representing the Treasurer. Last night, the ABC's Australian story rang a harrowing story about the dangers of button batteries. Last December, after many years of lobbying by advocates, including parents and paediatricians, the government introduced mandatory safety standards for button batteries, but these only come into effect in 18 months' time. In the ABC program, the deputy chair of the ACCC said, we need a general safety provision that makes it illegal to sell unsafe goods in Australia. At the moment, it is not illegal." End of quote. Minister, the government has been looking at the introduction of a general safety provision since 2015. Does the government agree that there must be a general safety provision that makes it illegal to sell unsafe goods in Australia? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Griff uh, for his question and, uh, and I know his uh, advocacy on these issues. I note uh, his uh, moving in, uh, in November of last year a motion in the Senate related to button batteries and, uh, and also uh, the call for, to introduce a general product safety provision uh, in the Australian consumer law. Uh, the government uh, certainly takes seriously the safety of consumers. Uh, and on the 21st of December, as you acknowledge, the government announced new mandatory safety and information standards for button batteries and products that contain them to improve the safety of such products, including their design, packaging and labelling. Uh, there are indeed distressing stories in the past in relation uh, to such products, uh, and the government has sought to work uh, through the processes of consumer law, which include engagement with the states and territories, uh, to be able to bring about uh, this ban and to provide heightened levels of protection. Uh, in relation to uh, general product safety provisions, certainly the government is, uh, is of a uh, strong view uh, that all actions to protect uh, consumers uh, wherever necessary from unsafe products ought to be taken. Uh, obviously, there are legal remedies and, uh, and expectations in the common law at present uh, that are available uh, and place expectations upon businesses in relation to uh, the safety of products that are offered uh, on the market. Uh, however, uh, in terms of specific consideration around uh, a general product safety provision, uh, I will uh, revert to, uh, to the uh, relevant ministers and uh, provide any further information that I can to, uh, to the Chamber, Senator Griff. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, you haven't clearly stated whether you intend to legislate. You reference that you will defer to the appropriate minister. So should I take it that the government at this point does not agree that Australia needs to urgently legislate a general safety provision? I mean, it's five years down the track now and a number of very significant issues. It does appear that the government does not see this as an urgent matter. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Um, Senator Griff, uh, certainly, product safety overall uh, is very important. Uh, a general product safety provision, uh, I imagine, uh, would come with a number of uh, different uh, complexities in relation to its drafting and interpretation. Uh, clearly, as I indicated before, there are processes in relation to consumer law matters uh, over which the states and territories uh, often have primacy and which are usually uh, developed uh, in consultation and through consensus and agreement uh, across the relevant ministerial councils there. 
I'm not uh, uh, briefed uh, today in terms of the detail and status of those particular discussions. Uh, that's why I undertook in the primary question to consult with relevant ministers, uh, and I will do that and bring whatever further information in relation to that more sweeping provision uh, back to the chamber for you. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, I, I appreciate that you'll bring that information uh, back to the chamber. But when you do that, do you personally see this as a priority and a priority that needs to be dealt with before Parliament is uh, prorogued for the next election? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, th thanks, Mr President. Well, I certainly see the safety uh, of Australian consumers and particularly young consumers, children, as a very uh, stark priority and an important one. Uh, it's important in terms of the work of this parliament that we make sure that the legislation we bring forward, when we bring it forward, is also effective in meeting uh, the objectives. Uh, there, is, uh, there is little point in terms of uh, generic provisions, bringing them forward uh, if they will simply uh, create uh, confusion but not effectively provide for the outcome, in this case the outcome of, uh, of safety. Uh, that's why working through, uh, particularly with the states and territories in relation to such consumer law protections is uh, the appropriate thing. It's also the necessary thing under our constitutional structures. Uh, I would hope that uh, if such provisions can be provided for that do give a significant enhancement to consumer safety, uh, that they would be brought forward as quickly as possible, Senator Griff. But uh, without having those, uh, those briefings and advice, I can't commit to Order. a timeline Senator team today. Senator Birmingham. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Reports indicate the alleged rapist's employment with the Minister's office ended on Tuesday, the 26th of March 2019. What was the reason for his employment ended, and did he resign or was he sacked? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank uh, the Senator for her question. Uh, I will answer the question, but if you would allow me just to address some of the matters that have been the subject of uh, a lot of media in the last 24 hours. Reflecting on the circumstances and reflecting on what I would say here in the chamber today, uh, saying sorry is often the hardest thing for those of us who work in this place to say. But can I say today, sorry is the easiest word for me to say. And I unreservedly apologise to Brittany Higgins. And last night we all heard from Brittany herself in her own words. Her trauma, her distress was very, very clear to all to see. The fact that she felt unsupported in her time working here was also very, very clear for us all to see. And for that, I apologise. At the time, I truly believed that I and my chief of staff were doing everything we could to support that young woman who I had responsibility for. At all times, my, my intent and my aim was to empower Brittany and let her determine the course of her own situation. Not by me, not by my staff, not by the government as a whole, but by Brittany. When I first met with her in my office about the matter, I was not aware of the details and circumstances of what occurred. However, I deeply, deeply regret conducting the meeting in my office where the alleged incident had occurred. It is now clear that this also has called ongoing distress to Brittany herself and compounded order. the trauma Senator, that she continues Senator to Reynolds, experience. Got, and Senator, for that I... Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, Mr President, uh, what I would ask is uh, I would move that the minister be given an extension of time, because obviously she wishes to make this statement, but this is, we also would have given her leave to make this statement at any time. Uh, as she has said, she will want, uh, come to the uh, question. Uh, so I would propose by leave that she be given a further two minutes to come to the question when she's concluded this statement. I'll take it unless there's an objection that leave is granted. Please reset the clock. Senator Reynolds. Uh, look, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and thank you very much for, uh, to Penator, Senator Wong for that. Um, as I said, it was very clear to me uh, from seeing and hearing from Brittany on the TV last night that there was a range of circumstances which compounded her trauma and her grief. 
No woman should ever have to go through what she has clearly been through. That trauma, that trauma that comes not just in the immediate aftermath of an assault, but in the many months and the many long years that follow it, is what those of us in this building failed to acknowledge. However, listening uh, to Brittany describe the depression and the trauma she experienced in that subsequent time, it is very, very clear to me that more could and should have been done to support her. The kind of support Brittany needs has to start in a political office. It starts with her boss, in this case with me, with her colleagues, with her friends, but it cannot, it cannot end there. That is why I welcome the Prime Minister's announcement this morning that he intends to look at how we can improve the support mechanisms offered to staff and the processes around the handling of these most serious of workplace complaints. Um, as the inquiries uh, that the Prime Minister has announced and as the AFP investigation that was opened two years ago uh, continue, uh, I will work with them. Uh, in every way that I possibly can. Uh, Mr President, we have to do better and I'm sure we all want to do better. Uh, in relation to the question of my second staff member, um, he, he left my office shortly after that. I sought advice from Ministerial and Parliamentary Services uh, who assisted me uh, through that process and he was terminated from my Order, office. Senator Reynolds' time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. So I think the answer is that he was sacked. Is that correct? The alleged rapist has been described as the minister's favourite, a go-to person who had a special bond with the minister. Did the minister consider it odd that her favourite go-to person would resign on the spot uh, for a security breach? without a conversation with her? Has the minister had any contact with the alleged offender since his, resi or since his termination? And if so, when? Senator Reynolds. Well, look, thank you very much, Mr President. And the circumstances for both of my staff uh, will be subject of all of the ongoing investigations because they all relate to the same matter. Uh, all, what I can say, what I, what I can say what I can say is, of course, I am responsible for my own conduct, and as every single person in this place is. In relation to uh, how I dealt with both of my staff, at all times I sought advice from ministerial and parliamentary services who worked and assisted me right through this process in how to deal with both of my staff members. Now, the details and the circumstances of that uh, I don't think it's fair for either party to air in this place today. However, there will be, I understand, the ongoing AFP investigation and order. the internal Senator, investigations what, Reynolds, where, where I, I believe Senator is the Wong right place on, on to air those. Order. Senator, oh. Senator Wong on a point of order. We direct relevance. The question was asked whether or not the minister has had any contact with the alleged offender since his termination. I ask the minister to return to the question. Um, that no, that, 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 that I've allowed you to restate the last part of the question, Senator Wong. I, I do believe the minister is being directly relevant to an earlier part of the question. Um, there's a, an opportunity to debate these matters at an appropriate time. Senator Reynolds to continue. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, look, as I said, these were very complex matters. He left, Order. He left Senator Reynolds' time he for left the answer my office. has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Order. Senator, Senator Gallagher is on her feet. Thank you. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate why the uh, the alleged offender was terminated? And can you also inform the Senate whether the alleged rapist was assisted in finding employment following the alleged rape um, by herself or any other member of the government or your staff? Uh, whether you provided a reference for that person. Senator Reynolds. Uh, sorry, Mr President, I'm uh, somewhat bemused by the question. The person, the person was terminated by me with the assistance of ministerial and parliamentary services. 
I will take advice Order. on how much I can say about that person's termination, but he was, he was terminated very shortly after this incident. And I'll, I'll take on notice and seek some further advice about how much, Order. about how much I can actually say in relation to the circumstances Order. surrounding this. And I will come back to the chamber Order. when I've received that advice. Order. 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 Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Could the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's support for the construction industry through the COVID-19 pandemic has supported jobs, small businesses and kept apprentices in training and built the foundation for economic recovery? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And, uh, I thank Senator O'Sullivan for his question. And, uh, Mr President, the construction industry in Australia it is just fundamental to our economy. It employs now over 1.1 million Australians, and in terms of the number of small and family businesses within the construction industry itself, there are around 390,000 small businesses. This actually equates to roughly 98.5% of all businesses in the sector. Uh, and that is why the Morrison government has made supporting our construction industry a priority throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in terms of what we've actually done for the construction centre, one of the fundamentals was obviously keeping apprentices and trainees on the job where we need them. And of course, when you get hit with the pandemic, the apprentices and trainees are often the first to go, the first that an employer has to lay off. So we put in place a number of programs to assist our employers in keeping those apprentices and trainees on the tools, on the job, where we need them. They are, of course, the Home Builder Program, uh, support for our residential construction pipeline, uh, extending the first loan deposit scheme. Uh, but on top of they were combined. They were a number of policies: JobKeeper, the cash flow boost, the SME guarantee scheme. All of this, all of this, has helped minimise the economic impact on this vital sector. But as we emerge from COVID-19, the foundation these policies put in place is driving our early economic comeback. Over the last quarter of 2020. Employment in the construction industry, Mr President, is actually increased by 2 per cent, or 22,800 jobs. What we've also seen is more than 85,421 applications to the Home Builder Scheme. So what we're seeing is the policies that the Morrison government have put in place throughout the pandemic are assisting the construction industry to employ more people. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank the minister for that answer. How has the Morrison government supporting apprentices and trainees' wage subsidy supported the future of the construction workforce through the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, according to the National Skills Commission, of the 1.1 million people that are employed in Australia by the construction industry, I'm pleased to say that over 50 per cent of them actually have a VET qualification, vocational education and training. In terms of the support that the government provided, we have our supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy. This has been absolutely critical to keeping our apprentices and trainees on the job, as I said. To date, 119,500 apprentices and trainees employed by 62,600 employers have now been assisted, and that includes 59,000 small businesses. And in terms of the actual breakdown of those statistics, what we've seen is 22,500 bricklayers, carpenters and joiners, 17,200 electricians and 12,200 plumbers kept on the job because of the policies that the Morrison government put in place to assist these businesses in the construction industry. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. That's good news. Uh, how can the Morrison government's job maker plan support the future of the construction industry and ensure that it can continue to drive Australia's economic success into the future? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, the policies work together. So, in addition to the pipeline of work that we've secured through the Home Builder uh, policy, what we've also put in place is a boosting apprenticeship commencements policy. This is all about supporting the training of a new generation of apprentices. What we've seen to date in relation to that policy, over 88,000 
new training contacts have been registered with the program to date, and that includes around 20,000 in the construction industry itself. So when you look at the suite of policies uh, that the Morrison government put in place in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, you've seen the business tax incentives that are out there helping businesses, uh, and in particular small businesses. The instant asset write-off, allowing businesses to invest in themselves, uh, but also to write off that new asset. Um, we're removing costly barriers for business. All of those policies combined have supported the construction industry to keep those apprentices and trainees in training on the job where we need Order. them. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, in the Senate Mr. Minister Birmingham. On the 18th of June 2020, the Liberal Party, the National Party and the Labor Party supported a temporary order restricting each senator's ability to move a general business notice of motion. This rule change means that independent senators can move only one motion per week. When you and the Labor Party decided to team up to cut the number of motions that smaller parties were able to move, you argued it was because we were wasting too much of your time. In the six months since that temporary order, your government has spent 102 hours considering 111 bills. Over the same amount of time one year before, you spent 111 hours considering 136 bills. You spent less time on legislation after you gagged us than you did before you gagged us, and this is over the number of sitting weeks too. My question is, what are you doing with all that time you've saved? Order. The Leader of the Government, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I, can, I can say, as Leader of the Government in the Senate and having, uh, having also held Senator Rustin's role as Manager of Government Business in the Senate, that, uh, that it is indeed often one of the deep frustrations uh, for governments, and I suspect it was even the case during the years of Labor governments, that the finite amount of time that exists for government business to be considered in this chamber and government legislation to be considered can be eroded by all manner of different things. Certainly, the use of general business notice of motions had become a very substantial point of erosion in relation to the time that it took in the chamber. But indeed, the chamber provides for senators to do many things by leave, for senators to pursue suspensions of standing orders, for senators to use urgency motions and other things that all add up frequently to an erosion of the amount of time available to consider government legislation. Uh, so, uh, Mr President, uh, there are a number of factors, I think, at play in terms of the consideration of general business notices of motion, not the least of which being the concern felt that increasingly there was a complexity coming into those motions and that that complexity in motions that do not provide an opportunity for individual senators to debate the content of those motions uh, was a problem uh, and was not true and inconsistent with the original intent uh, of the way those motions were, con were uh, expected to be handled. So, uh, so, Mr. President, I think there are still, though, ample opportunities uh, for all senators, be they through the take note debate that will ensue shortly, the urgency motion that will happen this afternoon, the adjournment debate that will happen this evening, uh, the matters of public importance that happen at other times in the Senate schedule, or indeed in the debate of legislation itself, Order. for senators Senator to have their say. Birmingham. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. You've said the temporary gag order was needed to get rid of needless motions designed to make a political statement. On February the 4th, 10 coalition senators moved a motion noting that the Queen's been in power for 69 years. If I agree to only move motions asking the Senate to note the length of reign of foreign monarchs, can I please have my cap lifted? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, th th thanks Mr President. Well, I, I do actually suspect, Senator Lambie, that if, uh, if the Senate had conducted the use of those motions in ways consistent with the original intent of them, uh, which was indeed that for motions to be put without any debate or opportunity for individual senators to make a contribution, they should ordinarily be motions that are largely non-controversial by their nature. That is indeed, if you go back through the past practice of this chamber, what the original intent of that process was. 
So yes, Senator Lambie, if senators had, uh, had simply done that throughout history, we probably would never have got to the point uh, that the Procedure Committee in the Chamber got to in relation to the consideration of this. But there are probably many other points of congratulations and noting uh, that could have been achieved without us reaching that point where the Chamber made the decision that it did in relation to the management of motions. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I have spoken to Senator Patrick, and I know that he has made representations and asked for a reconsideration of this unfair rule change, to which you have provided no response. Do you think you could use some of that time you have saved to actually get back to him? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, and the Senate still sits the same hours per day, and, uh, and indeed my time is, uh, is often used in a range of ways. I've discussed this issue with a number of senators, including uh, Senator Patrick, uh, in, uh, in that regard. Uh, I could equally uh, point out, Senator Lambie, uh, that you have just used one of the questions allocated to you in question time uh, to pursue this matter of Senate process and procedure. Uh, you could have used it to raise any number of issues that you might have wished to do in a motion instead. Um, and that is one of the other avenues available to all senators in this place to be able to pursue uh, their issues. Uh, there are countless avenues available to senators to pursue different issues in this parliament. It doesn't have to be through a general business notice of motion, and I would encourage you and other senators to avail yourself of those different procedures in the standing orders as is appropriate uh, to have your say on behalf of your state or territory. Senator Sheldon. Well, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. On what date did the Minister first become aware of allegations of rape made by her former staff member? What action did the Minister take as a result? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, I thank the Senator for, uh, for that question, uh, Mr. President. Uh, can I just address a couple of the questions that somewhat took me by surprise uh, previously? And I will come to, to that, uh, Senator. Uh, I can confirm, I've just checked, and I can confirm that my second staff member, he was terminated shortly after uh, this incident occurred, and it was for a security breach. Uh, I do not re recollect any contact I've had with him since then, and I certainly cannot recollect sending, doing a reference for him. But I have got, now that uh, this issue has been raised, I'm now doing a search of files. Uh, just to determine that that is true. But I have no recollection, and I can't imagine any circumstance that I would. But again, uh, I, I, will check, I will check that. Yeah, no, ab absolutely, of course. Um, so he was terminated for a security breach. He was terminated for a security breach. Oh. Or, sorry, mm. Senator. Senator yep. Reynolds? Um, sorry, so, in in <laughs> so in relation to the, uh, to the last question. Uh, the, the dates, as I said, I, Senator, you probably know more about the incidents uh, surrounding the incident itself, or at least other members of this chamber do, because there's been a parliamentary inquiry into the circumstances of when and how I was told. So, uh, all of all of all of those details, all of those details, um, I will provide uh, to to the investigation. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Yes. Order. On what date did the minister first become aware that the allegations of rape made by her former staff member related to conduct on her couch in her ministerial office? What action did the minister take as a result? Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And in my answer yesterday and uh, in my answer again today, I have gone through those details, and as I've said, it's now subject. All of all of the detail is subject to an AFP investigation and to t at least two other inquiries. So I will be, as I've said, providing all information and assistance uh, to those inquiries. Oh, sorry, Senator Reynolds. I've got Senator Sheldon on a point of order. Well, I just it's relevance. The, I understand very clearly that Ms. Um, Brittany Higgins has said that she. Uh, is comfortable with these questions being asked. I think it's important that we get to um, these questions being answered, um, and there is the capacity for the minister to dutifully answer them. Um, I, I, I'm, I have allowed you to make that point, Senator Sheldon. I don't think I can rule the minister as being not directly relevant with the answer she's given. Senator Reynolds, have you 
to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And noting uh, what the senator has just said, I think it's even more important that we don't politicise that information any further in this chamber. Her trauma was incredibly raw and evident last night, and I think it is appropriate that all of this information is collected by the AFP, uh, who had opened uh, an inquiry into this two years ago Order. and into here. So, Mr. Mr. President, I think Order. that is the appropriate course of action Order on my left. Uh, for from here on in. Order. I'm going to call Senator Sheldon when there's silence. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. The minister's former staff member was allegedly raped in the defence minister's office almost two years ago. When was the prime minister's office informed, and how? And when was the prime minister informed, and how? Senator Reynolds. Look again. I thank uh, the senator for that question. And as I've said. Uh, I, well, as I'll say now, I cannot speak for the Prime Minister, and I understand he's been addressing that. I, I cannot speak for the Prime Minister, and I will not speak for the Prime Minister. And I understand your colleagues are asking those questions today uh, in the House of Representatives. All I can answer and all I can be responsible for is my own conduct and my responsibilities and how I enacted them. I will do that. I will do that not in this chamber. I will do it as appropriate with the Australian Federal Police. I have provided that information as much as I think is appropriate, Order. and there will be the forums to do that. Order. Order. I'll call Senator McKenzie when the silence. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Is the minister concerned at reports that legislation is being jointly lodged by Democrat and Republican members of the United States Congress seeking to ban imports of kangaroo products to the USA? The minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, and can I thank Senator McKenzie for her question and, in doing so, acknowledge one of our previous colleagues in this place, uh, um, uh, the previous Senator Ron Boswell, for his very strong interest uh, in all things agriculture, but particularly uh, the Australia's kangaroo industry that he had such a huge, huge interest in. Um, but yes, Senator McKenzie, we are very concerned about the proposed legislation that is, uh, has been uh, lodged by a United States congressman, which seeks to ban the import of kangaroo um, meat and products into the US. We believe um, that the commercial kangaroo industry in Australia is absolutely appropriate and highly regulated. Um, it's highly sustainable, and our quotas are based on a science-based approach. Um, our commercial industry it has been going now for over 60 years and is considered one of the world's best wild harvest industries uh, in totality. Um, the management of uh, the export of kangaroo products is based firmly on the principles of sustainability, uh, and the industry is a huge provider of jobs, but particularly jobs in rural and regional um, Australia. And it's very often that those jobs are actually taken up by uh, Indigenous Australians. Australian uh, exports of kangaroo products like meat and hides and skins uh, to around 70 countries around the world, uh, including places like Italy and the United States. Um, and although the United States is not a huge import, direct importer of kangaroo meats, it is a huge importer of kangaroo leather products. And these leather products are considered to be some of the highest quality leather products in the world. Um, but we are aware of the potential risks this legislation poses for the industry, given the size of the US market and that global brands could be forced through pressure to move away from using this sustainably harvested product uh, is of great concern to the government. So that's why we have been working to gain um, support of industry so that we can put pressure Order, on Senator the Rustin. US. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Good to hear, Minister. Um, what damage would an import ban have on our industry, regional communities, farmers and the welfare of kangaroos? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, um, we know that the coronavirus has had a big impact on all of our rural and regional industries, and, and the kangaroo uh, export business is, is no different. But they have been amazingly adaptable and, and resilient. 
Um, but a ban that has well, any ban um, of an international market will have large um, implications. But it's not just because of our direct exports to the, the U.S., but because much of our kangaroo product goes via other markets and manufactured into great leather goods, uh, and then they're imported into the U.S. So it's estimated that the commercial kangaroo industry um, provides about $200 million per year to rural um, and regional Australian communities, and 3,000 people are employed in this industry. So it is a hugely important industry. But the fact is that harvest programs are ethically designed to reduce the significant impact that overabundant kangaroo populations can have on our natural environment. Um, and as regional centres would understand, kangaroo populations regularly explain booms Order. and busts. Senator Rustin. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can you outline what urgent representations are being made by the Australian government to ensure the United States market remains open for the export of kangaroo products? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the government will continue to work to ensure that U.S. consumers can continue to buy Australia's high-quality, responsibly sourced kangaroo products. Um, upon hearing about the bill's introduction to the U.S. The, uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, the government spoke to the Australian ambassador to the U.S., um, uh, previous Senator Arthur Sinodinos, and emphasised the importance of this trade. Um, and about making sure that we understood that this was a, actually a humane management of kangaroo populations and the value of this industry across the whole of Australia. Um, Australian diplomats have, uh, have initiated contact with congressmen and plan to meet with them to outline Australia's significant concerns around this bill. There is a myth that persists that commercial kangaroo harvesting is a threat to the species. This is not true. Uh, the staff at our Washington Embassy are working to advocate for our kangaroo industry's credentials in sustainability and animal welfare areas and are setting the Order. story Senator straight. Senator Rustin. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. At the time Ms Higgins disclosed that an alleged rape had taken place in the Minister's office on the evening of the 22nd of March 2019, was the Minister's Chief of Staff a person who had previously worked for the Prime Minister. The mini oh, oh, sorry. person returned to the Prime Minister's office after working for Minister Reynolds. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, I'm aware uh, of uh, Senator Reynolds's former Chief of Staff uh, at that point in time. I can't recall offhand Senator Wong in terms of uh, the sequence uh, of the different offices that, uh, that she has worked in, uh, but I will take that on notice. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank, I thank the minister for taking the matter of, on notice and I ask a further question. Ms Higgins has said that the Prime Minister's principal private secretary, whom she describes as Mr Morrison's fixer, was involved in the week after the alleged rape. On what basis was the Prime Minister's principal private secretary involved? What was his role? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, I am not aware. Uh, I understand the Prime Minister has uh, answered some questions directly uh, in relation to um, uh, the uh, contact or otherwise with the principal private secretary, and I'd refer the Senator to the Prime Minister's answers to those questions. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Well, I would ask the minister to come back and respond to those, that question. I ask a further question. Uh, Ms Higgins has said that the Prime Minister's principal private secretary contact her, contacted her to check in on her when she was off work in the week following Four Corners airing its Inside the Canberra Bubble expose of sexual misconduct within the coalition government. Can the minister explain why the Prime Minister's principal private secretary made that contact? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, I'd refer the senator to my previous answer. I am not, um, uh, not all of those uh, statements, I think, are uh, necessarily accepted in relation to some of the responses that have been given. Uh, however, uh, if there is anything to add to that, I will bring it to the chamber. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the importance of accessible, quality and professional financial advice. 
What has the Morrison government done to progress the professionalism of the finance industry, advice industry and make high quality advice accessible to Australian households? The Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to thank Senator Brockman for his question and for his enduring commitment to quality, accessible and affordable professional financial advice. This government has taken significant action to professionalise the financial advice industry. We've put in place renewed professional standards for those who work in the advice industry, including an exam, a degree requirements, a code of ethics and continuing education requirements. Now, these standards have helped ensure that Australians can be confident that when they need guidance on their personal finances, that they are receiving high quality and professional financial advice. Mr President, I would like to congratulate the nearly 12,000 now financial advisors, stockbrokers, planners and those in the life insurance industry who have taken and already passed the financial advisor standards exam so far. The average pass rate of that exam is 90 per cent, and that's a testament to their hard work, to their skill and to their dedication to the profession, as well as to their commitment to making high-quality financial advice available to every Australian household. Even over the summer break, Mr President, a further 1,200 advisers sat the exam across 14 Australian cities and online. They are now awaiting those results, ready to demonstrate to their clients that they are the committed professionals that their clients expect. And I would like to encourage practising financial advisers, stockbrokers and insurance advisers who have not yet taken the exam or passed the exam to take advantage of the remaining sittings left in 2021 before the deadline ends at the end of this year. I ask you to work with us to make the Australian advice industry the best it can possibly be, because together we can achieve our goal of creating a world-class industry that offers affordable, accessible and high-quality financial advice for all Australians. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How has the government supported the transition for the financial advice in industry during the COVID-19 during COVID to ensure that remote advisers, those with family commitments, and those affected by COVID-19 compl can complete these requirements? Senator Hume. Mr. President, the Morrison government has extended the transition period, and advisers now have until January 2026 to complete the education requirements set before them. They also now have until the end of 2021 to pass the exam, but I remind them that with time ticking, it's very important to note that there are only a further three opportunities to do so this year. We hope that all existing advisers will make the most of these very important opportunities. We have provided remote sitting options to assist advisers to sit the exam during the pandemic, and many have taken up that opportunity. The online exam can be taken at any time of the day or night, uh, during any day or each and every day of the six-day sitting period, giving advisers the maximum flexibility to fit around work and family commitments. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline uh, further to the Senate how financial advisers can sit the exam? Senator Hume. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. The next exam sitting will be held between the 25th and the 30th of March this year, including on weekends and with up to two in-person sittings each day. The exam can also be taken online or in person in 16 cities across Australia, both metropolitan and regional. The booking period for the March exam is currently open online, and preparation materials are available on the FASIA website and via private providers. Mr. President, when my financial adviser, uh, I won't name him because you'll get embarrassed, uh, received his results, he was so pleased he sent me a text message. Now, even for a highly skilled and educated adviser as he is, he already has a master's degree in finance, he knew that this was a new level of professionalism for him and for his firm. I encourage all financial advisers who have not yet passed this exam to register for this sitting. With your help, we can make the best financial planning and stockbroking and insurance advisor industry our best, the best in the world. Senator Birmingham. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, 
Understanding Order 745A, I seek an explanation from the Minister for Communications, who is represented by Senator Hume in this changer, chamber, as to why portfolio questions numbered 301, 302, 303, 304, 305, 307, 309, 311, 312, 318, 321, 323, 325, 326, 328, 330, 331, 332, 333, 334, 335, 336, 337, 338, 339, 340, 341, 342 and 344, which I placed on notice on 17 November 2020, remains unanswered. Minister. Uh, thank you, and I thank the senator for her statement. I won't ask you to repeat those numbers. I didn't write them all down. I am advised that the questions on notice from budget estimates 2020-21 that are being sought were asked of the National Broadband Network Corporation (NBN Co). Now, I understand that the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications have repeatedly encouraged NBN Co to provide those responses in a timely manner. I will contact the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, uh, Cities and the Arts in relation to these questions. Senator Urquhart. Deputy President, understanding order 745B, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation. Now, let us be Based on the evidence we have received from the committee, the overwhelming majority of these questions, as the minister is aware, as she just outlined, to NBNCO were due on 21 December 2020. Today is 16 February 2021. This means that the questions outlined are now 58 days overdue and counting, which is simply unacceptable. And I understand that there are a number of other questions which other senators have placed on notice in the Senate to NBNCO and which are also overdue, significantly overdue. This lack of responsiveness reflects very poorly on the Minister for Communications and very poorly on NBNCO. More broadly, it underscores a lack of respect for Senate accountability, which has plagued the communications portfolio throughout the parliamentary term of this government. Labor calls on the Morrison government and NBNCO to release these questions immediately and stop disrespecting the intelligence of Australian taxpayers. The majority of the questions on notice go directly, directly to the economics of the NBN and financial metrics underpinning the 2021 NBN corporate plan. They go to the issues such as debt, cash flows, cost per premises, operating costs, capital expenditures, bonuses and a range of other information that allow the parliament, the media and the Australian public better understand what, what was happening with our public money. In fact, much of this information was consistently published in previous corporate plans. But this year, the government decided to withhold this information because they did not want the media or the parliament to have visibility of its latest cost blowouts. It's another smokescreen. It's another cover-up. So today the Senate seeks an answer to that question. What exactly is the Morrison government trying to hide by not answering these questions and allowing them to be answered? What we know is that the release of NBNCO's corporate plan was delayed this year. It's normally released on the 31st of August, but this year, sorry, it was held, uh, it's been delayed, but it was uh, withheld until the 23rd of September. So notably, it was withheld until the afternoon after Minister Fletcher 
had announced the government's embarrassing copper backflip at the National Press Club. And then when the corporate plan came out later that afternoon, it immediately became clear that key information published in previous corporate plans had been omitted. So laughable were the redactions that the revised cost of the NBN, $57 billion, was not mentioned anywhere in the document. In terms of the information sought by the questions on notice, we know this information is held with the Chief Financial Officer and could have been provided to the Senate in December. We know that MBN Co's Corporate Affairs Division is among the best resourced Corporate Affairs Division in the country, if not the best resourced. We also know that the delay of these responses is not an accident. It's intentional. It's clear that the intent was to withhold this information. NBN Co and the government have gone to great lengths to prevent the Chief Financial Officer of NBN Co from appearing before the Senate and other parliamentary committees. The one time the Chief Financial Officer was forced to appear under the threat of a Senate order, the Chief Executive Officer of NBN Co wouldn't allow him to open his mouth and respond to any question of substance. It was the most curious form of witness protection. There is a very simple reason that the Minister for Communications is seeking to delay the release of this information. This government's inferior NBN has not been faster and it has not been cheaper. On every measure, this technological debacle is slower, is less re reliable and is more expensive. Let it be lost on nobody that in 2013 the Liberals, standing on, alongside a hologram of Sonny Bill Williams at Fox Studios, promised their second-rate version of the NBN would be delivered for $29.5 billion. Then it blew out in 2014 to $41 billion. Then it blew out again to $49 billion in 2015. Then it increased to $51 billion in 2018. By late 2020, it had surged again to a forecast of $57 billion. What a shame that the technology hadn't surged as fast. Worse still, the government even tried to cover this figure up and have their public officials invent a new accounting methodology to talk about the costs of NBN. It took less than 90 days from when the rollout was supposed to be complete for the government to begin desperately backflipping towards fibre, imposing greater cost and time on consumers and taxpayers. If you want the Oxford definition of incompetence and waste, look no further than the Liberals and this hapless Minister for Communications and their technological omelette known as the NBN multi-technology mix. The, Liberal prom the Liberals promised every Australian would have access to minimum speeds of 20 25 megabits per second by 2016. We are now in 2021, five years on, and these minimum speeds are not being delivered still over the copper NBN network. According to reports, up to 238,000 households still cannot access minimum speeds which are actually a requirement of both Australian law and the NBN statement of expectations. The Liberal Party, yes, I'm referring to the same Liberal Party who are on track to amass a $1 trillion in debt, has used taxpayer money to purchase over 49,000 kilometres of new copper for the NBN. That's enough copper to wrap around planet Earth and the sum then left over. Labor has even heard that the government maxed out the copper supply in Australia and had to start importing copper from Turkey and Brazil. If you're a global copper trader, the Morrison government is your best friend. And who can forget when Malcolm Turnbull, the now, then Prime Minister and now Minister Fletcher, hailed HFC technology 
as the great game changer. M uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, it most certainly did change the game, but for all the wrong reasons. Never has the rollout of network technology in Australia been more of a shambles. The NBN HCF rollout is the most uneconomical and arguable the most unreliable in the world. There is a good reason former NBN Co CEO Bill Morrow wanted to toss the entire HFC footprint in the bin. There's good reason that Mike Quigley and his management team also rejected the use of HFC under Labor. After talking it up as the best thing since sliced bread, the Liberals had to scrap the Optus HFC network because it was not fit for purpose. A humiliation. Then they had to pause the rollout of the remaining HFC network in November 2017 because the technology was so unreliable. Turning on your vacuum cleaner was enough to cause your internet to drop out. And just last fortnight, we found out that MBN Co will pause activations on the HFC network because they have run out of the chips for their modems. What a hot mess. No wonder Lontil, a Tasmanian ISP provider, recently wrote a blog referring to HFC as a dog's breakfast and singling it out as the most unreliable technology on the NBN network. Remember, this was the stuff that the um, uh, previous Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, hailed as a game changer. It is quoted as, uh, as a uh, Tasmanian ISP as saying it's the most unreliable technology on the NBN network. So this brings me to the performance of the NBN during lightning storms. We've been hearing reports from the Blue Mountains, the Hawkesbury regions, parts of Greater Sydney and Outer Melbourne that fibre to the curb modems on the NBN have been literally getting fried during lightning storms, with some households requiring up to six modem replacements, with technicians having to visit each time. Not very efficient. There's been an unacceptable lack of transparency on this issue, but from what we understand, lightning is causing a voltage surge down the copper line and into the modem. The Liberals had one job, and that was not to stuff up, stuff up fibre to the curb like they stuffed up everything else. This entails ensuring that the electronics and vendor equipment used to deliver the service were fit for purpose and had adequate surge protections. If storms are capable of blowing up six consecutive NBN modems, then something is not right. When political parties are incapable of taking a long-term view and consistently put politics ahead of the public interest, it invariably extracts a heavy price. Australians have paid more and gotten a worse NBN. And no matter how much spin the Liberals churn out, that is the stark reality. This build a dud and black flip it later approach means NBN Co is now borrowing billions more to construct a fibre network that will run in parallel with the existing copper network. Critically, despite new cost blowouts and rhetoric about upgrades, the government has currently only budgeted for one in 10 households in the copper footprint—400,000 premises—to receive a fibre lead-in between now and 2024. On top of this, the full copper network will have to be operated and maintained while the fibre network constructed in parallel goes underutilised. Remember that's that copper that wraps around the planet and the sum left over? A lot of that's going to be now underutilised. You would, in all sincerity, be hard-pressed to think up a more illogical and costly way to deploy a national broadband network with, more, with public money. After $51 billion, the purchase of 50,000 kilometres of new copper and a decade of ridiculing fibre, not only has this government forfeited its credibility, but they have done so without explaining what the real cost of their capitulation is. This black flip is not simply a vindication of Labor policy, 
but an affirmation of something more fundamental. The Liberals get the wrong, the big calls wrong. And to sum all this up, we have a minister and a public company which has spent $57 billion of taxpayers' money disrespecting the Senate and seeking to evade security and scrutiny. We have a copper network that is so defunct it still cannot deliver minimum speeds to up to 238,000 premises. We have a HCF network that is arguably one of the biggest and most expensive telecommunication debacles in the world. We have modems literally frying because of lightning surges, surges down copper leading cables. Evidently, the decision in 2013 to dump fibre has resulted in a colossal waste of time and money. Do it once, do it right, do it with fibre. Had the Liberals simply followed this path, Australians would have a faster and more reliable network at far less cost to the taxpayer. Little wonder we have a dud NBN at a cost now forecast to reach $57 billion, nearly $30 billion over budget, ranked 61 globally for speeds and a rollout schedule running more than four years behind what the Liberals originally promised. They said they could do it better, they said they could do it cheaper, and they haven't delivered on any of that. Madam, Acting De uh, Madam Deputy President, it's no wonder that this government is trying to evade scrutiny. It is really no wonder at all. And I would call on the government to ensure that they hold NBN to account and that they provide the answers to these questions and that they provide an open and transparent process through the Senate processes, estimates and other areas, and they should be Thank scrutinised. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Your time has expired. Senator Kitchen. Thank you, Deputy President. Understanding Order 74, subsection 5, subsection A, I rise to speak on the explanation sought by my colleague and friend, Senator Urquhart, of the Minister for Communications, represented by Senator Hume in this chamber. I won't read through the numbers of the questions on notice. With encouragement from, my, uh, from Senator Urquhart, I will. 301, 302, 303, 304, 305. Good news, they managed to answer 306. 307 also managed to answer 308. 309 is unanswered. 311, 312, 318, 321, 323. Um, Senator Kitchen, just resume your seat for a moment. Senator already, Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. These have already been read into Hansard. I would uh, raise tedious repetition. Uh, there's no point of order. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Kitching. We continue. Thank you, Deputy President. So I think I got up to 318, 321, 323, 325, 326, 328, 330, 331, 332, 333, 334. 335, 336, 337, 338, 339, 340, 341, 342 and 344. And of course that isn't tedious repetition as was suggested by Senator Brockman. It's actually just embarrassing for the government that they have an agency that thinks that they are above the standing orders of this chamber, and that is actually the problem. So no one, no one on the other side wanted to actually hear all of those numbers of the questions outstanding. So who does the NBN think they are? Because remember, committee me members were told informally that they wouldn't get any answers until the end of January. So in this blithe, you know, non-acceptance of the Senate standing orders, the NBN decided that they would set their own timetable. So anyway, we'll get to, those, to, to more of their outrageous antics later on. Clause 74 of the Senate Standing Orders provides that a minister has 30 days in which to provide an answer to a question. As at midday today, the 16th of February 2021, also my birthday, Deputy President, there are 118 overdue questions on notice lodged by, via the table office, the oldest being 62 days overdue. 
There are 345 questions on notice which have been taken by the communications portfolio in the 2020-2021 budget estimates. The committee set the following due dates for questions on notice, 3 December 2020 for the initial hearing and 21 December for the spillover hearing. 239 questions were taken on notice during and post the initial estimates hearing. Only 59 were returned to the committee on time and 180 were or are overdue. That being 75 per cent of the questions and 30 still, 32 still have not been answered. 106 questions were taken on notice during and post the spillover estimates hearing. Only nine were returned to the committee on time. 97 were or are overdue, that being 91 per cent of the questions are overdue, and 49 still haven't been answered. What this actually shows is a clear pattern of disrespect and lack of transparency and accountability by the Minister for Communications, Minister Fletcher, and his representing minister in this place. There are two particular agencies that are among the most egregious in their constant and continued attempts to withhold information sought by me through the question on notice process. And I do not say this lightly. With the exception of the Department of Parliamentary Services, whose constant evasions and obfuscations are masterly, and that is a bit of an understatement, both the National Broadband Network Co and Australia Post are perhaps the worst I have ever seen. As someone who has entered many, many questions on notice, of over 11,000, uh, in the life of this parliament alone, I do not say this lightly. I must preface this by making the point that this is in no way a slight on the hardworking men and women in these organisations. Remember, it was a party to which I belong, the Australian Labor Party and our union affiliates, that, who saw off an attempt by this government and the former CEO of Australia Post to sack a quarter of our nation's posties under the cover of the coronavirus pandemic. It was also the grand vision of my predecessor in this place, uh, Senator Conroy, um, that realised a national broadband network. That was to give all Australians a world-class access to the internet. And we've heard from Senator Urquhart uh, some of the problems with that. We on this side stand up for those workers every day. What we don't stand up for are senior executives at public sector government business enterprises who take, remember, they take no corporate risk. They are remunerated extremely well. They stonewall questions put to them by the nation's parliament on behalf of the people of Australia, just like they were company directors at an annual meeting avoiding the scrutiny of their shareholders. Let me start with the MBN and their senior executives and their board. The MBN is an organisation, which I discovered through a question on notice, which they actually answered, mind you. Um, it has 13 employees earning over $500,001, 21 employees earning between $400,001 and $500,000, 110 employees earning between $300,001 and 400,000, and 733 employees earning between $200,001 and 300,000. Their conspiracy of silence is a disgrace. They do not get to choose to keep secrets from the taxpayer and the parliament. It is dis disrespectful, disrespectful to the people who are paying their large salaries, the same people who will be paying the bills racked up by this organisation for a long time, and no doubt their children and their children's children will also be still paying these bills. They are the same Australians who put us here and who expect us to do our job, and part of that job is to keep the government accountable and to ensure that there is scrutiny on government departments and agencies. Labor has even heard that the government maxed out the copper supply in Australia and had to start importing copper from Turkey and Brazil. But let me read you some of the questions on notice that are outstanding in relation to the NBN. How many executives received an increase to their ba base salary in the 2019-2020 financial year? In each of the 2018-2019 and 2019-2020 financial years and the 2020-2021 financial year to date, has NBN engaged, employed or hired the services of a media personality? If so, who was engaged, employed or hired, for what purpose and at what cost. 
please produce a copy of the Register of Declarations of Interest as at 1 December 2020. So you might let's just take that last question. You might think that that was fa a fairly easy question to answer if you're an organised entity and you know you, your documents are organised. You should be able to produce that quickly. But no, we're still waiting for that one. NBN Co and the government has gone to great lengths to prevent their chief financial officer from appearing before Senate, the Senate and other parliamentary committees. The one time the chief financial officer was forced to appear no. under the th threat of a Senate order, the chief executive officer of NBN Co wouldn't allow him to open his mouth and respond to any of my questions um, that were being put to him. It was a total joke. I also had to insist that the legal counsel of NBN Co come to estimates because, not surprisingly, you have to put in FOIs in order to get NBN Co uh, to actually respond to anything, and they haven't responded to the FOIs either, so you know, we shouldn't get our hopes up. It was a strange performance. The chief financial officer was more reminiscent of a hostage than a senior public executive fronting up to answer questions about the expenditure of public monies. You know, it's a little like the end of the film, Thelma and Louise. The NBN's, NBN Co CEO is sort of Louise driving off the cliff with the unaccountable minister being his Thelma at the wheel. And as for the performance of NBN Co executives at estimates, it is a masterclass in obfuscation and how not to answer a question. These fat cats at NBN can run, but they will not be able to hide. It is just a matter of time and how poorly they want to look in the meantime before this parliament will get the answers to the questions we seek. At some point, they are going to have to answer what are pretty basic and easy questions to answer. But maybe we can't assume that their records are in any state that is fit for a, a, an entity of that size and they can't actually access anything because there is no excuse for their inability to not be able to produce those documents. They spend a fortune on PR gurus um, who usually defend such upstanding corporate citizens as James Hardy. That's the um, you know, that's Australia Post where they've employed Ross Thornton there uh, and actually can't seem to locate how many hours uh, he has uh, put in there. So uh, that's another lot of questions on notice that we have to another agency, another government owned business uh, that is being you know, is answerable supposedly to Minister Fletcher. So I just want to go through some of this. Um, so they've employed employed a PR guru there. He's worked for James Hardy, AMP, who during the Banking Royal Commission, let us not forget, were found to be charging fees to dead people. Um, uh, and if you look to the board of Australia Post, which is full of people connected uh, who have Liberal Party connections, and they are now on uh, what is a pretty prestigious board, the Australia Post board. So what we've heard, even well before you know, we had Cartier watches being purchased for already well remunerated executives. We heard extraordinary stories of the former CEO, Ms Holgate, racking up hundreds of thousands on the corporate credit card, spending eye-watering amounts of fresh, flora on flesh, fresh floral arrangements and plants for the office at a time when everyone was working from home. So they were putting these floral arrangements into the offices when no one was there. Uh, and the board was trying to approve exorbitant bonuses for themselves. The spectacle of one pampered poodle after another defending the right of a multi-million dollar salaried public servant using public money to buy luxury watches as personal gifts for favoured staff is one that defies credulity. But perhaps we shouldn't be surprised. In some ways, I think the NBN situation is actually worse than anything Christine Holgate did. Ms Holgate shows a reflection of a fundamental misunderstanding of her role her duties and her obligations as a public sector CEO. The Cartier watches, the floral arrangements, the bonuses they tried to approve for the executive team um, at nearly, nearly around about a million dollars each. Um, and of course, you know, there she was asserting that Australia Post money isn't, is not taxpayer money. Of course, Australia Post is very much a government-owned organisation and it actually belongs to all of us. We all use it. It is a part of every Australian's life. Her answers revealed a very unhealthy culture that I feared explained much about the profligate spending culture at Australia Post uh, that you know, the hundreds of questions on notice exposed. Let me now read you some questions on notice that are outstanding in relation to Australia Post. Please provide Australia Post board documents, including but not limited to board meeting agendas, 
board papers and board meeting minutes created between October 2018 to December 2018. So that's, remember, that's October 2018 to December 2018, which reference or relate to rewards, gifts or bonuses for any Australia Post employee, manager or executive. So we've got October, November, December, and they still can't find those. There's this exchange between myself and then the then Australia Post CFO and now acting CEO, Rodney Boys, and also apparently likely to become the CEO, from an estimate spillover session. Mr Boys, do you think you will be able to respond to my question on notice fully in terms of a breakdown of the expenditure on the office of the CEO credit card? You said you could not answer because everyone was working at home from coronavirus. We had a brief discussion at last estimates and you said we could not answer that because people are working at home and we had a discussion about whether you did any online banking, so remember this is the CFO of Australia Post, and whether you were able to do banking when you weren't in the office. Are you going to be able to answer that question on notice properly and give us a breakdown of the expenditure? You won't be surprised to learn that we have yet to receive this information either. A large proportion of the answers that we seek here today, Deputy President, relate to the NBN's extraordinary entertainment spend, which the Morrison government refuses to provide automated reports from accounting software. So I've asked for a breakdown of $874,000 in a financial year. Apparently, they are not able to break down that figure. NBN's aggregate of bonuses paid to its, its executives, whether or not NBN increased staff salaries during the APS pay freeze, NBN's internal FOI procedures, given the numerous FOIs lodged by me that have been resisted, requests from, for copies of Australia Post board documents and breakdowns of executive issued credit cards. But in actual fact today, the Senate seeks an answer to the following question above all. Above all, what exactly is this government and the Minister for Communications trying to hide? All the Liberals who sit opposite who were pre-selected on a mantra of small government and accountability should not be running interference for the spivs and grifters that seek to obfuscate and evade parliamentary scrutiny by refusing to answer questions on notice put to them by the Australian Parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, this afternoon it is of grave concern to yet again see the lack of accountability of this government in relation to answering questions on notice. I did see Senator Hume come in here and explain that despite the minister's best endeavours, that the Department of Communications has been unable to get NBN Co uh, to answer these questions. Well, I put to you that the troubles in this relationship and the troubles in the lack of accountability and the lack of reporting in outcomes of MBN Co's performance to this parliament uh, goes much, much, much deeper than that. For example, Senator Urquhart asked questions in relation to uh, the forecast in relation to the outstanding amount of debt and equity uh, by financial year 2024. How much in free cash flow does the 2021 corporate plan forecast NBN will generate uh, by financial year 2024? Have these cash flows been committed? If yes, towards what? What was the capex uh, for the fixed wireless network as at uh, 1 of July 2020? How many fixed wireless towers have been built? How many fixed wireless cells have been deployed? Uh, based on the 2021 corporate plan, what is cumulative capex for the fixed wireless out to 2024? Now, these are issues that have been covered in previous corporate plans, uh, but for some reason the government and NBN Co saw fit not to uh, adequately explain uh, this information in their latest corporate uh, plan, and yet we find uh, even still, despite these questions being asked by uh, opposition senators, there are still no answers. The NBN corporate plan was missing information on peak funding from cost blowouts. No update on the NBN debt profile, again a question that was asked by Senator Urquhart. No updated capital expenditure by technology. You know, this is CapEx expenditure, 
It's a fairly basic thing to go in a corporate uh, plan, and yet we cannot even get these questions uh, answered in estimates. No operating expenditure profile. And so the corporate plan shows a complete lack of transparency. And as uh, the shadow uh, minister, uh, Michelle Rowland, said, she said it was nothing short of a cover-up designed to conceal unfunded announcements made by Mr Fletcher today. Now, the issue here, the issue here is that this government keeps trying to assert that it is meeting the milestones uh, and connection milestones and that it exceeds them and, and is doing a great job in managing NBN Co to deliver to Australians. So it is little wonder to me that NBN Co, the Department of uh, Communications, are also dragging the, their feet in answering these questions. Because again, what it exposes is cost blowouts and consumer disappointment when the promises that the government has made are simply not met. I'll take you to some of the questions asked uh, by Senator Green in estimates. Uh, Senator Green asked uh, in relation to the 1.5 million premises being GFAST enabled. One of them said it would be by 2020, and the minister is now saying it's 2023. Senator Green asks why won't fibre to the curb network be gigabyte, gigabyte capable by the end of 2020? And Mr. Windy, the key official answering these questions from the Department of Communications, he says, well, there are some details in here worth raising with NBN, or we can take them on notice. I think NBN will be able to answer for you when they appear uh, exactly what the state of the FTTC network is and its readiness. But as we see in the kinds of questions that rem uh, remain unanswered, it shows that the Department of Communications said, here, let, the uh, let NBN Co answer these questions. We could take it on notice, but best direct your questions over there. Well, perhaps we should have asked both NBN Co and the department some of these questions, because now we've got the department complaining that they can't get NBN Co to answer these questions in a timely manner. Well, what does this show about the accountability of this government in relation to the promises that it has made to the Australian people in relation to its NBN network? It is in an appalling state of affairs. I uh, have been speaking to constituents that have been sold, uh, uh, have responded to marketing, uh, where they've signed up to certain megabit levels. Uh, that simply cannot be met by the current infrastructure that, they, that exists in their local area and that essentially they have been sold. They have been sold something that doesn't exist in their area. And so when Senator Urquhart asks uh, at question 188 how many FTTN premises cannot currently achieve a layer 2 speed of 25 megabits per second, and they haven't answered it. What we're really talking about here is Australian consumers that were sold a dud product where we have a government that refuses to be accountable for the promises that it made. This is an appalling state of affairs. And while some uh, I've seen many a government official at estimates complain about the number of questions that Senator Kitching asks, and they tend to kind of go, oh, here we go again. But there is a real relationship between things like executive bonuses, flowers bought, uh, and kind of corporate culture, how much is spent on entertainment and the like, when you relate that back to 
poor performance and accountability. The promises that are made to the Australian people that this government is essentially responsible for that are not delivered. In 2013, the coalition promised every Australian that they would have access to minimum speeds of 25 millibytes per second by the end of 2016. They were asked, can NBN Co confirm this target was missed by up to seven million premises? Now, we're here in 2021 now. You would have thought that somewhere in Minister Fletcher's accountability or the officers that the Department of Communications has sat with, that they would be tracking, they'd be tracking their promises and that they would be able to say uh, that the department would be able to answer, that the ministers uh, would be able to answer and indeed that NBN Co would be able to answer basic questions about the promises that they made in their, uh, uh, as a government and that they are tracking those outcomes. But again, here you can see in these unanswered questions, we've got on one hand a government that likes to make big promises and pays no attention to the detail of getting it delivered. Not only is it the uh, government not paying attention to detail, but it seemed to me in the answers given by officials uh, that they didn't have the technical know-how at a senior level to be able to answer the questions about the milestones that NBN Co should be meeting, the milestones that NBN Co should be meeting in order to meet these commitments. Now that to me seems like an extraordinary state of affairs. So Senator Green uh, also asked in estimates, uh, Senator Green said, uh, uh, you don't have the details of the $70 per home uh, that it's going to by the government. And Mr Windy Year said, no, I don't have the technical details that NBN is going to be spending money on over the next few years with respect to the FTTC network. I'll take that on notice, but I think they'll be happy to answer it. I think I have to hand over. Uh, but you said this was a, signif a significant upgrade, and it's so significant that you don't know what it is. Mr Atkinson from the department says, can we just assist with this? I think what Mr Windyear is saying, you'll get a better answer from the people who are actually going to be implementing the upgrade on the technical aspects of exactly what's going to happen to the FTTC. And yet we see that we ask technical questions of NBN Co. Senator Hume comes in here and says uh, the department is doing their best to get answers uh, from NBN Co. And yet the department uh, doesn't have the expertise to answer them themselves, which I think they should have. Uh, these are major uh, announcements uh, that are embedded in the translation between the announcements that the government has made the relationship of the department with NBN Co that holds together that accountability to the Australian public. And still, we come in here and Senator Hume says, oh, we're doing our best to get NBN Co to answer these questions. Well, I remind Minister uh, Fletcher and Senator Hume, who was indeed at the table at the time, I remind Senator Hume that it was the department that directed many of these questions to NBN Co, questions that I believe they should have been able to answer. And they are questions, I think, that very much, uh, the failure to answer these questions very much underpins the disaster that is now uh, the NBN and data promises that this government has made to the Australian people about the technology that sh they should be able to have access to at work, at home and in the broader community. I will have to say today 
that uh, the kinds of issues that are being raised by the opposition uh, in relation to NBN Co's financial year 2020 results. Uh, again, you can see NBN Co and the government trying to self-congratulate themselves about their outcomes. And yet, when you dig down into the data, if you can get it through uh, these processes, because the department doesn't seem to be able to ask NBN Co uh, for this accountability, uh, that actually the claims being made don't, uh, don't stand up. So NBN Co, uh, by all reports in their, in their data, showed a great uh, uh, outcome over COVID-19 for completing the volume rollout. But in this parliament, we have a duty to scrutinise the kinds of claims being made. And indeed, the technology uh, mix of the multi-technology mix that the government has promoted, the cost blowout from that's gone from 29.5 billion to 41 to 49 and now 51. And yet, uh, the kinds of questions we ask about the corporate plan, which Senator Urquhart has asked, highlighted uh, that the 2020 corporate plan saw significant revision downwards in targets, making it easier to exceed the stated claim uh, and claim credit for having done so. If you compare the 2020 results uh, compared to the unrevised 2019 corporate plan forecasts, capital costs are up 1.5 billion and revenue is down 100 billion. And yet the kinds of questions that Senator Urquhart asked about capital expenditure remain unanswered. It is little surprise to me that NBN Co is dragging its feet in answering these questions. But I find it completely galling that the government pretends it wants to be completely accountable to this parliament and it's some kind of administrative accountability when we know that these issues go right down to the core of the disaster that is this government's uh, commitments uh, to the Australian people in relation to the NBN. Thank you, Senator Pratt. I don't believe there's any further questions. I just need to put the question, Senator Gallagher, on this matter. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Urquhart to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So are there any motions to take note of answers, Senator Gallagher? Madam Deputy President. Sorry, Senator Rennick, do you have a contribution? I rise to take note of the answers given to Senator Birmingham and Senator Reynolds to the questions asked by Senator Ciccone and myself. Well, the Minister for Defence came into this chamber today, not on her own initiative, but in response to a question asked of her. And you know what? It's two years too late. She apologises to Ms Higgins for her treatment by herself and her office two years later. Minister, nice words, saying the right thing now, does not compensate nor forgive two years of doing nothing. Minister Reynolds' apology might be more believable if something, anything, had been done at any stage to support Ms Higgins following her disclosure. But nothing was done then and nothing's being done now. Has anyone from this government reached out to Ms Higgins? To offer any support. The Defence Minister said she could see the trauma and hurt to Ms Higgins in the TV interview. But has anyone followed up with her? Has anyone, any agency, reached out to see if any support can be provided now by her former employer? I doubt it. Today, the Defence Minister of Australia, in responding to allegations of a rape occurring on her couch in her office uses the excuse of a possible police investigation to hide behind, to deny this chamber and Ms Higgins answers that should be provided now. Senator Reynolds, the Defence Minister of Australia, is accountable to this chamber and through us to the people of Australia for her conduct as a minister. The question Senator Reynolds refuses to answer goes directly to her conduct, to what she knew, 
to when she knew it, to what she did, to the steps she took as a minister to deal with allegations about a serious crime occurring in her office. We will continue to hold this minister to account. This is not some minor political inconvenience. This is about what happens in one of the most senior offices in this country. A full statement outlining exactly what the minister knew, when she knew it and what was done, none of which is subject to a police investigation to our understanding, is the minimum amount of information this minister should be providing to this chamber. And, Madam Deputy President, some of what the Defence Minister has said to date in this chamber simply does not add up. She says that at the same time she would have us believe she didn't know the details of what was alleged to have occurred on her couch in her office, she at the same time facilitated the police involvement. She terminated the alleged rapist. That some six days had elapsed from Ms Higgins' disclosure to the minister's chief of staff before the minister met with Ms Higgins and at that meeting, which brought Ms Higgins back into the scene of the alleged rape, that the minister was still unaware of any details about the incident? The minister would have the chamber believe that, despite many others knowing of the incident, including a number of agencies and her chief of staff, who had met and received a full disclosure from Ms Higgins, that this minister didn't know any of the details, which then leads one to ask, did she not ask? Did she not wonder why one of her close advisers had all of a sudden disappeared? Did she not ask her chief of staff whether she had been given an account of what occurred? Did she not wonder why she was meeting with a young woman coming into her office, just her and the chief of staff? Why was she having that meeting? Seriously. Something like this happening in your own office and no one said anything, None, nothing to you? It's simply unbelievable. The only other explanation, aside from the Senate not being given accurate information to date, is that the minister was therefore willfully negligent in her duties as a minister and as an employer. We saw the Prime Minister laying the groundwork today to distance himself from this first in the media conference and then in question time, and an apology two years too late is not going to get, make this go away. We need to get the story straight from this minister. She needs to stop avoiding answers, hiding behind investigations, and take responsibility for what happened to Ms Higgins and take responsibility Thank for you, her Senator position Gallagher. as a Your minister. Time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much. Something that can never be taken for granted is the right to work in a safe environment, whether that be a building site, on a cattle station or even in a parliamentary office. And workplace reform, especially for women, has come a long way, but more needs to be done to ensure that all people, both men and women, feel comfortable and empowered to take action should the worst occur. It is impossible not to sympathise with Brittany Higgins and others who have ensured the double blow of being involved in an incident and then not feeling supported by those who can do something about it. And yet I feel deeply uncomfortable. The opposition has raised this issue, pursued this issue and ensured that there will be other complainants who will now potentially be considering whether or not they want to be uh, publicly discussed in the way that the opposition has ensured that this has played out. Brittany's colleagues and managers certainly acted with good intentions, and Brittany herself has acknowledged the support she received. But processes can always be improved, and they will be. And I refer to the Prime Minister's statement today, uh, quest the first question in the uh, other place, where he refers to the process that has been put in place, that this government will review our processes, review our culture, and he has embraced the spirit, uh, the suggestion from the uh, Leader of the Opposition uh, and thanked him for the suggestion and the spirit in which it was put forward. But, as he said, 
we all agree in the important work that we all do here, whether it's members of this place, senators and the other place, our staff, we all come here because we want to make a contribution to our country and we should be able to do that in a safe environment for everyone who is here. So he welcomes that suggestion. So the government will continue along the process that the Prime Minister has outlined today. He's keen to get that moving and we will. But it is important that every party, everyone who is in this place, embrace uh, that same process. And the Prime Minister has encouraged the Leader of the Opposition to pursue a similar exercise amongst his colleagues. And I think as a government, as an opposition and the crossbench, that we all, would all do well to review our own cultures and to come together to share uh, those notes and to ensure that the process is as productive as possible. Already the government has aimed to provide Ms Higgins with agency, provide support to make decisions in her interests and to respect her privacy. These investigations into her experience are underway and I'm confident that the system is in place to deal with ser serious allegations will be improved once a full review is completed. Because having a safe, inclusive and supportive workplace is something everyone should strive for, not just one political party or one office. Our workplace has many elements that are not unique, a significant amount of travel and time away from home. But what is unique is the number of late nights and weekends that are worked. This is not unique to any side of politics, and I welcome the PM's review and hope that both sides will take advantage of this concept to look deeply into our own cultures. As a previous small business operator, I too know of the challenges of managing people, because we are, in all our glorious technicolour differences, uh, interesting and challenging. And I know that uh, we all embrace the challenge of ensuring a safe culture and a safe environment for our employees. And the Minister for Defence today has stood in this place and apologised, apologised to Ms Higgins and made a, a very comprehensive statement. But I do want to note that Ms. Brit Ms. Brittany's, uh, statement, Brittany's statement has concluded with this. I ask for my privacy to now be respected as I begin to emotionally recover from this difficult period and wish to make no further comment. And I would suggest that we would all be served by allowing the process to proceed and ensure that this does not happen again in this place. Okay. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you. I move to take note of the question asked by Senator Ciccone to Minister Birmingham. Uh, and Senator Ciccone asked about the plight of an aged care nurse, Anne, who has been in her profession since 1978, who expressed her concern about the government's IR legislation, saying it doesn't make things better for us and our residents. It makes it so much worse. And to be honest, I don't think I can handle any more cuts. Well, Prime Minister Morrison and Minister Porter have made it clear that they are only ditching their plan to scrap the better off overall test, uh, which is the test uh, in, in IR law that would have given the capacity for employers to strike agreements that made such cuts, not because uh, they uh, don't believe in it, not because they recognise that it's unfair, but because they can't get it through this Senate. The Labor Party is very firmly opposed to it, and now that some discussions have taken place with the crossbench, it's very clear uh, that there's only one motivation behind this government dropping this test, and that is that they don't have the opportunity to pass it. Mr Porter said very clearly he still believes in the change. 
a change that would remove the safety net for workers and give employers vastly expanded powers to cut pay and entitlements. Minister Porter goes on to continue to say it is sensible and proportionate. Nevertheless, this IR legislation, which is you know, called the COVID recovery uh, package, which, was really, which is really the guise of uh, will create rhetoric around the creation of new jobs because we will boost company profits by cutting the wages and conditions of Australians. Why are they doing this? They're retreating now because of the sake of political expediency. But we cannot forget, as we've seen time and time again in this place, that this is their real agenda. But you can also see uh, in what the government continues to put forward to this place uh, that dropping the boot test is only part of the picture. It's certainly not the only issue. There are uh, issues in relation to uh, the changes of rostering and hours and conversion of pay, etc., um, from casual to permanent, etc., that are also egregiously uh, problematic. And I can say uh, that what does that mean for a nurse like Anne? A nurse like Anne, who's been a registered nurse for 12 years, who works in aged care. Well, as, we, as we've seen during the course of this pandemic, we've seen aged care workers told that they can't work two jobs, despite the fact that they don't, don't earn enough hours in their aged care job to get by. We've seen uh, workers have such significant problems in this regard, but these are the kinds of flexibilities that this government wants to continue to impose on, the, um, on Australian workers instead of coming up with funding reform and a package for things like the aged care sector. Uh, as was raised by the nursing and uh, midwifery union, uh, in their submission uh, to the Senate committee, she said, uh, the minister, um, nurses said, the impact of COVID-19 served to draw attention to the risks associated with a casualised, insecure workforce. They highlight health and aged care and movement across work sites uh, in relation to it being an infection risk. But this has been the situation for these workers for too long. COVID has only highlighted that, and we've got to stop this legislation before it All passes right, Senator, as a whole. Time for the contributions expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Mr. President. And what we saw well, today was another classic case of the Labor Party spreading lies and fear and pessimism. There is absolutely going to be no cut to the better off test. There never was. What we wanted to do was to Order. enable enable businesses who Order. were suffering under COVID, Order. who were suffering under COVID, to enable them to survive. To enable them to survive. And if, it, if wages, if wages are going to get cut, Order. if wages Senator are going to be cut by any party, it's going to be under the Labor Party. It's going to be under the Labor Party because the Labor Party's policy is to force casuals to take up permanent work. To take up permanent work. Now that's expected to cost $153 a week, and that is typical of the Labor Party because they are all about command and control. Command and control. Don't give the workers a choice as to whether or not they want to stay on casual. Uh, conditions and earn 25 per cent loading. No, 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 no. We're going to tell you what to do and how to do it. And of course, what will that do? That will reduce flexibility. And if you reduce flexibility, you're going to destroy jobs. You're going to destroy jobs. And that's what the Labor Party does. Under this government, 
Under this government, we've created over one and a half million jobs. We've got 80 per cent of the people who lost their jobs under COVID when, with the initial outbreak, we've got them back into work. And if it wasn't for the Labor state premiers shutting their borders and causing lockdowns at the drop of a, a one or two COVID cases, we'd probably have the entire 100 per cent of people uh, back in. Back in. So, you know, this is the thing with uh, Labor. And if you go and look at Labor's record, when they brought in the Fair Work Act, okay, when they brought in the Fair Work Act, it was after the Fair Work Act was introduced that wage theft went up because their laws are so complicated that employers and we're not, you know, this isn't just big business. This is the ABC. This is Morris Blackburn. This is Morris Blackburn. You know, Senator Watt, Senator Green, they both work for Morris Blackburn. An industrial relations law firm couldn't even pay their staff properly. That tells you just how complex fair work was when it was introduced by the Rudd Gillard government. When it was introduced by the Rudd Gillard government. And let's not forget which party raised penalty uh, rates for retail for the re retail industry. You know which party that was? The Liberal National Party. The Liberal National Party. Saturday rates went up from 140% to 150%, and loading from six o'clock to nine o'clock during weeknights went up from 130% to 150%. Because we know that it's important to reward people when they're working those uh, hard hours. And I know, as a former stay-at-home dad. Uh, you know, those hours between six and nine o'clock at night are very important when you've got children. You've got to bath them, feed them, uh, read to them, get them to brush their teeth. And anyone who's been a parent will know how hard that is um, when you've got three little guys running around. So make no mistake that under, this, under the coalition, only under the coalition, we will create jobs. And what we are doing with this IR uh, changes is to actually give workers the choice so they can convert from casual to permanent, so they can convert from casual to permanent. And we know Senator Watt, he's been very quiet as the Minister for Resources lately. He's not doing much of a, a very good job there. Um, don't see much of, him, much of him at all. It's a bit like, where's Murray when it comes to supporting the coal industry and the mining industry? Um, but we will be the party. So we're actually giving, giving workers the right, if they choose, if they choose. We're not going to tell people what to do. We're going to, if they choose, they can go permanent. They can go Permanent. And the other, the other change that I think I, I is very uh, a good change is the fact that we want to make it 21 days to finalise uh, negotiations. Now I've got to admit I've had a lot of jobs over the years. Most of them have been off off award. When I was a student, I worked under award conditions. I didn't need three weeks to work out my my pay contract. I mean, it's basically you get a salary, you'll get four weeks leave, you'll get two weeks public holidays, you'll get uh, two weeks sick leave. You know, it's, you know, all these awards are in place. Why do you need so long? And of course, it's, it's just a racket for the industrial relations lawyers to make more money, to milk employers, to milk employees, to keep everything as complex as possible so Labor can keep their IR mates in a job uh, and basically destroy industry. Thank you. The question is the motion's moved by. Are you speaking? Sorry, <laughs> Senator O'Neill, my apologies. That's Senator O'Neill. OK, thank you very much. Um, Mr. President, and I rise to um, make a contribution in the taking note today. Uh, Senator Gallagher, I understand, indicated that we would be responding to questions that were directed to the uh, to Minister Birmingham and to uh, the, the Minister for Defence, but also uh, with regard to industrial relations. I want to associate myself with the comments from Senator Gallagher first up, but I'm here to stand up for Australian workers who are at this particular point of time under great threat by a really dodgy piece, a dodgy piece of work in the shape of an industrial relations bill that the government is pushing before. We know how dodgy it is because uh, today, despite the denials and the, the, the comments there from Senator Rennick, the government have had to drop a big chunk of the bill, the boot test, which was you know, the, the better off overall test, because in fact it became very clear in evidence over the last couple of weeks that what they were pro proposing was going to lead to worse off overall for workers, more insecurity and cuts to wages. That is what this bill was lined up to do. And if it gets through, even with amendment, workers in this country will be absolutely worse off. 
We can tell today that um, Minister Birmingham, the, you know, in full flight here in the in the chamber in question time, didn't know what his colleagues were doing on the other side, and he could, the only uh, defence he could mention, uh, he could muster, was to say it's his intention in this legislation. It's the government's intention in this legislation to look after workers. Well, I can tell you what, you cannot trust the intention of this Liberal National Party government. You can never, ever trust the intention. And I remind uh, Australians who might be listening to this that the road to hell, in fact, is paved with good intention, and this bill will be hellish in its outcomes for Australian workers. Senator Macdonald made a contribution here this afternoon. She was actually in Queensland, in Townsville, where we went to take evidence. And she asked a question uh, about what was going on with this legislation. She got a response uh, from Mr Bukarika, who was uh, giving evidence about the total impact of the bill. And he did agree that in this omnibus bill, and for those who uh, might be listening who don't understand, it's kind of like you get a great big bag and you chuck everything in it that you want, and somewhere at the bottom you bury a tiny, you know, um, smarty-sized little sweetie that you think you can get away with. So one small thing that might be good that you can hang on to, while the rest of it is just totally doing over the Australian workforce. So this is what Mr Bukarika said in response to Senator Macdonald's question. The bill has a range of measures. He was trying to be honest. A union is saying, not all of them bad, but taken as a package, this bill should be rejected. Well, they've jettisoned one bit today. They've jettisoned the boot. There's a lot more they need to get rid of. And the rationale, Mr Bukareka put it very well. I've already stated there's a critical flaw in the bill in the relation to the definition of casual employment. Now, let's be clear. If this government gets its way, if this legislation gets through, you'll be a casual employer if your employer says you're a casual employer. There will be no clear and proper test. It's totally exploitative, totally exploitative of Australian workers. The casual definition, and the only reason that this government's mentioned it at all, is because they want to stand up against workers. They want to construct, through this legislation, cuts to your pay, more insecurity for you in your work. And they have dressed up the most disgraceful little uh, piece of response to concern about people who want to become permanent. Not everybody wants to become permanent. Sometimes it's handy in your life to be a casual. We know that. We support it. But if you want to become permanent, this government's got this little play going on where they say, oh, if you want to become permanent now, we're making it easier for the, the boss to ask you if you want to be permanent. Except they're not letting you know that if the boss changes your shift any time in the last six months over a period of 12 months, that means they do not have to ask you. They do not have to. They've given the whistle to the leader of the. Uh, they've given the whistle to the captain of the opposite team, and they've removed the umpire. That's what they've done. That's how rigged against the workers this government's construction of this legislation is. This omnibus bill that we are fighting tooth and nail against for the Australian small businesses and workers, we will continue to fight day in and day out. The boot's gone. We need to stick the boot into the rest of it and get rid of this disgraceful piece of legislation that is full of government intention, malcontent, malintention for Australian workers. The question is the motions moved by Senator Gallagher and Senator Pratt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. But we know the ayes have it. Senator Waters. President, I uh, move to take note of the response to my question to Senator Birmingham um, regarding the, uh, the rape that occurred in Parliament House. Now, I asked about this issue yesterday and I asked uh, whether or not the government would support the Sex Discrimination Commissioner doing a culture review of what on earth is going on in this building uh, where we have incident after incident. I didn't get a reply to that aspect of the question yesterday, but this morning we saw the Prime Minister finally respond. But his response was really the bare minimum. What he's now proposed is two reviews, but they're both internal. There's one internal review that will be led by his own staff uh, member in his department um, that will look at the mishandling, frankly, of uh, Ms Higgins' rape allegations and the fact that she felt silenced and unsupported and let down and has ultimately moved on from politics. Um, and the second review will be led by a Liberal MP into uh, the culture of this building. Now, um, when the fact that you have uh, a silencing effect 
and previous history of party being put before personal safety, it is not enough. It is not adequate to have internal reviews to deal with this issue. I can tell you now, internal reviews do not give women confidence that these issues will actually be tackled and that anything will change. So that's our first message to the Prime Minister. Um, do an independent external review. It can be the Sex Discrimination Commissioner. Um, they've got a great track record of looking at these issues in other workplaces, because sadly we know that Parliament House is um, not unusual in having uh, sexual harassment and assault uh, incidents that are sadly rife for many, many workers. So um, the other point that I uh, asked and, and didn't get a response is how do we know if these uh, internal reviews and the findings of SAME will even be made public? There's a, there's a long history of the PM uh, charging his own people with looking into some scandal or another, usually involving one of his ministers, usually a male minister, I might add. Um, and often the results of that re review are simply not made public. There's no transparency in that process. And naturally, the conduct doesn't tend to change. So I asked about whether or not the review findings will be made public, and again, sadly, I did not get an answer. We also don't know what time frame will be applied for those reviews. The Prime Minister didn't answer that question in his press conference earlier today. I would hazard a guess not till after the election. Um, we don't know whether or not these internal reviews will interact with existing reviews that are on foot, being led by our um, uh, CPSU, our, the union that covers this building and its workers and the staff in this building. Um, that review uh, is already underway, and they have been trying to get members of the government to engage. My understanding is they've had no success in so doing, which frankly is unsurprising but is unacceptable. Um, and it's not clear whether or not uh, staff themselves here in this building or the women's safety sector or any other relevant experts will be consulted in the course of those internal reviews. Again, internal reviews are not good enough. They will not restore confidence uh, and the Prime Minister needs to do better. Perhaps he could ask his wife for some advice in that regard. And on that point, um, the mention in the press conference earlier this morning by the Prime Minister, which I asked Minister Birmingham about, um, really had some uh, very dated undertones to it. Now we know the Prime Minister spent some money receiving uh, from an empathy consultant. Well, my suggestion is that the Prime Minister uh, now seek some training about modern attitudes to gender because, frankly, there was victim blaming that occurred in his press conference today. Now, he may not have intended it, it may well have been unconscious, but nonetheless it was there. His statement that um, Brittany Higgins found herself in a vulnerable situation completely denied the fact that she had been put in such a situation by a badly behaved man who happened to be employed by his own party. That victim blaming is sadly so uh, widespread and often unconscious, that training clearly is required. Um, the other uh, point was that uh, the Prime Minister was asked to reflect on what if it had been his daughters. Well, it's not the 1950s anymore, Prime Minister. Women have value irrespective of whether we are daughters or wives um, or in, other, in any other way related to men. We have value in and of ourselves. So I was disheartened to hear that very outdated notion expressed by the so-called leader of our nation. Now, Ms Higgins has called for an independent body for staff to take complaints to. The Prime Minister said today he would listen to her. I asked him to listen to that call. We'll see what happens in that regard. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I'll commence with the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. General business notice of motion number 988, standing in the name of Senator Polly, from today to 17 February. General business notice of motion number 993, standing in the name of Senator Seawitt, from today to 22 February. Any other matters? There being none. Oh, Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I seek leave to move a re motion relating to a leave of absence for, for a senator. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Smith. Thank you. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator McMahon for today for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. There being no other matters, I shall proceed to the discovery of formal business, and I'll 
try my best to manage the time of the Senate. I'll commence with number 986 in the name of Senator Billick. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I inform the Chamber that Senators McKim, Wish, Wilson, Brown and Urquhart will also sponsor the motion. And I ask that general business notice of motion number 986 be taken as a formal is motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. Oh, there is. There is an objection to the motion oh. being taken as formal, so it's, I shall now proceed to matter 991. In the name of Senator Dodson and others. I, I have to admit, I'm not required from the chair to nominate who. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So we'll go to number 991 in the name of Senator Dodson and others. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 991 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator, there is. We'll move to motion number 992 in the name of Senator Keneally and others. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I inform the Chamber that Senator Davey will also sponsor the motion, and I ask that general business notice of motion number 992 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes, Mr President. There is. We will move to matter number 985 in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson. I haven't said anything, Mr President, just to put that on record. Um, I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 985 relating to seismic testing before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted to amend the motion? Leave is granted. Senator Wish Wilson. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. There is. We'll move to number 989. We'll move. Order. This, this is not the. I, I, I can play my recording from the last time I actually had this discussion. We've done it before. Senator Wish Wilson, are you seeking leave to make a short statement? I am, I am Mr. President. Is leave granted? Is leave granted for Senator Wish Wilson to make a short statement? Well, well there being no objection, you can make a statement, Senator thank, Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. I'm just going to ask if I could try that again, if I could, could move that again and that Labor Party re reconsider. Okay. Um, I, again, we, we, you, you, you have asserted someone objected. I can't. I need to make sure the Hansard does not necessarily reflect something that didn't occur. I heard an objection. I'm not going to say from whom unless someone wants to claim ownership of it, and I think that's the way it should be reflected in the Hansard. I, yes, Senator, I was going to uh, give you the opportunity again. I believe Senator Wish Wilson would like to seek formality for the motion as amended. I, I move the motion as amended. Oh, you got to, is oh, there sorry. any objection to this but motion being taken? Is there any objection to this motion being taken? Yes. You are seeking whether a, a formality for motion number 985 as amended by yeah, yourself. I, I amend the motion to circulate in the chamber and ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Wish Wilson. I move the motion as amended. Question is that motion be agreed to. Number 985. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, oh, sorry, Senator Dunningham, I didn't see you there. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. That's excellent. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the government recognises the importance of both the fishing and petroleum industries to the economy. Oil and gas activities in, the, in Commonwealth waters have been effectively regulated alongside fishing for many decades with strict safety and environmental standards underpinned by science and overseen by an independent expert regulator in Nopsema. We recognise the concerns of the fishing industry about potential impacts of seismic uh, surveys on the marine environment. And we're working with fishing industry peak bodies and the offshore petroleum industry on a voluntary national approach for consultation and engagement, improving certainty for both industries. Uh, this is a complex and constructive and ongoing work that will achieve more than this intentionally divisive motion from the Greens. Senator Roberts. You have to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One Nation will support this notice of motion. Australia has the most attractive offshore gas laws in the world. These laws act as a magnet for foreign-owned integrated gas businesses like ConocoPhillips because they don't pay for our gas, don't pay income tax on the profits made from selling our gas, and don't give us any gas, leaving us with high-priced onshore gas. The Prime Minister's gas-led manufacturing strategy is just another marketing campaign until the gas laws are reformed, because Australia is the only large gas producer in the world 
where the domestic gas price is higher than the exported price. One Nation will not support drilling in sensitive environmental areas, including the Great Southern Reef and the pristine waters near South Australia or Tasmania. Question is the motion number 985 as amended, moved by Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Can we move to number 989 in the name of Senators Wong and Payne? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the General Business Notice of Motion number 989 standing in the names of Senators Wong and the name of Minister Payne be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is. We will move to matter number 990 in the name of Senators Waters and Seward. Senator Waters. Uh, thank you, President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 990 relating to uh, Crown and donations be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Good statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Australia has an appropriately robust system to regulate the disclosure and reporting of political donations overseen by the Independent Australian Electoral Commission. The Morrison government takes allegations of criminality seriously. Austrac commenced an enforcement investigation into Crown Melbourne in August of 2020 as a result of an Austrac compliance assessment that began in September of 2019. It's not appropriate to discuss details as the matter, of course, is ongoing. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Patrick. Uh, Labor will be opposing this motion. Uh, this is just another political stunt from the Greens. What the Greens don't tell you with this motion is that since 2013 the Greens have accepted over $1.5 million from high-end gambler Duncan Turpey. Prior to the 2016 election, the Greens accepted 500,000 from Mr. Turpey. In 2018-19, they accepted 545,000 in donations from Mr. Turpey, including a $450,000 donation 18 days before the last election. And last year, the Greens accepted $150,000 in donations from Mr. Turpey, including a $100,000 donation to Senator Waters' own branch, the Queensland Greens. 12 days after she introduced her bill to ban donations from the gambling industry. If the Greens were serious about donations reform, they'd be handing back the donations they've received, which have been financed by the gambling industry. The question is that motion number 990 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. Question is that motion number 990 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 12, noes 35. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, we have two matters left. I will now come to 993 in the name of Senator Seawitt and give you a moment to return to your seat. Senator Seawitt. Oh, I missed the postponement. 987 in that case is the final motion. Senators Thorpe and Dodson. Senator Thorpe, your motion number 987. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 987 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Thorpe. I move the motion. The question is that Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Every death in custody is a tragedy, and as the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody found, the fundamental issue is that too many Aboriginal people are in cu custody too often. An independent review of the RCI ADIC recommendations conducted in 2017 found that the Australian government had fully or mostly implemented 91 per cent of recommendations for which it had responsibility. The Morrison government is committed to working with the states and territories who have responsibility for their justice systems and communities through initiatives such as the National Agreement on Closing the Gap. The government does not support parts D and E of the motion. The question is the motion moved by Senators Thorpe and Dodson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. I'm going to call it again, just looking for some guidance around the chamber. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by motion moved by Senators Thorpe and Dodson be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair. The noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell the ayes. Senator Dean Smith tell for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 29. The matter is therefore negatived. Senator Gallagher, I know, is seeking the call. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move motions 986, 989, 991, and 992 together, and that would be. Sorry, that... can you read that more slowly for me? 986. <sighs> I seek leave yep. to move motions yep. 986, 989, 991 and 992 together and that they be determined without amendment or debate. Is leave granted? Yes. Leave is not granted. Thank you, Mr President. I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving these motions together and that they be determined without amendment or debate. And pursuant to the order adopted by the Senate, that motion is put without debate. So the question is that so much of standing orders be suspended so as to allow Senator Gallagher to move the motion she just read out and was denied leave for. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Okay. It, all right. we need, I've been asked by the whips for four minutes and I'll defer to that request.
lock the doors. The question is that so much of standing orders is suspended as to allow Senator Gallagher to move a number of motions together and be taken formally. The division requires an absolute majority. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith to tell her for the ayes and Senator Seawitt to tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 50, noes 11. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative and carried by the necessary majority. I will call Senator Gallagher to move her motions. Thank you, Mr. President. Do I need leave? No, you oh, can just move, move those motions. I move motions 986, 989, 991 and 992 together um, and ask that they be determined without amendment yep. or debate. Senator Patrick, are you seeking the call? Point of order, Chair. Yep, Senator Patrick. Um, uh, Mr. President, I'm, I'm, I, I just want clarification on the te the temporary order had a restriction on the uh, number of times a senator could seek formality on a motion, uh, and that being only in one per sitting. I just want to make sure that we're uh, that everything is being done so, properly here. Off the top of my head, Senator Patrick, and I will come back to the chamber and plead ignorance if I get it wrong, um, I, I interpret the previous motion as suspending so much of standing orders as that allowed Senator Gallagher to do this, which includes the suspension of the temporary order you referred to. If I'm wrong, I apologise in advance and I'll correct myself in the chamber and make sure it doesn't happen again. Senator Waters. And I seek leave to make a short statement is to explain granted? our voting position. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thanks, President. Um, uh, as a point of principle, we want it placed on record that we oppose moving motions on block. Um, parties in we don't want to set Order. A, a, a precedent to Senator do that. Senator Waters should parties be heard in might, silence. Senator Waters should be heard vote. in silence. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. Parties might wish to vote differently if we, this were to occur in future. We also would normally exercise our right to seek leave to make a short statement to explain our voting position, which we were going to do today in relation to the complex foreign policy motion uh, that your party put. Um, we welcome that as a change of position on being able to debate uh, complex foreign policy uh, matters in this chamber, and we uh, look forward to you uh, doing the same thing to us when we seek to move 
uh, similar motions, but we also remain opposed to the restriction on motions. Um, it has a disproportionate effect on crossbenchers and the Greens, um, and we continue uh, to push for our democratic rights to be able to be used, even where it's inconvenient to put you on the spot for your own policy positions. Uh, Senator, uh, just in clarification to that, um, Senator Waters, I will seek advice if this matter comes up again, um, but unless there is a strenuous objection for the chamber, I'm going to extend the courtesy of allowing these motions to be voted on separately, as I would separate clauses of motions, if senators wish and indicate that they will be voting differently on them. Now, unless there's a strenuous objection, we haven't had this circumstance before, I intend to extend that courtesy. And again, if I'm wrong, it won't happen again. But the clerk has said to me via message, my previous ruling was correct. Um, Senator Roberts. Did you read that the numbers that we're supposed to be voting on? I have. 986, 989, 991 and 992. Senator Roberts. I, I do not want to vote for them on block. Okay. So, well, unless there's an objection, I'm going to. I, I am going, unless there's an objection from someone, I am going to offer senators the courtesy, if they indicate they will vote differently on at least one of them, to put them separately. Is that the case? It is the case. In that case, I will put matter number 986. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I will put matter number 989 in the name of Senators Wong and Payne. Senator Rice. President, um, continuing on from what. Sorry, from Senator Rice, what, are you seeking I seek leave? leave to make a one minute statement. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted, Senator Rice. I'm going to put matter number 989. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'm going to put matter number 991 in the name of Senator Dodson, Senator Dodson and others. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 991 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Roberts, tell her for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 57, noes 2. The matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. I will now put matter number 992, the final matter. Those of that opinion or supporting that matter say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you, Senators. That concludes the discovery of formal business. I'll ask Senators to leave the chamber if they're not going to stay for the urgency motion before I come to it. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 27 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator McKim proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown on item 11 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator Hanson Young. to this important debate today. Um, last week, the Productivity Commission released an interim report into the national water reform. This is a damning assessment of the state of Australia's water supply and water security. But of course, the Productivity Commission, being the economic conservative body that it is, has taken a very rational approach to what is a looming crisis right here in Australia. And the Productivity Commission has nailed the issue that climate change, a warming climate, more extreme weather events and the destruction of our environment is putting our water supply at risk. Within our rivers, our streams, our water catchments and the water supply for our towns and our cities. Now, of course, when the Productivity Commission raises such important issues, you have to turn and wonder who is in charge. Well, we know who is in charge of Australia's federal water policy. It's the National Party. And that's because, of course, the deal that was done to form the Morrison government was to ensure that the water portfolio was given to a member of the National Party. Now think about this. The party who doesn't accept the climate science doesn't even believe that we need to do what the science is requiring to reduce pollution, to, target, to tackle climate change, is in charge of the very important portfolio that is impacted most by the drying climate. The National Party, with their head buried in the sand, on climate change is putting Australia's Order. water supply Order. at risk. Order. Australia's water security is threatened by climate change and it is hanging in the balance because of, of the climate denialism inside the National Party and those at the helm of Australia's water policy. We've got a Murray-Darling Basin that is in crisis. It is oversubscribed. The extraction levels are so big that there is not enough water in the system to keep all of the users sustainable. There's not enough water in the system to keep the river flowing from A to B. In fact, we have towns right now in New South Wales, like Wilkenya, that don't have enough water to drink. And of course, this issue gets worse and worse and worse, not just because of the drying climate, but because those further upstream who are allowed to siphon off water that would have run into the system when indeed it does rain. So on one hand, we've got climate denialism overarching in the National Party and in this government, and then we've got a corrupt system of mismanagement of the scarce amount of water that is there. So we've got cotton farmers, cotton farmers in the north harvesting flood water. Meanwhile, meanwhile, towns further downstream don't even have enough clean water to drink, let alone to irrigate crops. Now I tell you what, 
You Senator can't Hanson eat. Senator Young. I have you Senator can't Pat eat cotton, and you certainly Young. can't. Senator Hanson Young, I have Senator Patrick on his feet. Point uh, of thank order. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'm actually struggling to hear Senator Hanson Young because of Senator McKenzie's interjections. I ask that uh, okay, you remind. Uh, I, I, thank you, Senator out. Patrick. I do, I do note that there is considerable level of noise in the in the chamber. So, um, if we could please uh, respect Senator Hanson Young as she finishes her contribution. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Look, the squawking from this corner of the room. Senator McKenzie. Well, I, I really think that's uh, poor language by the senator reflecting on another senator um, and saying they're squawking. I think uh, is not unparliamentary. Senator Hanson. Senator McKenzie. Senator Hanson Young. Sorry. So just, I'll just rule on that. It's, it's, the general discussion was a general; it wasn't at one person. So I'll, I'll, it's not a point of order at, at this occasion. So, Senator Hanson Young, to continue. The National Party over here in this corner are carrying on because they know the truth. They know that there is not enough water in the Murray-Darling Basin to ensure that towns and small farmers and the environment can survive. Because they, of course, have allowed their they have allowed their political interests to siphon off, to harvest and to take all the water so that the rest of us are left with nothing. And now we hear from the Productivity Commission that this is going to be made even worse because of climate change. Now, if we want to get this right, if we want to secure Australia's water supply, we've got to get rid of the nationals from running this portfolio. If Mr Morrison as Prime Minister is serious about the future of this country. He has to dump the National Party from holding the, the strings on Australia's water supply. Senator Davey. Look, thank you. And, you know, the water portfolio, you, you say it like it's a gift to the Nationals, but the water portfolio Order. is a poison chalice. Order. It is the poison chalice of all portfolios because it is the one portfolio. Order. In our nation, do you Greens want it? That would be great because the green solution is to just add water. That's all the Greens can think about when it comes to managing our environment and managing our waterways. Just add water. Miraculously, it rains and well, Kenya's got water. I wish I could make make it rain. I wish I could make it rain. And I wish that we could stop taking water and still feed ourselves and still clothe ourselves. Would that not be good, Senator Patrick? And you know, the same can be said for your irrigators who are fantastic irrigators. South Australian irrigators are very good. New South Wales irrigators are good. We need our irrigation industry. We absolutely need our irrigation industry. It underpins our agricultural production. It underpins our regional communities and our regional economies, and it's these communities and economies who have been absolutely devastated by the just add water approach that the Greens cling to time and time again. I want to remind this chamber what our communities have given in the name of the environment, and it goes way back. Let's talk about the early 90s when communities in Victoria and New South Wales gave up their right to some water in the name of the environment with the very first environmental water allocation, the Barma Millua Forest allocation. They gave that water up with no compensation. Then again in the late 90s, the cap on diversions was put in place and again our communities gave up water with no compensation in the name of the environment. Fast forward to the 2000s and we got a National Party minister, and good on him. John Anderson did the right thing. He recognised water as a property right. He developed the National Water Initiative, which the Greens are now holding up as the doyen for water reform. Thank you, National Party, because if it wasn't for the National Party, that water initiative would not have been signed in place and the Productivity Commission report wouldn't exist. So thank you to the National Party for that. And that is not the only reform the National Party have led. I know I have uh, my colleague and friend, Senator Patrick, over there, 
who doesn't believe that the National Party have made any steps when it comes to water compliance. And that could not be further from the truth. It was the National Party in New South Wales who have implemented the Natural Resource Access Regulator, who is now held up as the Order. compliance cop on the beat in the basin. The, the National Party has led the way in developing modern telemetric technology to apply to on-farm water storages so that we can manage what we, we can measure what we manage when it comes to water. We in, the, in New South Wales and Victoria have had telemetered and compliant meters for years, since the early 90s, and in fact in my area of Murray Irrigation, we have had uh, volumetric caps on our entitlements and metered take since the 60s. So, uh, for people down at the south end of the system to stand on a soapbox and try and claim purity when in their districts, up until two years ago, they were allowed to take water with no water in their account. They were the only jurisdiction left in the Murray-Darling Basin that even under national water initiative compliant entitlement regimes were allowed to access water when they didn't have it in their account, effectively manipulating the market, going into the market after the fact when prices were cheaper instead of, like every other state in the basin, having to have a positive account balance. I mean, imagine. It's like having water on a credit card. It should not happen, and thankfully and congratulations, South Australia have taken steps to amend that. But for other South Australians to stand on a soapbox and point the finger, don't throw stones in glass houses. I also uh, you know, want to remind people that the Greens hold this up and say the Nationals shouldn't have the portfolio because we deny climate change. I've never denied climate change. My colleagues don't deny climate change. But you can't make all policy. Order. Sorry, but also, let's, let's look at this. They say that because it is good for their constituents, and to blame someone else like the Nationals for being denialists, it's good for their constituents. But their constituents don't bear the brunt of the reforms that have been done in the name of the environment over years. Those regional communities that have been put through the ringer, who are still living in perpetual uncertainty about what water regime they will be living under and whether there will be enough water remaining in their region to enable effective and efficient and affordable water management. Because you can't do it alone. Because let's talk about the progress of water reform and what it has actually cost. Forget about the cost for the taxpayer. What about the cost in our communities? In the Edward War Call system, 50 per cent of their water entitlements have been recovered under the name of the environment. 50 per cent. Imagine trying to run a, a store by being told you're only allowed to put 50 per cent worth of stock in that store. But you've still got the same costs and the same overheads. It doesn't work. The dairy industry in the Murray region, which includes Victoria, has been de decimated by water reform since the 2000s. It has been ongoing and uh, it has declined 40 per cent since the turn of this century during the peak of the water reform frenzy. <coughs> and while our remaining dairy farmers are absolutely pulling their weight and keeping Australian dairy going, there is no doubt that they are in pain. Our rice industry, the most efficient rice industry, water efficient rice industry in the world, is on its knees because of the impact on the water market that water reform has had. This is the water market that the Productivity Commission says has significant net benefits. 
So I'm not saying the water market is a bad thing, but look at the cost of reform. We can't keep exporting our problems. We cannot say just grow rice overseas. Grow rice overseas in third world countries that need to feed themselves. Grow rice overseas in countries that use triple the amount of water, which is a precious resource everywhere in the world. Grow rice overseas where they may or may not use child labour, where their chemical regimes are far more questionable than Australia's. No. We've got to take responsibility for our own nation and our own production. And I also remind people that rice can be turned off and on. So think about that next time you're choosing between rice milk or almond milk when you're ordering your latte. Almonds use more water than rice per hectare every year without fail. Rice can be grown when it's wet, not grown when it's dry. Rice is the perfect crop for our variable climate. And finally, we want to talk about climate change. Seriously, water reform and climate change? Well, let's talk about the lower lakes. Let's talk about the impact of rising sea levels on the barrages and the lower lakes. Order. Order. Take away the dams. Senator Patrick, if you would like to take away the dams, congratulations. You bring that argument upstream and I am not. What I am saying, Senator Patrick, and I'm not saying get rid of the barrages, I've never said that. What I am saying is that the barrages, as they currently exist and operate, will be compromised by rising sea levels. Thanks to climate change, the conversation needs to be had about how we manage the lower lakes and the barrages to address that instead of just looking upstream saying, just add more. It has to stop. Senator Ayres. Well, any Australian listening to this would despair uh, and reach the conclusion that the Greens of the National Party can't be trusted with water policy. I have to say, listening to Senator Davies' account, she speaks with some authority, I think, on questions around southern New South Wales and the rice industry, and I respect her contribution in that area. The truth is the National Party's administration of water policy, though, has let the people in the southern part of the river system down. The truth is that the National Party is institutionally incapable of administering water policy at the federal and state level in a way uh, that deals with the environmental questions in the river, that deals with the water usage questions for agriculture and, in particular, uh, deals appropriately with the rights of native title holders along the river. I listened carefully to the Closing the Gap report yesterday. I have to say I was horrified again by one particular political party's approach uh, to those issues, but I guess I'll save that for another day. And I was considering, as we were listening to the Closing the Gap report, uh, what that meant in terms of water policy in Western New South Wales, because the uh, issues around uh, the gap are nowhere more apparent than in terms of the way that we deal with water, particularly water in New South Wales. Aboriginal communities and corporations own just 0.1 per cent of the more than $26 billion worth of water entitlements in the system. I travelled to these communities. I visited Wilcannia during the drought where the Barkindji people have lived next to the river for millennia. Life expectancy for Wilcannia men is 37.5 years. I visited the Brewarrina fish traps, believed to be the oldest human structure on earth. It should be a national monument. They are about 10 times as old as the pyramids. They were bone dry. I visited Walgett and talked to local health services. When the town runs dry, <clears throat> and it was dry then, the consequences for people's health and kids' health is catastrophic. Drinking less water, bathing less frequently, eating less nutritious food. It's a town that already has endemic health issues concentrated in the town's Aboriginal communities. And the truth is 
Well, I heard the refrain from those members, those senators in the National Party, that we just needed it to rain. The truth is, the arrival of rain has not solved these problems. In January, Menindee's water supply, its drinking water, turned green. A thick slime now covers a third of its surface. It's despite the fact that North West New South Wales has received twice as much rain as 2018 and 2019 combined. Water management is a complex set of problems. But what it requires beyond the framework is a rigorous approach to compliance, to dealing with corruption and to dealing with powerful lobbies and interest groups. Because the truth is that the people who miss out, who have missed out under the national stewardship of water policy, are farmers all along the river. It's the environment that's missed out. It's the people in the towns who should have good, decent jobs coming out of Australian agriculture, and it is certainly native title holders or prospective native title holders along the system. Now, last week, the New South Wales Irrigators Council found that inflows have almost halved over the past 20 years, consistent with climate change projections. That availability will get worse. Now, the Nationals don't have a plan for water, and no more evident in that is, I'll take the interjection from Senator Canavan, to build more dams. These jokers haven't built a dam. They haven't built a dam for decade Order. after decade after decade. Put aside, put aside whether or not that would be a good idea. There's plenty of private sector unregulated dams Order. out there, but you guys haven't built a dam. Big talk about the dams. Every regional, every regional newspaper, there's always some joker from the National Party saying, we're going to be Order. out there, we're going to build a dam. Do they ever build one? They announce and they never deliver. They announce and they never deliver. Over and over and over again, these characters sell out the people of country New South Wales and country Australia. Now, it does invite, I think, a broader consideration of the issues facing Australian agriculture. A political movement that once purported to represent country-minded thinking has become a political front for a very narrow set of interests. The big questions, the big questions about Australian agriculture, as we rebuild from a record drought, now it's the time for a big debate about building a stronger future for Australian agriculture. This year, the national Order. cattle herd fell to 24.6 million. Australia's sheep flock fell to 66 million, the lowest level since 1985. 1905. And these characters mumble about nuclear power and building dams, no substantial solutions. Now, the government, the government has set the goal for Australian agriculture to be exporting $100 billion by 2030. The government set that goal because the National Farmers Federation set that goal. Now, that is a good goal for the National Farmers Federation to have. But the question has to be asked, is it the right goal for the country? In truth, it lacks ambition. The truth is that Australian agriculture has continued to fall down the global value chain. It's fine for the National Farmers Federation to set an objective for farmers about farm gate prices and volumes, but the truth is we should be having a big debate in this country if we're really interested in the people who live and work or want work in country towns, we should be focused on a debate about creating value in Australian agriculture, about adding value, about food manufacturing. And where is the National Party on these questions? They are nowhere. They are nowhere. In terms of climate change and agriculture, where is the National Party, the poor old National Party? They are nowhere. Uh, the party that purports to represent the communities that will be most affected is nowhere on climate change policy, completely missing. Net zero emissions endorsed by every key agriculture body. Poor old, poor old Mr Joyce, the member for New England, said a net zero emissions policy would destroy any hope of expanding Australian farming. If the Nationals supported net zero emissions, 
we would cease to be a party that could credibly represent farmers. Well, here is what the peak body for cattle farmers said in their Red Meat 2030 plan. We will play a role. We will play our role in reducing Australia's greenhouse gas emissions by extending our existing commitment to carbon neutrality by 2030 across the supply chain. The National Farmers Federation are there. Everybody in agriculture is there. Where is the National Party? Nowhere. They have already, already ceased to have any claim to credibly represent Australian agriculture or Australian farmers. Now we will, we will uh, bring to the next election a credible platform in agriculture. This parliament should be debating the big issues about the future of Australian agriculture. You know, in no small part, one of the key issues facing Australian agriculture is the lack of research in Australian agriculture. Research funding in Australian agriculture has collapsed year after year after year. The small increase in private funding in, uh, re research increases is completely dwarfed by the collapse in government funding. And guess who's in charge of government funding for Australian agriculture? The truth is private sector research delivers short-term benefits, but public sector research into the big challenges for Australian agriculture delivers long-term benefits. And you would think that the National Party had nothing to do with the government. There is, there is a complete collapse Order. in research funding for Australian agriculture, and these guys, again, nowhere to be seen. So if you've got an interest in the future of the river system, if you've got an interest in sustaining communities along the river and sustaining uh, Australian agriculture along the river, if you've got a concern about the future of Australian agriculture and lifting it up the value chain and increasing jobs in country towns, don't go to the National Party for solutions. Senator Patrick. Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. I, uh, I rise to, to speak on the uh, MPI today, which uh, goes to concerns about the National Party ever having too much about uh, water. Let's go back to the start of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, where uh, sensible decisions were made to uh, introduce an act to manage, to manage the, the, uh, the Murray-Darling Basin uh, and to do so in a manner uh, where we establish what the environmental uh, uh, sustainable le level of take was by best available science. Best available science. And a 726-page document was produced by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority showing that the right number for, um, uh, in terms of the, the uh, amount of water we had to recover was somewhere between uh, 3,900 gigalitres and 7,600 gigalitres. Now, uh, of course, there was debate about uh, how much uh, uh, we, uncertainty we were going to allow in the recovery of water to make sure the river was healthy, but unfortunately there was political interference, political interference from the nationals. And in fact, uh, one of the people suggesting this number was so wrong is the current uh, Inspector General, Acting Inspector General, who uh, went on record and said, no, it's, it, it shouldn't be uh, uh, it shouldn't be uh, 7,600. It shouldn't be 3,900. We're going to uh, go even lower. It shouldn't even be 2,750, which is what what ultimately uh, uh, the political number was. He wanted it to be 2,100. He's on record as suggesting it ought to be 2,100. So uh, this is the Inspector General, that is a, a former New South Wales uh, Deputy Premier, Premier, National Party member, appointed by a National Party minister in this government. What does that do for confidence in, uh, in the plan? So, of course, uh, the nationals don't, are not concerned about lawfulness when, uh, when we look at the river. And uh, I'm, I'm a, bit, a little bit surprised that uh, Senator McKenzie hasn't stood up, uh, Senator McKenzie SC hasn't stood up having won the, lots of high court challenges uh, and maybe uh, tried to uh, uh, contest what uh, Brett Walker SC uh, said in the Royal Commission, and that is that the plan is unlawful. It's, it's unlawful because of the Nationals' interference in uh, determining what the appropriate SDLs ought to be. 
And then we go back to having got the plan, having got an unlawful plan, they still want to take uh, 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 more water from the river. They still want to take more water from the river. The national parties talk about let's pray for rain. It's not about that. We know what the rainfall is. We know the, infl the inflows are reduced. The problem is you're taking too much water. And funnily enough, Senator Mackenzie pretends to represent irrigators. I've been to the Southern, um, uh, to Southern River. Well, you, might, you might live there. Well, how about the people that, that are there that can't take water as it goes past? Because there's no water coming Order. down. Senator no, because Patrick. there's no Senator water coming Patrick. down the Darling River. Senator Patrick, that's please why. Do because Senator the nationals Patrick. have Order. turned on the. Senator Patrick. Senator Mackenzie. Senator Patrick. Senator Patrick, could you please direct your comments through the chair and not interjections are just disorderly. So, so we have a situation where the National Party. Uh, te uh, they, they, they talk about rain, blaming it on rain. It's not about rain. It's about taking too much water. Some of them think that uh, uh, we're letting the water roll down to the Murray mouth uh, and then letting it go, go to sea. Let me read what, uh, uh, what um, Richard Beasley said in his recent book. Several people involved in agriculture in the other basin states and some of the politicians they support consider any water that flows out of the Murray River to be an exercise in irrigating the Southern Ocean. These people are idiots. I think he got it right. Imagine a river that runs into the ocean. Imagine that. Now, uh, unfortunately, the Nationals don't even understand that. They don't even understand that in order to, to have uh, water that is not saline, that, that uh, is usable in irrigation, you've got to have a healthy river system. But no, they continue to take take, take. And they, they continue to stand in the way of the execution of the plan, uh, making silly water purchases that don't actually return anything to the environment and paying twice the toad odds. Order. Twice the toad odds. The National Party have corrupted the, the Murray-Darling Basin plan. Senator Patrick, your time's expired. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you so much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Tell you what we won't take. Senator Patrick, through you, Madam Chair, is we will not take the carping from a South Australian senator because it is our people, our people and our communities in the heart of the Murray-Darling Basin who have paid the price for the complicit arrangement between South Australian Order. senators in this chamber and in the other place. It is our people. The Murray-Darling Basin is an area that spans four states. Two million Australians live in the Murray-Darling Basin, and it is vastly productive in terms of food and fibre production. Now, you know what you can't do for these two million people and their communities and their industries? You can't keep them employed, keep them sustainable and prosperous without water, water without a triple bottom line approach Senate. to our uh, irrigated agriculture. And what we have done as a political party and a movement that is very proud to stand up for these people and these industries the pe that actually brings their concerns. You pretend to bring their concerns, Senator Patrick. You don't know their concerns, Senator Hanson-Young. But we live in these communities and we're very proud to bring their concerns here and to be reformers around water policy and also to deliver uh, for our communities. We are the political party that actually put people into the triple bottom line. Remember the triple bottom line was supposed to be uh, about humans, the environment and the economy. Well, you only hear about one side of the triple bottom line from the Greens and from Senator Alliance this, these days, or actually probably you throw South Australia in there as well. When you want to know why there's no water in the Murray-Darling Basin, it's because all heading south. And I stand here today, this chamber, has done over 10 Senate inquiries into the Murray-Darling Basin because it's not working. So the great con plan concocted with a, with a number pulled out of the air, a political solution, that number, no science to it, which has been prosecuted in estimates and in Senate inquiries ad nauseum over the last decade and is actually ripping apart 
rural communities in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. When we talk about why the National Party holds this policy, it's because we understand the implications of the policy intent. We have to deal uh, with the outcomes. And it is National Party ministers who decided to decentralise the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. So the people making decisions and implementing this plan actually had skin in the game, weren't bureaucrats in Canberra far away not understanding how their policy decisions and their implementation decisions were impacting real people, kids at school and the future sustainability of our communities. We actually are very proud to have been the political party that introduced the 1,500 the gig uh, cap on water buybacks. That's actually good policy. We actually prioritise water infrastructure projects over this casual Order. disregard of coming into rural communities and buying back water Order. off willing sellers. Remember willing sellers? They are actually drought-affected farming communities and families that have been there for generations who had no other options. And the devastating impact of the Swiss cheese effect of those water buybacks in our communities, that you, you weren't even here when this was happening, but it was absolutely horrific what has actually occurred and the channels that have had to close, etc., as a result of that. It's the National Party that, you know what, decided to conduct an investigation, Senator Patrick, into Order. the socio-economic impact of the plan on our people. Heaven forbid, heaven forbid that the National Party actually calls government to account and asks for an assessment of how this Labor Greens policy is impacting the people and the industries uh, that, that the Murray-Darling Basin uh, flows through. It's, it's the National Party that delivered a 605 gig reduction in water recovery to the Southern Basin through a package of six, 36 projects. It's the National Party that got the Productivity Commission report done. It's the National Party that protects water security, clean drinking uh, water and food supply through a raft of measures, including the Murray-Darling Communities Investment Package, which is amazing. We've strengthened governance of the plan. Uh, through our particular ministers, and I think it's absolutely fantastic that we've got an inspector general who's lived in the basin, who has a very a lived experience of what this is like. You know, we make no apology for the people for being the party that the people in the Murray Darling Basin choose to vote for. They don't vote for the Greens. If the Greens' policies were so fabulous for the Order. basin communities, why Order. don't they Senator hold a single seat? state or federal in any single basin community you know why you know why because your policies only float in a couple of places brunswick in my home state of victoria and the cbd of sydney order in the cbd of sydney we hold a water buybacks and chose to invest in on farm efficiency to actually help farmers um, deal with the impacts of a changing climate and seasonal variations they are on the front line they are changing practice each and every day in response to the high price of water because the South Australian and the New South Wales state governments will not stop developments in the southern region of the basin. That's what the National Party is calling for. Stop those uh, hungry, thirsty uh, almond tree developments at, which are driving the price of water up. The National Party is also calling to split the compliance functions of the MDBA away. I am very, very proud to be Senate leader of a party that takes its role in this place seriously, and its water ministers take their role seriously to perform and reform this area, which is so crucial. We are focused on delivering a triple bottom line. It's a pity the Greens and the Labor Party are no longer interested in putting Order. people at the centre of their policy. You're very happy for people to vote us to come here. It's about time you actually started remembering uh, that food and fibre production in this country is reliant on the human beings that till the soil in the communities we represent. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise today to speak on this urgency motion. And um, again, I'm speaking on an urgency motion drafted by the Greens to, as we as we've seen before, essentially trigger the nationals into delivering this type of performance art that we've seen uh, in the last couple of um, uh, speeches. 
The truth is, uh, it is a difficult motion to, to be directed at the nationals. I think takes out what is important about this debate. Uh, but we do know, we do know, fair enough. The nationals try to pick and choose when they're in government and when they're not. And I don't live in some of these communities that people have spoken about today. I'm not down south um, uh, in Adelaide or down in northern, uh, southern New South Wales. But it is an issue that deeply affects people in regional Queensland. And I know from living there that the Nationals like to run around and talk about the things that they uh, care about. But when they come down here, they forget to actually do the work to get the policies delivered. To do the work to get the policies delivered. They're very good, very good at turning up with some core flutes and some petitions and getting some media to come along Order. and to talk about Order. the things that they're going to do because they're in the National Party. But when they come down here, they're part of the Liberal National Party and they make sure that they are part of a government that continues to mismanage water and environment policy and all the things that actually matter to the people that they say that they represent. This productivity report slammed the Morrison government's management of water. And that's because it takes a commitment to deliver, not just to your own constituency, to, but everyone who relies on water. You can't deliver a policy that is just about delivering yourself an applause when you get back to where you're from. You've got to deliver a policy that supports everyone that relies on water and acknowledges the very real impacts that climate change is having on our environment in our rural regions and the impact that it is having on the very communities that the nationals say that they represent. What we know is that some of the big economic impacts in regions and in, the, in rural areas are some of the things that the nationals and the Liberal government refuse to deal with and refuse to put a plan in place. Uh, we know that in uh, the water minister's own electorate, there are towns that have run out of water. And I'm not talking about a couple of weeks where they had to be restricted in the way that they were using water. They are trucking water in to the water minister's own electorate. And they have been doing that for years. For over 12 months now, water is being trucked in to the water minister's own electorate. And yet this report shows, this report shows, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, if the, if the Greens and Nationals want to take this outside, go ahead. But if you want to just give me a couple of seconds, I can, possibly, Senator, but... Order, just please direct through this. Those yeah. communities in southern Queensland who have run out of water, deserve to be part of this conversation, deserve to have a local member and deserve to have a minister that will not just turn up for the photo op but actually deliver when he comes down to Canberra because right now that is not what is happening. And I just want to note that what this, rec what this uh, production, uh, Commission's advice says is very important, it's very crucial. It says that the overarching goal of the National Water Initiative remains sound but should be modernised through reference to the adaptation to climate change and the recognition of the importance of water in the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That is imperative that our First Peoples are part of this conversation. And that's not what the Nationals come here to talk about. They do not... Order. They do not see this as something that affects every single person living on every single land in Queensland and New South Wales and down, down south to South Australia. They see, this, they see this as something for them to have in the Cabinet room you, but to do nothing time, with. Time has expired. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this matter of public importance and I thank my colleague, Senator McKim. May I remind everyone in this chamber, no one owns water. Nobody owns it. 
Nobody owns water. If anything, you've stolen it. You've stolen the water. Order. You've stolen the water. No one owns the water. You can't look after it. It's a mess. You are stealing it. This country, the earth, we say is our mother. You have to look after your mother, okay? Because if you don't, bad things will happen. Now, the water to our mother is the blood that runs through your, her veins. And you would know that, Senator Mackenzie. You're a mother, and you know how important it is to Senator protect Thorpe. and respect your mother. So that's how we should be looking at water. And I know that's difficult for you to understand, Senator, over there with the face happening. But Excuse me, Senator, uh, Senator Sen Thorpe, that's not appropriate. Please direct your comments through the chair. I, I apologise and I take that back, but it is very, um, it's very close to my heart that a bunch of white people are talking about owning water and water rights and the monetary value to water. It's absolutely disgusting. It's disrespectful, and there is no, you didn't even mention for, no one's mentioned uh, First Nations people except for the Labor Party over here, and I respect order. that. So water to us is life. It is life. For our people, water is our song lines. There are stories to every waterways in this whole country. The whole country, there is a story about why they meet up to one another and how important they are to the people who have been on that part of the country for thousands and thousands and thousands of generations. I'm not going to sit here and listen to a bunch of white people telling me that they know more about the water in this country than the people that have been here for thousands of generations. Water is not about money. Water is about our life, your children's life, and it is fundamental to our people, to our survival. This continent has been our ancestral home for our people for over 70,000 years. Our people's relationship with the inland waters, rivers, wetlands, sea, in islands, reefs, sandbars and seagrass beds is part of who we are. This is why Article 25, and you might want to listen to this over here, the Nationals, because you could put it in some of your writings yourself, but Article 25 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People says that, and I quote, Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinctive spiritual relationships with their traditionally owned or otherwise occupied and used lands, territories, waters and coastal seas and other resources and to uphold their responsibilities to future generations in this regard. I mean, who's looking after our water for future generations? Certainly not this lot. Water for all of us but particularly for our people, is far too important to be left in the hands of the climate-denying nationals who can only think of water as a resource to be exploited for greed and total water. mismanagement. The coal-loving minister for resources, Keith Pitt, himself dismissed the climate warning issued by the United Nations by saying that grand statements are quite simple, simple to make. He is so triggered by anyone calling him a climate denier, and we see the other reactions today, that he even requested a parliamentary inquiry into lenders and insurers blacklisted companies linked to the coal and gas producers. You have to wonder who the nationals are actually for these days because they're not even looking after the farmers. Farmers and traditional owners are joining forces. And they know that not even the nationals are protecting their interests. They're better off working with us. Farmers already know that climate change is costing them. Water is too important to be in the hands of climate deniers, who in our way would suggest they have no respect or understanding of water, and it should never be in any position to make decisions for such a sacred resource. That'll do. Senator Canavan. It's got to go around the chamber, mate. Yeah, you can't um, go I'll, I'll be. Senator Canavan, take a seat, please. Senator, Senator Wishes. Ha, yeah, ha, on a point of order. Senator point, Canavan, point, yeah, take point a of seat. order, Acting Deputy President. Um, there's a speaking list. Um, 
the next speaker is not here. I'm next on the list. I have no problems with Senator Canavan going after me and taking that last five minute spot. But you should check with the clerk, but I should be the next person who gets the call. Sorry, take your seat, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McKenzie. The convention in this chamber is to rotate the call. I could have I, and the standing orders, and also my understanding is this is an informal agreed list. Um, given Senator Roberts isn't here and the call should come to this side of the chamber, uh, it should be Senator Canavan that gets the call. Senator Wish Wilson, oh, sorry, Senator Canavan on that point of order? No, oh, sorry. Okay. No, on the point of order, I'm going to rule on the basis that the, the list has fallen apart during the course of the session because we haven't got Senator Roberts here. So I'm going to call Senator Canavan as he was the next person on his feet, which is the, the usual um, thing. So Senator Canavan has the call. Note that we are not taking any more time for the Nationalist Party than was agreed. Senator McKenzie did cut her time. Um, so we're not seeking at all to deny other senators their appropriate times. Um, I, I just wanted to add some quick uh, thoughts on this motion, and particularly something I don't think that has been mentioned during this debate is that I, as an Australian, am incredibly proud about what we have built as a nation in the Murray Darling. There's been very little mention of the hard work, the pioneering effort that went into building the farms, the dams that feed us today, that actually feed us, that provide 40 per cent of our nation's food. We would, we would really be in serious trouble, as much trouble as the early settlers, if we didn't have the Murray-Darling here in Australia. And we should recognise the sweat, the toil, uh, the desperation that many people before us went through to get that to happen. I heard Senator Patrick say before, let's just get rid of the dams. Let's just get rid of the dams, as if, as if that would mean nothing for the rest of the country. What, how would we feed ourselves? How would we uh, be able uh, to provide? for other people in this country. And I think it's very important that we mention and recognise that one of the key things we want to achieve out of the management of the Murray-Darling is the production of food, is the creation of viable rural communities. Uh, they're not constantly under the threat of having their economic base pulled from out or under them. And what the Nationals Party, my Senate leader, Senator McKenzie, summed it up well before, what the Nationals Party have brought back to this debate is people. We brought back people to the heart of this debate, people uh, are on a farm who are, who, who are trying to keep uh, a farm in their family in, over generations, people who own a cafe in, in Wagga Wagga. And if you ever get to go to Wagga Wagga, it's the best bakeries in, in this country, I think, beautiful restaurants. Those people deserve to have a future. The people, the people in the cities who want to eat all the food they see on MasterChef or the latest reality TV show, those people uh, are important as well. And also the indigenous people of the system as well. And it was the Nationals Party who introduced a $40 million fund to buy back water for indigenous people because I know, meeting many indigenous people through the basin, that they too want to develop their own farms and economic opportunities and potentially use water as well. And, and I. I, uh, I think it's very important in this debate that we represent that whole country, from the rural community, from the farmer, right through to the dinner plate in the urban environment. And it's the National Party that does have representatives right across the Murray-Darling. And again, I, I, sometimes in this debate, when you hear people say, let's blow up the barrages, or let's blow up Cubby Station, or let's blow up Menindee Lakes, we have to manage it as a system. There is not one single answer. There is not one thing you can do which will solve all of the issues. It must be balanced in a respectful way that puts people at the heart of this debate, because ultimately we all have an interest in seeing a strong, viable and sustainable Murray-Darling that can continue to feed us long into the future. Hear, hear. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I have no problems with Canavan, Senator Canavan having a contribution here, uh, but I notice he studiously avoided even mentioning the Productivity Commission report, the agency he used to work for before he came in the Senate. And I also note that he made no comment at all about climate change. But he's been very vocal, lacking Deputy President. He's been very vocal on the national stage in the last week. He just said recently, under no circumstances would I support any 2050 climate plan. Under no circumstances would I support climate action. He also said that regional towns in this country, including the Murray-Darling Basin, quote unquote, face complete destruction, complete destruction under net zero emissions policy. Well, let me tell you why these towns will face complete destruction in the next 100 years. It's because of the National Party and their climate denial. 
because of the National Party and this government. It will be because of record heat waves. It will be because of drought, fire, flood, pestilence, and we'll lose more farmers to suicide. That's because this party that purports to represent farming and rural and regional communities in this country has completely let them down because they're in here, in this place, playing culture war games, playing politics. What policy have they put up to help farmers? What policy have they put up to tackle climate change? Well, Mr Little Proud, in the other place this week, said, ah, 2050, yeah, that might work for us. But he said, I want to see a plan first. This is the guy that has the agricultural portfolio. Why hasn't he developed a plan? What has he been doing for the last five years that he's been at the helm? It begs the question, what have any of them been doing? Five years. But this government has sat on eight years of climate inaction. They have ripped up every policy that was in this place to act on climate change. And they've cost farmers big revenue. They're not only the costs that farmers face of climate inaction. Order. ABARES recently said that farmers have lost more than a billion dollars because of climate change inaction. But we know that removing the carbon price and the carbon farming initiative has cost farmers big time. They could be selling their excess abatement credits in the UK market and the EU market right now at $50 a tonne. Instead, they're facing down the barrel of spending, having to pay $50 a tonne of carbon on our exports, their agricultural exports. That's the genius of this mob. The genius of this mob. And may I say, in relation to Senator Thorpe's contribution in here, a very moving, beautiful contribution. Everyone in this chamber, we've been here, what, nearly two decades on this planet? And I'll take it we're all connected to our land in our own ways. Two decades. Maybe the odd MP or senator might have been in, in their third decade in this place. Imagine being part of a culture that was here for not 20 decades or even 200, but 2,000. 2,000 generations living on this land. If we can't learn from our first Australians about how to live in harmony with this land, then we are totally stuffed. What have we managed to do in just eight generations? That's how long white people have been in this land. Eight generations. What have we managed to do? We've completely managed to stuff the Murray-Darley Basin. Millions of dead fish just last year. How, how easily we forget millions of dead fish. And no one was more angered and appalled and saddened than farmers when they saw that. What else have we managed to do? Half the barrier reef is dead. And so on and so forth. I'd need another 20 minutes, Acting Deputy President, to go through how badly we have managed country since we have arrived here and colonised and invaded this country. And I'm really peeved that these guys continue to come in here and act as though they care about farmers when they don't. Thank you, Senator Wishroof. So the question is that the urgency motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Is there a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is, the urgency motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Ciccone, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Brockman, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 30, the votes being equal. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Senator McKenzie. I seek leave to make a, a very short comment. Is leave granted for one minute? I'm very yes, concerned that the Labor Party voted for this motion since the South Australia Premier, Jay Weatherall, was very happy to appoint a National Party minister to the water portfolio. I, okay. Do I need we, to get the um, vote recommitted? Um, we, will move, we will move on. I thank senators. And before I give senators, we will now proceed to the consideration of documents. Give senators a minute to uh, leave the chamber. Okay. I should now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Senator Watt. Thank you. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, there's a lot of paper here. I'll just get myself a little bit organised. Um, Um, do I need to seek, seek leave to ta or take note? I'd like to take, take note, note of mm. the statutory review of the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility. And I'm very pleased that well, Senator Canavan was here. I was looking forward to talking to Senator Canavan again about the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility. Um, the, in December last year, the government tabled a statutory review of the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility. And I think if there was any government funding body that was in desperate need of a review, it was the NAIF, better known as the No Actual Infrastructure Fund. Uh, this $5 billion fund, announced by the government now more than five years ago, has, on the most recent figures, released only a couple of hundred million dollars of its funds, which works out to roughly about 5 per cent. So five years on, after this organisation and this funding body was announced, we still have only about 5 per cent of the funds actually released out there investing in projects across northern Australia. 
Um, if there was ever an example of this government's uh, prioritisation of announcements over delivering, the NAIF has got to be pretty high up there. Um, this, when this body was announced by the government, it was going to be creating jobs and funding projects right across northern Australia, something that was and still is desperately needed, uh, because we know that northern Australia can be an area which does find it difficult to attract private finance for a whole range of reasons—remoteness, uh, the um, uh, innovativeness of some of the projects and industries that are happening there. There is a need for a government financing vehicle to help fill the gap in private financing, and that's what the NAIF was held up to be. Uh, now, this statutory review is not the first review that's been done by, of the NAIF by this government. I think it's up, we're up to about three or four reviews, um, so not a bad record that this government has had to have a review of the NAIF almost every year since it was announced. Uh, and again, that's a bit of an indication that there are serious problems. Um, but having said all of that, we welcome the fact that this review does seem to be finally acknowledging and recommending change on a number of issues that the Labor opposition has been highlighting for a very long time. Uh, I think it's probably two or three years now that we've been calling for fundamental change of the NAIF uh, so that it can deliver on what this government promised, which was jobs and projects across northern Australia. And I don't know why it is that it's taken so long for these changes to actually be recommended, let alone implemented. Uh, I do note that there's now a new minister, Minister Pitt. Um, he seems to be moving a little bit more quickly than his predecessor, Senator Canavan, in actually getting this NAIF to work. Uh, and I know that before too long the government will have some legislation introduced uh, to try to implement some of the recommendations that have been made in this review. Uh, and I've already indicated to Minister Pitt that the opposition will approach that legislation in good faith, uh, and provided we think that, those, the, that the legislation will actually get the NAIF working at last, then we'd be happy to support it. Um, we've obviously got to go through that legislation in detail, but we hope um, that the recommendations here are going to be implemented. Um, we've been saying for a very long time uh, that the NAIF is not doing enough to fund some of the smaller projects uh, that are in abundance across northern Australia but have not to date been able to attract finance from the NAIF. The reality is that while there are mega projects in northern Australia, in the hundreds of millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars, there are many more smaller projects that still have enormous potential to create jobs uh, but have real difficulty for obtaining finance uh, from commercial banks. And we'd like to see the NAIF pay a bit more attention to those kind of projects. Uh, I've had consistent feedback for years that the NAIF is too risk averse, uh, and I welcome the fact that this review has indicated that the NAIF and its risk appetite will be uh, reconsidered as well. Uh, and I welcome the fact that this review indicates that the NAIF should be open to investing in means other than just providing loans, for instance, in taking equity stakes in projects. So the bottom line is that the NAIF is a worthwhile body. Uh, there is a need for a government financing vehicle for Northern Australia. But the way the NAIF has been established so far has been a dismal failure. We welcome this review identifying some recommendations. We hope the government will act, and I seek leave uh, to continue my remarks. Thank you. Senator Ayres. Deputy President, I take note of the Community Affairs References Committee second interim report, Centrelink's Compliance Program Government Response from February 2021, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Uh, Senator Seward. I actually wanted to speak to that report, uh, and I okay. thought we were going through an order. So, is it appropriate that I speak to that uh, report now? Or there is an opportunity to speak on those, but after we've dealt with the other reports. Jump earlier. <laughs> okay. So, um, do we have uh, any more speakers for item one, item two, item three, 
And now item four. Uh, we'll now move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government uh, responses. Senator Polly. Thank you. I wanted to uh, speak. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to speak on the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, additional information, aged care amendment, aged care recipient classification bill 2020 report. The amendments made by this bill allow for the. Sir Polly, can I just interrupt you? It hasn't been tabled yet, so we need to go to the government whip first to, to, to table. Senator McGrath. Thank you. On behalf of the chair of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, Senator Askew, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into the provisions of the Aged Care Amendment Aged Care Recipient Classification Bill 2020. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Polly. Uh, would you like me to start again? <laughs> yep. Go for it. Thank you. I rise to speak on the Community Affairs Legislation Committee. Additional information, Aged Care Amendment, Aged Care Recipient Classification Bill 2020 report. The amendments made by this bill allow for the introduction of a new classification system that focuses on independently determining the care needs of older Australians, assessing residential aged care and some types of flexible care. Currently, the fiscal contribution that the Australian government makes to aged care providers is administered through the aged care funding instrument, better known as ACFI. The ACFI is a tool which assesses the care needs of residents and is the largest source of revenue for residential aged care providers. The ACFI is based on dependency, so there is limited incentives for aged care providers to actively encourage reablement and rehabilitation methods. In reports produced by both independent researchers and the statutory aged care financing authority, it was found that ACFI provides strong incentives for providers to deliver outdated methods of care to produce higher subsidy payments. Concurrently, many aged care providers are not commercially viable. These corporations usually employ complicated business structures which, while being legal, cast a veil over their financial performance and transactions. Transparency must accompany this sector by increasing reporting requirements. This will allow for more informed policy and investment decisions. Labor also believes we need better transparency around funding. We also need to know that the funding going into aged care is actually improving the quality of care. At the moment, we know it isn't, because the Morrison government rates aged care like a monkey dancing on a razor blade. They have no idea, let alone interest, in the care of senior Australians in aged care. This mechanism is clearly broken and has been for some time. There has been report after report into the aged care sector around ACFI, the fact that this system is broken, and it took the government to finally uh, call a royal commission. So now, finally, there's been a light shone on this sector and the lack of uh, accountability uh, by this government and previous Liberal governments uh, in this area where we have not had a minister who would take responsibility, have a plan and was able to address the real challenges that this sector is facing. There needs to be a complete overall of financing of aged care. That's the only way that we are going to move this aged care crisis along, and the excuse that this government has been using since they set up the Royal Commission is we can't do anything because we have to wait till the final report is brought down. 
Well, we know that there's been report after report after report. So the issues that will be highlighted out of this final report, dare I say, that many in this chamber have known these issues have existed for a long time and have been trying to get this government to act to ensure that older Australians and some of the most vulnerable Australians are well cared for, uh, are not being abused, and they're getting the care that they so richly deserve. Now, in 2017, there was a review of ACFI which found that this outdated instrument needed to be replaced. So what have the Liberals done since 2017? Nothing. The government sat on this report for four years and is in line with their very slow approach to the management and any reform in the aged care sector. They've just ignored it, just shoved it under the rug, hoping it will just go away. Well, it hasn't and it won't. Unfortunately, this government has a real reputation for uh, having reports, having inquiries and allowing those reports to sit on the minister's shelves and in the prime minister's office, gathering dust and not doing anything with them. Now, Labor has been saying for a very long time there needs to be more transparency so that older Australians and their loved ones know what's happening, how they're being looked after and that their needs are being properly, properly provided for. Now, there's been a lot of uh, questions about transparency of taxpayers' funds that go into aged care. Uh, they've got over $20 billion a year that goes into the aged care system to support older Australians to stay at home and in residential care. And what we need is more accountability about where that money is going. We need greater oversight about how it's been expended. And we need to know that there is going to be transparency so that families will be able to make a very clear judgment on where best, if they need to put their mum, their grandmother, their grandfather, their loved ones, their friends into residential care, that they will know that there is transparency about the care and the funding that's going into the residential uh, sector in this country, just as they have every right to expect that once they have been assessed for home care package, that the level that they were assessed for will be delivered to them before they die. Because we have spoken about this, and I know I have countless times, about the wait times for people who are waiting for home care in this country is an absolute disgrace. An absolute disgrace. So under the, the amendments of this bill, there will be a move to a new instrument as a possible replacement for ACFI. This has been designed by the Australian Health Services Research Institute of the University of Wollongong. The group undertook the res Resource Utilisation and Classification Study RUCS, in 2017, and on 10 February 2019, the government announced a trial of an alternate residential aged care assessment tool. It was called the Australian National Aged Care Classification, the ANACC assessment tool. This tool is based on six key design elements. One, resident assessment for funding to be separate from resident assessment for care planning purposes. Two, assessment for the funding purposes to be undertaken by external assessors, capturing the information necessary to assign a resident to a payment class. Three, assessment related to care planning to be undertaken by the residential aged care home based on a resident's need and underpinned by the consumer directed care principles. Four, the provision of a one-off adjustment payment for each new resident that recognises additional but time-limited resources requirements when someone initially enters residential care. 
and five, a fixed price per day for the cost of care that is shared equally by all residents. This may vary from location and other factors. And six, and finally, a variable price per day for the cost of individual care for each resident based on their ANACC case mix class. Now, the Department of Health has estimated there will be around 250 full-time equivalent assessors. Funding for these assessors has been estimated at $90 million. The assessors will be required to hold a qualification such as a registered nurse, occupational therapist or a physiotherapist. While we will support the recommendations of this report, we do have concerns that the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission will not regulate the estimated 250 full-time assessors of this new instrument. The regulation of these assessors will be responsibility of the Department of Health. There are also concerns about the practical implementation of this instrument, including the automated decision-making for reviewing classification decisions and workforce consideration. And the fundamental problem is with uh, this report is that we have the same government on those benches over there who have no idea what needs to be done or what they're prepared to do as a plan to turn the aged care sector around. They cannot be trusted with aged care. Minister after minister has failed. The Prime Minister has failed on his election commitment. They cannot be trusted to care for older Australians. Thank you, Senator Polly. I now move to put the question. Senator Seaworth, do you want to speak on the same? No. No. I will seek leave to continue, continue my remarks. remarks. Thank you. Uh, we now move to the next legal and constitutional Senator Carr. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy, Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, I present the report of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs References Committee on Nationhood, National Identity and Democracy, to, together with a Hansard record of proceedings and documents presented to the committee, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. If I could speak to that. Uh, yes. Uh, this uh, report is not a typical uh, one for a Senate committee. It was uh, a new challenge for the Senate staff who helped us to produce it. And so, with that in mind, let me just uh, give a special acknowledgement of the committee secretariat, whose expertise and diligent work in dealing with what is a very complex problem made it possible to reach uh, to this uh, point. I'd especially like to thank the committee secretary, Sophie Dunson, and her team made up of Dr Emma Bayer, Anthony Paul, Sarah Laley, uh, Brooke Gay, Sophie Moffat and, and Maggie Morrison. And I would also like to record my appreciation of the works of Senator Stoker, who was the deputy chair for most of the duration of the inquiry, and Senator Henderson, who replaced her for its completion. I am also grateful for all the committee members who participated in the inquiry, Senators Chisholm, Green, Scar, Thorpe, Chandler and McKim. The report we table today is nearly some 80,000 words. It is much longer than most Senate reports. It contains 18 focused policy recommendations that go to building confidence in our democratic system. They are recommendations that go to the heart of all policy making. They are about sustaining public trust in government and our political system. That is a major problem for democracy here and internationally. This is a problem whose nature has changed throughout the inquiry as a result of the pandemic. Recent political research highlights that people are in search of certainty and security as they have been lashed by the devastations of the pandemic. And the restoration and confidence in science is gratifying. However, there are clear signs of fatigue in the public's response. The Redbridge survey, which is uh, given some prominence on the front page of the Herald Sun today in Melbourne, has highlighted that it's the poorest and the most vulnerable of our community that are most sceptical, for instance, about things like the various side effects of any vaccination program. So the question about the depth of commitment to the government's assurance 
in my mind, remains an open question. This report shows that we ignore the threats to our democratic system at our peril. The core recommendations that we present today are about strengthening the parliamentary process, in particular the committee system, as the most important means by which parliament holds the executive government to account. That's about way of focusing public trust by strengthening public institutions, and as I say, especially through the use of parliament. We call for the strengthening of the parliamentary committees because those uh, committees provide a role of providing the Australian people with direct access to this parliament. We argue that members of parliament must also be more vigilant when it comes to defending the democratic process in discharging their responsibility as elected representatives and ensuring adequate scrutiny of legislation. So nearly all half of our legislation is now has contained some form of delegated legislation and far too much of it contains measures which cannot even be disallowed by this parliament. We have a responsibility to restore trust in the accountability of the people's elected representatives. We must strengthen our civics and citizenship education to ensure that citizens understand the democratic choices that they have in how this place operates. We call for further political education in the value of science through the establishment of a parliamentary office of science. This report reflects the fact that this inquiry was in fact conducted in a greater spirit of bipartisanship than is usual in Senate committees of this type. The original Senate reference uh, required, uh, uh, was identified on the 29th of July 2019. The pandemic delayed our work. It caused us to question the way in which uh, and ask us to present uh, the uh, material that's before us in different ways. There were some 205 written submissions conducted through three public hearings. The report gives us a snapshot of what Australians thought about themselves and their country in this time of global anxiety. However, the decline in public trust in public institutions and democratic process has been apparent at least since the global financial crisis of 2007-2008. The origin of that decline can be traced beyond that upheaval to the end of the Cold War at the beginning of the 1990s. In liberal democracies, the consequences of the declining crust has been a backlash against what people refer to as the elites, and at least against those perceived to be the elites. A backlash by people who feel, and I believe often rightly, that the system no longer works for them. People who feel that they have been excluded from a full share in the opportunities that are available to others. These feelings of resentment and alienation have driven a rise in populist political movements. And in some countries, especially in Eastern Europe, liberal democracy, and I say social democracy, has all but been extinguished. The liberal world order that many in the West expected would uh, arise at the end of the Cold War has in fact yet to uh, be achieved. Populism is not an inherently bad thing and populist attitudes are not confined to any one part of the political spectrum. But the populist movements that have transformed politics around the world in recent times have mostly been on the far right. They have been whipped up in a virulent nationalist sentiment in pursuit of their aims. The kind of nationalism that all too often easily spills into xenophobia. And this is what's been happening in countries like Hungary and Russia and Poland. It's been present in events such as the Brexit referendum in the United Kingdom in 2016 and the election of Donald Trump in the United States. In the evidence of the resurgence of the far-right parties in France and in Germany and in Italy. Now it's far too early to tell whether or not the movement started by Donald Trump in the United States will survive his electoral defeat. The upheavals formed by the global context and the basis on which this uh, Senate committee examined its work. Australia has not experienced the chaos, the deceit and the manipulations of hatreds that we've seen in other countries. We've done a much better job in coping with the stresses and strains of globalisations than many other countries. But in undertaking this inquiry, 
We are also aware of the decline in trust which allows populist politics to take hold, and that certainly has been happening here as well. And the decline is measurable. The Democracy 2025 project, based on the old Parliament House, has tracked a fall in public satisfaction with democracy in this country. From 78 per cent of the survey response in 1996 down to 41 per cent in 2018. The disaffection with democracy and democratic process and public institution has not, however, been a relentless downward plunge. There have been peaks and there have been troughs. In particular, the decline in trust that seemed so widespread when the committee began its work became less evident once the pandemic was underway. It was replaced by a renewed public confidence in the power of the government, particularly the power of the states. It repeated, and I repeat, it remains to be seen whether that confidence will outlast the pandemic. What is undoubtedly true is that the level of civic engagement and debate in this country remains disturbingly low. Australians respond, in my belief, if they are persuaded that politicians and this parliament are acting in the defence of their living standards and their liberty and their democratic rights. I remain absolutely confident about that. This committee, Legal and Con, hopes that this report is and be treated as a benchmark for Australians whenever they debate ways to preserve and extend the country's vigorous democratic history. I commend the report to the Chamber. Thank you. Uh, Senator Scar, on the same uh, report? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Thank you, Senator Scar. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, at the outset, uh, if I could acknowledge for the record uh, Senator Carr's outstanding contribution uh, to this process. Uh, I joined this committee only two weeks ago, and the first document with which I was confronted was Senator Carr's 250-page report, I think draft chair report, and uh, I did enjoy reading it immensely, and I think it, uh, it reflected uh, a great deal of thought uh, on Senator Carr's part. I would like to uh, put on the record uh, Senator Henderson's and my uh, thanks to all the people who made submissions to this inquiry and all the people who gave testimony. Also, we would like to thank Senator Stoker for her assistance uh, in terms of preparing uh, what is a dissenting report. And I'll come to the extent to which it is a dissenting report. It's labelled such, but it perhaps doesn't uh, reflect the true spirit of it, and I'll come to that. Uh, before doing that, I would like to associate myself with the remarks that Senator Carr made with respect to the importance of the committee process in parliament. I absolutely 100 per cent agree. I would also like to associate myself with the remarks that Senator Carr made, and I'm sure, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, if you were in a position to do so, you probably would as well, <laughs> with respect to uh, the increasing trend for delegated legislation uh, to be uh, brought into effect without it being subject to appropriate disallowance procedures. So I 100 per cent associate Thank myself you, Scar. with those remarks. Now, Senator Henderson and I have provided a dissenting report, but it is important to note that there are many, many, many things in this report with which we agree, and many of the recommendations we agree with either entirely, in principle, or with the sentiments underpinning them. So that needs to be placed on the record. Uh, one of the areas where perhaps uh, we do diverge from our good friend Senator Carr in some respects is the preponderance of time in the report, which is perhaps uh, dealt with, deals with uh, extreme populism on the right wing. We, from our perspective, see uh, extreme populism and extremism of all types as, as something which occurs on both the left and the right. And uh, I think one only needs to refer, refer to the disaster in Venezuela that's unfolding after the uh, extreme left-wing populism of Hugo Chavez uh, to draw to the chamber's uh, attention our concerns in that regard. Also, we have some reflections in relation to uh, the characterisation of movements such as Brexit. And I note that Senator Carr did state that uh, populism in some cases is justified, but movements like Brexit 
do tend to lead one to question whether or not uh, a populist movement is simply an authentic uh, expression of dissatisfaction with the order that's in place and leads to radical change in order to give ultimate expression to the majority will of the people. The question is, when does that validity, when does that authenticity, when does that acceptable expression of democratic will start to transcend into something more, to go into the realms of the extreme? And that is a debate, an area where we could uh, converse and discuss for many, many hours in this chamber, and I don't propose to do so this evening. I would like to say that I absolutely agree with Senator Carr with respect to the uh, state of social cohesion that we have in this country, and I think we can all be proud that we live in a country which does have a great deal of social cohesion, and we've demonstrated that over the last 12 very, very difficult months, and we stand uh, in, in great standing when we look at what has occurred in other countries around the world in that regard. So I would like to touch just on a few of the recommendations where we do have a divergence of opinion. And I know that Senator Carr is sitting there with uh, bated breath, waiting uh, for my revelations to unfold. Maybe not totally baited. Some other analogy might be more appropriate. Uh, recommendation seven, uh, the, to the effect that the committee recommends that the Australian government investigates options to allow dual citizens to run for and sit in the federal parliament. Now, so we, we recognise that this recommendation is simply calling upon the Australian government to investigate options. However, Senator Henderson and I believe that uh, it is appropriate. It is appropriate that if someone seeks election to this place, they should not have any allegiance other than to Australia. And there is a renunciation process which people can go through if they are dual citizens to renounce any allegiance to a foreign power before they actually seek election in this place. And I should note in this respect that that renunciation is not the renunciation of their past, of their heritage, or of their ethnicity, or of their personal history. Far from it. It is simply a renunciation of allegiance to a foreign power, and that is the view which. Senator Henderson and I hold. And I should say in, in, in stating that position that we have the utmost sympathy to those parliamentarians who were caught up unawares in the citizenship, dual citizenship debacle of a few years ago. The other area which we would like to uh, express some concern with the recommendations is in relation to recommendation nine, the, whereby the committee recommends that the Australian government works with the Australian Media Alliance through a co-design process to develop a national strategy to tackle fake news and misinformation. And we simply say that any proposal which seeks to limit or in any way regulate free speech, uh, it must be incumbent on the government to consult extensively and make sure that any such proposal does not trip into the area of stifling free speech. And we make that point in the dissenting report. Recommendation 15 refers to uh, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters recently tabling its report on the 2019 federal election. The committee recommends the Australian government works with the Australian Electoral Commission to develop and implement strategies to increase voter enrolment and voter turnout. And we simply note the fact that is evidenced in the 2018-2019 annual report made by the Australian Electoral Commission that and I quote, the 2019 federal election saw, and I quote, the largest ever number of Australians enrolled to vote and a national enrolment rate of 97 per cent. We also saw a large increase in early voting and an increase in turnout for the House of Representatives. At 91.9 per cent, turnout was nearly one per cent higher than at the 2016 federal election. So there was actually a higher turnout at the last federal election than there was for the federal election before that. So from that perspective, uh, Senator Henderson and I are gratified that uh, many, many, many Australians are engaging, the vast majority are engaging in the democratic process as they should. Finally, recommend eight, recommendation 18 
uh, states that the committee recommends the Australian government works with academics, national institutions and cultural organisations in the non-government sector to develop a long-term national strategy to strengthen Australia's democracy. In relation to that recommendation, we simply say that we consider Australia's democracy to be vibrant, robust and healthy. And while we have no issue with the sentiments expressed in the recommendation, far from it, we're not exactly clear what this strategy would mean in practice. But we certainly, as we do with the vast majority of the report, agree with the sentiments that underpin it. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Dodson, on the same report? Yes, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I rise to take note of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Reference Committee's uh, Nationhood, National Identity and Democracy report. Uh, as a participating member of the committee, I didn't have to do the hard work. I uh, come along and listen sometimes and obviously had the privilege of uh, assisting the chair with aspects of this report and I wish to reflect on the unique nature of the inquiry. As the chair has already pointed out and noted uh, in his foreword, this is not a typical report for a Senate inquiry. It makes uh, relatively few uh, policy recommendations but engages in a deeper examination of our democratic processes and foundations. The release of the report comes at a time when we have seen a troubling decline of trust in public institutions. As noted in the report itself, this decline is measurable. The Democracy 2025 research project based in the old Parliament House in Canberra has tracked a fall in the public satisfaction with democracy from 78 per cent of the survey respondents in 1996 down to 41 per cent in 2018, and the chairman has already referred to that. The release of this report also comes merely weeks after we witnessed with horror the violent assault of democracy at the capital, the USA uh, capital, a violent assault that grew from the manipulation of truth and from the deliberate fanning of hatred built on generations of unresolved racial oppression. Nothing could make clearer the precious nature of our democracy, nothing could make clearer the need to nurture and protect it, nothing could make clearer the need to build unity, respect and common cause across our diverse populations, and nothing could make clearer the need for truth-telling to heal and build trust and peace for the future. As this report acknowledges, the concept of Australia's nationhood and national identity are deeply vexing for First Nations peoples. The true history of this country has, in the words of anthropologist Bill Stanner, been shrouded in a great Australian silence. The report notes that for many decades, official versions of Australian history have been told as if it starts from the arrival of Captain Cook and the First Fleet. The doctrine of discovery was applied to justify the seizure of lands on behalf of the British Crown on the basis of the myth uh, that it was terra nullius, no one's land, uninhabited. The report also quotes Justice Jane Jagot of the Federal Court, and I quote, by the doctrine of terra nullius, the common law of Australia could not and did not recognise the laws and customs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Until 1992, the Mabo decision, acknowledging this, uh, this land is the land of the Aboriginal peoples, would have conflicted with legal doctrine. That legal doctrine did great harm to our society and its consequences continue today." End of quote. What we have fortified through these harmful narratives and what this report suggests, and this is important, that we can reclaim our history and it is an opportunity to develop a deeper and more honest foundation for our national pride. And we have much to be proud of in the long history of the First Nations peoples, at least 60,000 years of occupation by the oldest continuing culture on earth, 
Over 50, uh, 500 different Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander nations, around 270 different language groups, peoples and cultures with deep connect spiritual connections to land and waters. Stories, songs, dance, art that are rich and unique and precious. What is often not told is the unique capacity of the First Nations peoples to live in this diverse land and develop their beliefs and philosophies, accommodating the wisdom of its lessons. This is a legacy that all Australians can identify with through our common humanity, our common occupation of these lands, as the outcry over the Jugan disaster has demonstrated. And I welcome and commend the committee on its recommendations calling for an active approach to teaching of history, which embraces First Nations history, civics and citizenship. Importantly, this recommendation urges as a model that includes resources developed by First Nations peoples. It's a basic concept, but for far too long our history has been written, interpreted and misinterpreted by others. The report's second recommendation recommends awards for excellence in teaching, including for the teaching of First Nations history and civics. Teachers who can bring alive our history, particularly those who can balance two-way learning across cultures and even languages, are worthy of celebration. I wholeheartedly agree with the statement made by the Chair and his forward that a high level of civics engagement is the best defence of democracy and the best means of building a more just and equal society. This starts but doesn't end with what we teach the next generation in schools. And those of us in this parliament have a role to play. Strengthening our democracy includes strengthening our work in this place. It means valuing our system of parliamentary committees, as the chairman has pointed out, which are a criti critical way for this parliament to reach the Australian people and for those Australian people to participate with the work of this parliament. It means safe safeguarding the role of the parliament in passing legislation, not merely resorting to delegated legislation, and there has uh, recently been the, the, the case during the pandemic, and the chairman has pointed that out. It means allowing and ensuring adequate scrutiny of government and parliamentarians, including through our processes of budget estimates and our National Integrity Commission. And it means having a broader vision about what our country can become. As the report states, and I quote, contemporary conversation about nationhood and national identity are about writing the next chapter in, a, in the Australian story. First Nation peoples can express their, form, they've expressed their formula for nationhood, for national identity and democracy, and it's called the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I commend the committee for recommending that the Australian government prioritise engaging fully and respectfully with the Uluru Statement from the Heart. In only, in only three months' time, it will have been four years since the First Nations peoples gathered in Central Australia and composed the Uluru Statement. Four long years, all of them under the coalition government. And what have we achieved? Much has been promised, little has happened. Uluru was no real revolutionary document. It sought constitutional reform to empower First Nations peoples and take a, to take a rightful place in this country. It calls for a First Nations voice to be enshrined in the constitution. It sought a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. We talked about truth, talked about voice, treaty and truth. And mod as modest as this agenda is, its implementation would go a long way to bring a new peace to this nation, a new enrichment of our identity. And as I said in this place yesterday, may those opposite open their hearts and embrace the Uluru Statement. This is the gap that has to be closed. Thank you, Madam Deputy. President. Thank you. Uh, we now move to the next. Sorry, on the same. Uh... No, it's not. I'm wondering whether Senator Dodson might seek leave to continue his remarks for first. Senator Dodson. Yes, uh, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President, can I seek leave to continue my remarks? Thank you, Senator Acting uh, Deputy President. I'm wondering if I might seek the chamber's indulgence. I'm Joe Whips and want to take note of the next document, and I promise I'll keep it short because I've got a very tight deadline to get to Whips. 
Senator Antic, uh, is to table the report. So, no, it's not that report. It's the Centrelink government the, response the Centrelink. to the Centrelink report. Um, sorry. With the concurrence of the chamber, we could do that. Very briefly, Senator. Seward. Thank you. I, I promise I'll keep it brief. As the gentleman on timeline, I rise to take note of the government's response to the third interim report of the in community affairs inquiry into the Centrelink's compliance program. Well, in fact, the government's response is the very reason that they got into the mess with the Centrelink's compliance program in the first place. It's basically a joke of a report. When you look at what the government says, let me remind the chamber: this is about robo debt, robo debt where the government is just paying out $1.2 billion because the program was illegal, or, as the government puts it, legally insufficient. It was illegal. The government does not support. Who could have guessed? The recommendation one, which was that they immediately terminate the income compliance program. The next two recommendations they note, um, and they are to do with the process of the repayment of the debt. Recommendation four, they note, but then go on to say that the government notes that a person can request a review of a decision at any time. Now, this recommendation was about actually going back and looking at elements of the of the act to make sure that the program was actually compliant with and actually met the legal requirements of sections 1222A and 1223 of the Social Security Act. Likewise, whether section 66A of the Social Security Act provides an appropriate legal basis for requiring individuals to update income information. The government's response is people can go and lodge an appeal or ask for a review, and we know from the extensive inquiry into this that, in fact, how hard that process is. Recommendation five, the government doesn't support. This is the one about an independent review be immediately initiated into this policy design administration impact of Centrelink's compliance program, including the income compliance program. Now, we established during this inquiry that, in fact, the robo-debt process of, re of the government going back and checking debts only goes up to uh, 2015. We don't know that the government has not, through this compliance program, applied other illegal processes and, and applied debts that are actually illegal because they haven't gone that far to back to look. That's why we need a royal commission into this process, because until there is a royal commission, we will not see the end of uh, the uh, potentially end of the illegal use and um, an, an illegal application of debts. This report is a joke. The government needs to go back and rethink its whole approach to this compliance program. Otherwise, we are going to be back, or other people are going to be back in this chamber, having to relitigate all these arguments again because we're in another fiasco in terms of the government using and abusing the Social Security Act that has, brings, has brought so much misery already to Australians where they illegally applied debts. I don't want to see this place having to see that process ever again. They need to have a royal commission. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Uh, I now move to Senator Antic and his report on uh, Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement, I present the report of the Committee on an Australian Standard for Training and Use of Privately Contracted Security and Detection Dogs, together with the Hansard Record of Proceedings and Documents presented to the Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. We don't have any ministerial uh, statements and we don't have any uh, committee uh, memberships. I now move to messages. The President has received.
Senator, sorry, Senator Zizelja, do we have any uh, ministerial statements or committee memberships? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I present three government responses to committee reports as listed on the dynamic red. In accordance with the usual practice, I seek leave to have the documents incorporated in Hansard. Thank you, Senator Cecilia. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Um, Senator Griff. If we're on to the next section, Madam Acting Deputy President, I just want to postpone. Not yet, a postponement? Senator Griff. Okay. Messages. Thank you. We now move to messages. The President has received a message from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to the Australian Immunisation Register Amendment Reporting Act 2021. Uh, the President uh, has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of changes to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial uh, Services. Clark. Business of the Senate notices of motion uh, standing in the name of Senator Waters relating to disallowance of the industry research development bankable feasibility study on high efficiency low emissions coal plant in Collinsville program instrument 2020. Thank you, Senator Griff. Um, I'm told, uh, Senator Griff, that we will be running out of time. Uh, uh, what I'm doing, Madam Acting Deputy President, is postponing uh, business of the Senate number two. Okay. For another date. Uh, is uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Griff. Okay. I postpone business of the Senate number two listed for today under my name, disallowance of the Federal Court and Federal Circuit Court Amendment Fees Regulation 2020, to the 23rd of February. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Waters. So, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I move uh, business of the Senate notice of motion uh, number one, uh, which is, of course, a disallowance of the industry research and development bank, uh, bankable feasibility study on high efficiency, low emissions coal plant in Collinsville program instrument of 2020. Now, I spoke on a previous motion to disallow this ridiculous waste of taxpayer money a feasibility study into a coal-fired power station in Queensland. Spoiler alert, it's not feasible. Renewables are cheaper, cleaner and create more jobs. Uh, I don't intend to repeat uh, everything that I said last time, but I do want to set out again why the Greens remain strongly opposed to this project. I'm seeking to disallow this grant of $3.3 million of taxpayer money being allocated to a private company, Shine Energy, that has no relevant experience uh, in order to support a coal-fired power station that we don't need in the middle of a climate crisis. The funding was a government pre-election promise from a slush fund designed to shore up Liberal and National Party support, particularly in Queensland. In particular, it was the SOP to the Nationals, uh, who love coal and who have abandoned farmers as uh, two farmers from a national party held a lectorate in my office earlier today uh, actually themselves offered up, and I uh, sadly had to assure them that was in fact the case. When Shine's Thought Bubble project couldn't get any funding from existing programs, the government created an entirely new grants fund, the so-called Supporting Reliable Energy Infrastructure Fund, and then it designed the terms of reference to match Shine's project. Uh, Minister Taylor announced that Shine would receive up to $4 million of taxpayer money from the fund for a feasibility study for a so-called high-efficiency, low-emissions coal plant two days before Shine was even invited to apply for the money. They won the thing uh, before they'd even applied. No other tenders were sought. We learned in estimates that the grant was announced by the minister before the department had evaluated a commissioned pre-feasibility study into new power plants. I regret to inform the Chamber that there's also been little oversight of grant money that has already been paid out to Shine Energy, and reports are that um, such money has been uh, fritted on vehicles. And there's no deadline set for completing this so-called feasibility study. The entire process stinks. It's currently the subject of an audit office, an ANAO audit inquiry, which is due to report next month. It is sadly yet another 
example of why we need a strong independent integrity commission, why we need more funding for the ANAO rather than the 20 per cent capacity cut that they're going to have to cop because this government hasn't given them additional funds in the budget process, possibly because they do such a good job and end up embarrassing the government for their own profligate um, and, and inappropriate decisions. But it's also why we need an enforceable ministerial code of conduct that would prevent misuse of public money. Now, even ignoring the integrity questions, as the government would be happy to do, this project is unsupportable. The government says, uh, oh, it's only a feasibility study, it may not get built. Well, newsflash, new coal-fired power stations are not feasible. And while the Nationals persist with their irresponsible calls for new coal-fired power plants, the Morrison government's own energy policies make it clear that new coal power is dead. The 2020 Gen Cost report by CSIRO and the Australian Energy Market Operator compares the cost of building and running various electricity generation technologies, and it found that coal-fired power costs wait for it, three times as much as big solar farms and twice as much as wind. And for the, um, for the policy wonks out there, they cost coal at $4,450 per kilowatt to build. It's new coal. They cost large-scale solar at $1,408 per kilowatt to build and wind power at $1951 per kilowatt hour to build. Analysis by the Queensland government last year found that a new coal fire power station would require a wholesale price of $120 a megawatt hour to be viable. Now that's double the current average wholesale wholesale price in Queensland. So unless you want Queensland power prices to double your own coal fire power plant proposal is not economically viable. Gen Cost, uh, CSIRO's report, says renewables quote, are cheaper than the cost of new coal and gas-fired electricity generation, end quote, even though they require investment to expand the transmission network to link solar and wind to the grid and to build up battery storage. Even with those additional uh, uh, capital inputs, it is still cheaper than coal, and that's not even to mention the climate impacts. Um, it doesn't account for the benefit of avoided emissions and the damage that that will do, uh, the public health benefits in avoiding those emissions, the jobs saved on the Great Barrier Reef, the jobs created in the renewable energy sector, and the, and the human and proprietal harm avoided uh, from not making natural disasters even worse. When asked about the Collinsville project prior to the state election, the Queensland LNP even this mob said Queensland had plenty of power. And I quote, the LNP is not proposing for any government investment into a new coal fire power station. Well, perhaps someone um, could tell former Minister Canavan that, or perhaps he, uh, given that he's in the chamber, uh, might like to take note that his own Queensland party was not in fact proposing the very project that he's been hounding the feds for public money to support. Now, somewhat surprisingly, last week, the Western Australian Liberals also saw the writing on the wall and they pledged to close all publicly owned coal-fired power stations by 2025 uh, as part of, I quote, the biggest jobs, renewable energy and export project in the nation, end quote. It's very interesting to see uh, Liberal state parties accepting the economics of renewable energy. Maybe they don't accept the climate science yet, but they certainly seem to be accepting the economics of it and one hopes that uh, the federal folk here are in contact with their state counterparts. As Frank Jotso, who is the director of the Centre for Climate and Energy Policy at ANU, says, and I quote, there is no prospect at all for a commercially built new coal-fired power plant in Australia. It really is an open-shut case now. Australia's electricity future is in renewables, bolstered by storage in batteries and pumped hydro, end quote. Now, all of that makes throwing public money at the Collinsville folly extremely negligent. This chamber could stop that criminal waste of public money today. We could disallow this funding instrument. We could do our job and refuse to waste $3.3 million of taxpayer money on a climate-destroying coal-fired power station run by a company with no experience in energy. Regional Queensland, along with the rest of Australia, doesn't need a white elephant coal project. Those communities need real, sustainable jobs powered by renewable clean energy. 
They need a government that acts with integrity, and they need a government that takes the climate crisis seriously and cares about their future. I look forward to uh, seeing whether or not uh, sanity will prevail and this obscene waste of public money for a feasibility study into a climate disaster when the uh, grid's are already oversupplied and we have cheaper, clean alternatives. Look forward to see how the vote goes on this. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, as the, Senate, the Leader of the Greens there, Senator Waters, uh, quoted a lot from professors and, and people from other political parties about whether or not this should happen. But no one, no, no, nobody she quoted from that I heard, and, and I, missed, I must say I missed the beginning of, of Senator Waters' remarks, but I, I doubt, I doubt uh, uh, there were any quotes from people who actually lived at Collinsville or, or, or even maybe lived in North Queensland. And, and, and I know, visiting Collinsville many, many times, that they would love to see this job-creating project in this region. I know that the Indigenous people, the Biro people of this region, would love to see a project of this nature. Uh, come there and provide them jobs. Indeed, the Bureau people know about energy. They did. They were involved in a solar panel project uh, a few years ago with Ratch uh, at the site of the old Collinsville coal fire power station, and they were, they were very happy to receive, um, I think, some hundreds of jobs through that project. But of course, renewable energy is a sugar hit. It only lasts for a little bit, then the jobs go away, and that's exactly what happened with the Bureau people. Once the solar panels were installed, all the jobs went. And there are no door jobs for them there at Collinsville, and they are meant to go back to puna in poverty while this renewable energy warms the hearts of those in the city. Uh, they want real jobs. They want ongoing jobs, and that's why they got together as a group. Um, Ash Dodd uh, formed a company, a, a bureau leader, a company called Shine Energy, and they, they decided, let's get behind the, a coal-fired power station, because they've got a coal mine on their land. All that coal currently goes overseas to other countries for, for them to create jobs. So why don't we keep some of it here for our own people? Some indigenous coal here to create indigenous jobs. And yet the Greens are once again denying uh, the franchise to indigenous peoples because they are pursuing an ideological campaign against coal-fired power, not one in support of the people that actually live in these regions. I only have limited time, so I want to quickly just say that uh, what are the Greens afraid of? What are they afraid of? If, 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 if everything if everything Senator Waters is, says is right, this study, the $3.3 million that we're debating here, it's a study we're debating here tonight, not the project, the study. If the study comes back and says, you know, this is not viable, it can't work, well, okay, that's, I've, I've said on the record, I'll accept that. That's fine. Let's, 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 let's focus on what can work. And if, if, the, if Senator Waters was so confident in what she said, what is she afraid of? Won't the inquiry find that? I know she is afraid because I think Senator Waters is quite intelligent and would know that there have actually been a number of studies, detailed engineering studies, showing that a coal-fired power station at Collinsville would stack up, would stack up, would lower prices for people in North Queensland and uh, could potentially make money depending on how it works with the uh, price guarantee that exists in Queensland. Uh, the, the GHD, for, uh, Dwayne Swan Commission GHD, which found this very thing uh, back in 2013. Uh, another report commissioned for the Queensland Department of Environment and Energy, I think by Energy Edge from memory, found very similar conclusions about this coal-fired power station. It stacks up for a reason, because there is no base load power station in North Queensland. And with increasing uh, investment in renewables in North Queensland, the case for this power station has become even more clear, because there needs to be a station that can follow the load of particularly solar in North Queensland and with modern coal-fired power technologies, we can make sure that the coal is there in the morning and the evenings when the sun is not to ensure that North Queensland people have power 24 hours a day, just as I'm sure Senator Waters would like, and, and, uh, and, and most importantly keep those manufacturing industries going in Townsville at the copper refinery, uh, the, the zinc refinery and other, many other jobs in that industry in Townsville. So I look forward to seeing the results of this study. I hope the Senate confirms it as it did late last year. Uh, because we should back Indigenous Australians in their, in their desire to create jobs in their region, and we desperately need some reliable baseload power in North Queensland. There being no further speakers, Minister. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this was a commitment the government took to the last election, 
We keep all our commitments, including this one, to the people of North Queensland. We are creating jobs and opportunities for Australians, particularly in a post-COVID-19 world. We want a stronger economy, supported by affordable, reliable power. A vote to disallow is a vote against jobs in North Queensland. There's already been a disallowance motion in the Senate on this matter. This is just another stunt by the Greens and a waste of the Senate's time. Being, being no further speakers, I will put the question. The question is that the instrument be disallowed. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. The, doors. the question is that the disallowance motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. 
The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes, Senator Davey teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 33. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. I thank senators. It being after 7.20, I propose that the Senate now adjourn and I will give senators a moment to exit the chamber before I give the call to the first adjournment speaker. Just give the chamber a few moments to clear Senator McGrath. Though I suspect you like an audience, so Senator McGrath, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And look at all the Labor Party senators running out of the chamber because they know I'm going to be talking about Paradise Dam, which is the greatest infrastructure fail in the history of Australia, and it happened on Labor's watch. Welcome to Queensland, where Labor are not only not building dams, they're tearing down existing dams. Now, farmers in, in Queensland, listen, Senator Watt is running out of the chamber like a chook running out of a chook pen. Now, farmers in Queensland's Wide Bay produce more than 75 per cent of Australia's sweet potatoes and more than 50 per cent of Australia's macadamias. They grow chilies and strawberries and sugarcane and passion fruit. Passion fruit. King, king of fruit, the passion fruit. At times, this region produces around 25 per cent of all fresh food grown here in Australia. But it's all at risk. Why? Because for more than 18 months now, farmers in the Wide Bay Burnett have been waiting for answers. 
they've had only one gloomy certainty that without significant rainfall, Paradise Dam will be virtually empty by June this year, according to Sunwater's own storage models. And this is all thanks to Queensland's Labor government. And unlike the Premier, Unlike the Premier, I've been to Paradise Dam. I've been, I was only there a couple of weeks ago, and it was depressing. It was less Paradise Dam and more like Paradise Lost, because what I found was a dam currently sitting at 20 per cent of its original supply capacity. And what I found that there were cranes in the sky, there were bulldozers on the ground, already tearing down the dam wall. And while works continue to tear down this dam wall, there is nothing but deafening silence from the Queensland Labor government and the mute Premier who are responsible for this terrible infrastructure fail. And this is a story I've told many times and I'll continue to tell because it simply cannot be ignored. And these farmers cannot be allowed to fail because it is out of sight and out of mind of the Labor Premier in Queensland. And the Premier might not like it, but we won't forget about it. Keith Pitt, the member for Hinkler, won't forget about it. Stephen Bennett, the member for Burnett, won't forget about it. Tom Marlin from Marlin Law, who was helping the farmers with their legal fight, won't forget about it. Bree Grimmer from Bundaberg uh, Fruit and Veggie Growers won't forget about it. Because in September 2019, in the midst of a drought—and don't forget for those who are listening home that Queensland is still two-thirds drought declared—but in the midst of the drought back in 2019, the Queensland Labor government flushed 105,000 megalitres of water out to sea and set to work to reduce the dam's capacity. So this is, this is the modern Queensland, where the Labor Party are not only not building dams, they're tearing down the existing dams. Farmers who invested millions of dollars and to build one of Australia's greatest food bowls have been left for dead without answers from this Labor government as to when this dam will be restored, how it will be restored or will it be restored at all. There have been inquiries and there have been motions in this place passed by the Senate, but no one is any closer to finding out how this infrastructure failed occurred. We know it happened on Labor's watch because Labor aren't really good at doing anything, are they? And no one is finding out the answers to how this can be remedied. Now, the Queensland Labor government continue to promise a report with a plan for paradise. A bit like how they promised no new taxes before an election and they delivered lots, or a budget and then failed to deliver one. It's the same old Labor, Labor tune. They push the report further and further into the future as the dam wall gets lower and lower and as the water gets lower and lower. They don't have a care in the world. But with the dam capacity projected to reach zero without rain by, by June, farmers in the Wide Bay Burnett don't have the luxury of time on, on their side. After investing on the promise of water security, these farmers are now facing another dry year plagued with uncertainty. Now, Labor senators might care, might care about this because they go to Coles and Woolies and they get their fruit and their veggie and they think it's all well and good. But if the farmers in the Wide Bay Burnett do not have water and do not have water in the dam, then guess what? Their fruit and veggies aren't going to be grown. And when you go to Coles and Woolies, Labor senators, you're not going to be able to get your passion fruit, your blueberries and your macadamia nuts. Because we know Queensland produces some of the best fruit, best fruit in, the, in the world. We know this opportunity not only underpins our economic recovery in, the, in this country, but it could bring significant benefits to regional Queensland. It brings jobs and it brings businesses, two things that Labor and the Greens don't really understand. So my message to the Premier is simple. Give our farmers the answers they deserve in the Y Bay Burnett and restore this dam. Senator. Oh, no. Sen Sen Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. Well, this week in the parliament, the Morrison government is returning to their happy place, cutting workers' wages. And in the Liberals' happy place, it is always time to cut workers' wages. Economy going well, time to cut wages in case they spiral out of control. Economy going badly, time to cut wages in the name of flexibility. No matter the circumstance, no matter what people need and no matter what the experts say, cutting wages is the happy place of Liberal governments. They're so happy there, they even boast that low wages are part of their economic design. They're so happy there that even in the middle of a global pandemic, they stand ready, ready to cut your pay. They're so happy there that despite 
calling our essential workers heroes all through 2020, they're ready to slash their wages in 2021. They are just so happy in this Liberal Party paradise that despite the dire need for us to rebuild our economy based on good, secure jobs, the Morrison government has set about doing the exact opposite. The government's IR omnibus bill includes cuts to your pay with more low-wage non-union agreements, cuts to your overtime, cuts to your right to permanent, secure and regular hours. Their so-called recovery plan will leave Australians worse off. Worse off in the middle of an economic crisis. Worse off in the middle of a pandemic when so many workers have worked so hard to keep us safe. Worse off when Australians have done it tougher than any time in the last 100 years. This government is so happy cuddling up to their pay cuts they've fallen asleep. They haven't even noticed what economist after economist is saying, that right now what we need is actually to get wages moving. Right now what we need is reform to make jobs more secure, not less, to build confidence, to build spending and to rebuild hope. But testifying to the Senate inquiry last week, the economists at the Centre for Future Work stated plainly that there are literally no pathways to higher wages in the Morrison government's plan. None. There are only pathways to lower wages. There are only pathways to more insecure jobs. 23 law academics agree. They say the Morrison government wants to punch a hole, punch a hole in the award safety net. And now nine public health experts have labelled the bill an immediate threat to public health. An immediate threat to public health. There is a crisis of insecure work in this country, and that crisis supercharged the pandemic, with low-paid, insecure, essential workers working two and three jobs to make ends meet. Essential workers in public-facing roles, unable to miss work because with no sick leave, with no buffer, no savings, they had nothing to fall back on. They needed to work in multiple locations to make ends meet. Christine Thomas, a cleaner who testified at the Senate hearings last week, she said it better than I ever could, and I quote, I have four children and a partner in my house with only one income. Workers like me continued to turn up for work in the pandemic. I worried about my safety and the safety of my family but I needed to keep my job. In return, the government has put forward this bill that will destroy job security. I don't want that for my future or the future of my children. Thank you for listening, she said. If only Scott Morrison would. Senator Seaworth. President. I rise tonight to speak on the outcomes in the form of a declaration of the Mental Health Services Learning Network, or THEMES, pre-conference consumer forum, Share Our Power, this year hosted by Consumers of Mental Health Western Australia. The declaration, Our Collective Voice, outlines consumers' vision for a national consumer voice. The declaration was created by people with lived or living experience of emotional distress, trauma, neurodiversity, mental health challenges and psychosocial disabilities, and seeks to outline a vision of a future where the collective voice of mental health consumers is heard, valued and central to the design and implementation of policy and care. I had the great privilege of being asked to accept this declaration, and in accepting the declaration, I committed to the forum, to tabling it in the Senate and to pursue a national voice for consumers. And I now table the uh, declaration, um, which I have already taken two whips. Is there any objection to that being tabled? There being no objection. It's the declaration from the forum, from um, the consumer forum on uh, mental health. My understanding is this has been agreed. Yeah. 
Con consumers of mental health are very clearly saying they, they want and need a national voice. A voice would give them uh, what a voice would give them. Um, they have articulated and, then, and the needs to be heard. And they talk about what a collective voice needs to be. It needs to be heard. It needs to be consumer-led. It's essential. It needs to be inclusive. It needs to be funded and involve people, be independent, peer-led and valued. They're the things they're calling for. What they um, see that it will give them to have this national voice and to have um, a consumer national voice would be and is validation, strength, acceptance, amplifying their voice, opportunities, belonging, power, agency, acceptance, safety, agency, empowerment. They're the things that the participants, um, consumers of mental health services, that is what they are saying they need. Consumers of mental health are very clearly saying this is what they want. The declaration is a reminder to all members of parliament that consumers must be involved in decision-making about services, that services must be reflective of their needs and experiences. Over the last year, it has been encouraging to see a renewed focus on mental health, not only from the government but across society, as we have all felt the effects of devastating bushfires, the global COVID-19 um, pandemic and the ensuing uncertainty it has created. And of course, late last year, we saw the release of the Productivity Commission's report and it's at, on, its, um, on Australia's mental health system, confirming that we are in the midst of a mental health crisis and that significant work is required to support individuals onto a path of ongoing well-being. It found that one in two adults will, at some stage in their life, suffer, suffer from a mental health illness or condition. One in five of us will face this struggle in any given year, costing the economy between $43 and $51 billion. With the Productivity Commission's report, we find ourselves in a unique opportunity to radically redesign our mental health systems in Australia, putting consumers of mental health and those with lived experience front and centre is absolutely essential and integral to any reforms that are initiated. I've heard, and so have many people in this chamber, I'm sure, the challenges that people face when trying to seek the care they need when they need it and from those and also those um, trying to find support for a friend or family member in times of crisis, only to be hit with roadblocks and red tape. We must take the lead from those who, have access, um, who need access to services and those with lived experience of navigating the system on what is needed to deliver the outcomes that people with um, suffering from emotional distress, from mental ill health, from trauma um, and so, uh, psychosocial disabilities, we must listen to the consumers of those services and make sure that they have a national voice. And I'm committed to supporting that call and doing and, and encouraging the Senate to do what we can to support Senator a national Seward, voice. Your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Last year, at Senate Estimates, I asked Sport Australia, the nation's peak sporting body, if strength, stamina and physique are relevant attributes in rugby union and Australian rules football, cricket, hockey, tennis, athletics, golf, swimming, basketball and so on. It's not a difficult question. An average year six student could tell us that strength, stamina and physique play a role in all of these sports. But our peak sporting body couldn't or wouldn't answer that question. After three months, they wrote back and said, I quote, the nature of individual competitions and teams is a matter for the relevant sporting organisation to determine. Aside from the fact that it's embarrassing for the peak sporting body of a sports mad nation to apparently not know that strength and stamina are relevant in most sports, why does this matter? because of Section 42 of the Sex Discrimination Act. Section 42 is sometimes referred to as the competitive sports exemption. In a country which, quite rightly, doesn't permit discrimination on the basis of sex in many aspects of life, this is the provision which makes women's sport legal. 
Section 42 says very plainly that it is not unlawful to discriminate on the ground of sex by excluding persons from participation in any competitive sporting activity in which the strength, stamina or physique of competitors is relevant. As drafted and as intended, it's a very simple provision. If strength, stamina or physique are relevant to the competitive sporting activity in question, it's perfectly legal to operate a women's sporting competition on the basis of sex. That's something that most major sports have been doing for decades without ever being told by a court that it's illegal to do so. Until recently, nobody ever questioned that it's perfectly lawful, not to mention eminently sensible, for sports like rugby, Australian rules, tennis, athletics and swimming to be able to offer women's sport and to discriminate on the basis of sex when doing so. If the law doesn't allow them to do this, then there would be nothing to stop any male from turning up and competing in women's sport. But suddenly in 2019, Sport Australia and the Human Rights Commission produced a guideline which told sports and sporting clubs around Australia that they may be in breach of the law if they exclude male people from female sport and should instead operate sport on the basis of gender identity. Sport Australia say that this guideline was requested by the Coalition of Major Participation and Professional Sports and its purpose was to provide sports with clear guidance about complying with the Sex Discrimination Act. It does seem more than a little odd that Australia's largest and most wealthy sports, each of which no doubt have access to their own expert legal advisers, suddenly in 2019 decided that they didn't know if their women's competitions were allowed to operate on the basis of sex. Presumably there are people within each of these peak sporting bodies who understand that the purpose of women's sport is to provide sporting competition for women, acknowledging that males and females have different physiologies which lead to different capabilities on the sporting field. It is bizarre that the people who run the AFL and Rugby Australia wouldn't be confident that strength, stamina and physique are relevant to playing their ultra-physical contact sports and therefore could operate on the basis of sex. And it frankly defies belief that, having been asked to uh, provide clear guidance on this, the best sport Australia can offer is to say, as they did at the most recent set of Senate estimates, that they have no idea and it's up to the sports to figure that out. The result of this piece of professional ignorance is, of course, that if Sport Australia or Rugby Australia or the AFL admit that strength, stamina and physique are relevant in those sports, they would have to stop telling sporting clubs that they'll get sued if they exclude biological men from women's sport. But they don't want to do that. They've already decided that they'd prefer to receive plaudits from activists for being inclusive than uphold the purpose and integrity of women's sport to let females play with and against other females. So we're treated to the unedifying spectacle of our peak sporting bodies pretending they don't know if it's helpful to be strong or powerful or tall in their sports. If these sports don't want to let females have their own competitions, then they should have the courage to say so. Don't hide behind a convoluted legal argument to pretend you have no choice. People around Australia see what you're doing, and we won't stand for it. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I've spoken in this place previously about sexual harassment in the workplace. And it grieves me that I need to speak it again. It's got to stop. It's got to be stopped. This abject failure to provide a safe place of work here in parliament and in politics more broadly has got to come to an end. I acknowledge Brittany Higgins' extraordinary courage an act of civic leadership in speaking out of her ordeal in the office of the Minister of Defence two years ago. The fact is that being raped in your workplace and speaking about it shouldn't have to be an act of courage. The crime that is alleged and being discussed today across the nation is a stain on the Parliament of Australia. And through that, through the behaviour that is tolerated accepted and even celebrated in some ways in this building by some clearly, it marks the Australian people. As Brittany stated, everyone should feel safe to report sexual assault without fear of losing their job. These incidents shouldn't have to play out in the media 
for change to happen. She's 150 per cent right. It's obvious to any moral person she is totally right. But media pain is actually the only way that seems to work to get the government's attention. And I have to ask the question, for how long? For how long will this government pay attention? Will it bat this matter away, as we've seen it bat so many other matters of moral integrity away? It batted away the much uh, reported sort of cultural malaise that hangs over this building in the incident with the Four Corners reveal of the Canberra bubble. People were shocked by that. But that was a few weeks ago, or that was a few months ago. What did the government actually do? What's happened? I wish I could say it was resolved. I wish I could even say nothing really bad came of it. But the reality is Minister Alan Tudge, who was the feature, one of the features in that, uh, in that particular piece, is now promoted to being the Minister for Education in Australia. That's how much moral courage and moral integrity Mr Morrison really has. He promoted the man who expo was exposed as really a perpetrator of this culture. I'm heartened by the growing belief in our nation that people should be physically and mentally safe in their workplace. At least I hang on to the hope, and I'm sure many of my colleagues here do. I hang on to the hope that this view of a safe workplace inside and outside the parliamentary circle is widely held. But no matter how many times the public shaming of perpetrators is noted by the media here in this parliament and supposedly noted by the government, there continues to be a culture of acceptance of sexual predation, sexual assault, sexual entitlement by the powerful over the less powerful that reeks like decaying corpse in the corridors of this place. The corridors of power, as it's often called, where power is being abused, where abuses are papered over. Well, it's pretty clear the papering over isn't working. And I fear that the hastily constructed inquiry that was announced by the Prime Minister today will fail, because it's another media fix, not an acknowledgement of a deep cultural problem that is manifesting itself in incredible struggle, despair, trauma for people working in this building. And it's not just about parliamentarians or their staff. It's about people who come into this building from the Department of Parliamentary Services. It's about people in the media corridors. Power is operating in this building, and it's not operating in a safe and enabling way. It's dangerous, and we saw the consequences of that danger not being named, not being properly handled, and we see it in the story of Brittany. There are sources out there. The International Parliamentary Union has informed Labor's announcements today of what we propose to do. Senator there needs to be a proper allocation of resources to this. And it... Senator Wish Wilson. Today, February 16, is known as the day the world said no to war, to the Iraq War. It is still considered the largest protest action in history. Over 10 million people in 600 cities across 60 countries took part in a coordinated action to march against the criminal US-led invasion of Iraq. In Australia, nearly half a million people also marched, and I joined them in Sydney, my very first ever protest action. I was very angry about this illegal immoral war, and I still bloody well am, for many reasons. Ten million people around the world knew this war wasn't right, but it still happened. Because a few powerful people and interests wanted it to. A handful of dreadful, deceitful diehards 
in various corners of the Bush administration at the time created a momentum towards war that couldn't be stopped, even by many good, honest people. No one is disputing the justification for this war was a lie, a manufactured deceit. Remember US General Colin Powell fronting the UN, making the case for war? Iraq needed to be invaded because they were a threat, they had weapons of mass destruction? Recently, US journalist Robert Draper wrote in the New York Times magazine an article called Colin Powell Still Wants Answers. In 2003, he made the case for invading Iraq to halt its weapons programs. The analysts who provided the intelligence now say it was doubted inside the CIA at the time. Draper goes on to say, at 10.30 a.m. the following morning, discussing the process that led to this speech, Powell addressed the international body. For the next 76 minutes, he laid out the US government's claims against Saddam Hussein. My colleagues, every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources, Powell said in his calm, sonorous baritone. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid evidence. The story Powell told marked a departure from the Bush administration's evocation of madness, evil and mushroom clouds. It was an investigator's meticulous brief of institutionalised deception and murderous intent. I advise all senators read this article and the investigative journalism that, that went behind it. He finished by saying in his article, the speech remains one of the most indelible public moments of the Bush presidency. By the time Powell resigned from his post, his performance that morning before the UN Security Council had come to symbolise the tragic recklessness of Bush's decision to go to war. Iraq, even then, was widely understood, had played no role in September 11, nor did it possess weapons of mass destruction. Nearly all the intelligence Powell presented to the world in his speech turned out to be false. And what a disaster it turned out to be. Hundreds of thousands of people killed, instability across the Middle East. Those 10 million people who marched, if still with us today, on this dark anniversary, should turn their minds to the ongoing persecution of Julian Assange. Assange and WikiLeaks are a threat to the powerful people who lied to us and took us to war. They expose lies and deception and war crimes. That's why Assange is facing a virtual death sentence in a UK prison. And have no doubt, Assange's extradition trial and his persecution is purely political and it's going to require a political solution. The US administration, and unfortunately recently the Biden administration, is making a political gamble that we have all forgotten this illegal and immoral war and the lies and the unnecessary deaths. If those going after Assange for truth-telling are betting on us forgetting, then let's use today's anniversary to remember, to not forget the frustration of not being listened to and the righteous anger of those who were quickly proven right by history. It is also a timely reminder we must fight for Assange's freedom and for press freedom. The only Senator thing we have, Wilson, the only thing we have to help— Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak in relation to the worrying trend of incursions into common sense, values and decency at state level across our nation. Now, on occasions I'm asked what drew me into public life, and it's a question I presume is asked of most parliamentarians. For me, the answer is simple. I was tired of watching the political class, including some polyester conservatives, allow the tide of cultural Marxism to wash over us. I wanted to be a voice for common sense of a voice for decency, and I wanted to play a small part in retrieving politics in this country from the political elites. Mr Acting Deputy President, ours is a country founded on Judeo-Christian values, values which have served us well over the centuries, values which have stood the test of time, values which are under attack and which are being forfeited day by day. The radical left, through their political wings, the Australian Greens and the Australian Labor Party, are determined to cleanse the public narrative of family values. We've been watching this for decades. But what's more troubling is the extent to which these incursions are being ignored at state level. The radical left has become 
emboldened and these trends are not corrected by pandering. State parliaments are being weak. The assaults on religious liberty, creatively known as conversion therapy bills, which have been moved in Victoria, Queensland and the ACT, provide a perfect example. The Change or Suppression Conversion Practices Bill, passed in Victoria two weeks ago, is a bill which criminalises the truth. And it passed 27 for and nine against. In 2021, South Australia will see its own conversion therapy bill and a further euthanasia bill appropriately dressed in the left's Trojan horse language, voluntary assisted dying. There have also been euthanasia bills introduced in Victoria, New South Wales, Tasmania and Western Australia. Last year, in my home state of South Australia, Parliament defeated yet another prostitution bill, only to see it rise again later this year. This week, the South Australian State Parliament is debating the Termination of Pregnancy Bill, a bill which would allow abortion to the moment of birth. South Australians have told me they reject this bill, with survey results showing that 63 per cent of South Australians opposed late-term abortion and only 20 per cent supporting it. Two weeks ago, I attended the Walk for Life on a rainy day with 5,000 South Australians who, like me, opposed this bill. Last weekend, a pro-late-term abortion gathering it really wasn't a rally. Uh, unsurprisingly attracted a mere 300 people on a beautiful sunny day. With this much public support for decency, why is the political narrative so slanted? Why are our state parliaments even debating such matters when Australians have not given them a mandate to do so? It's because conservatives have vacated the field and radical dogma is filling the void. The proponents of these matters don't give up. They don't walk away. They seek fleeting glory from a small but vocal minority. They seek to wear you down, and they have the time and energy on their side. A small but vocal cross-section of society is now in control of the narrative. We can't allow our state parliaments to continue being weak, to continue being compliant and to continue waving the white flag to a vocal mob. Ask yourself, why are your rights being eroded? Is your member of parliament protecting your values or is he or she hiding behind platitudes and false intellectualism? Is your member of parliament firm in their beliefs or are they scared of the activist media, scared of the corporate standover, scared of the mob? George Orwell once said, the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. Conservatives need to fight back. They need to become loud. They need to get more involved in the machinery of politics. Common sense, decency and values needs you, and they need your family and they need your friends. They need you to be heard before the mob cancels you and cancels your way of life. Senator uh, Ciccone. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, when I first came into this place in my first speech, I spoke about the values that my parents instilled in me and how they would be my touchstone through my time representing the people of Victoria. One of the most important lessons they taught me was that there is enormous dignity in work. Work helps contribute to a person's sense of self, their purpose. It brings the opportunity to make a contribution to the community, the knowledge that you're doing your bit. Work is one of the things that brings stability, routine and inclusion and importantly brings an income. And that income can support a family, goes to the purchasing of local goods and services, supporting small businesses, it provides food, clothing, warmth and a roof over one's head. With work, you get to have a go, as our Prime Minister has reminded us in the past. And when you have a go, you get a go, or so the Prime Minister says. The workers at the Opal Australian Paper Mill in Maryvale, in my home state of Victoria, are trying to have a go. But despite the rhetoric of the Liberal and National parties, there's no go for them because the Commonwealth is importing paper from overseas instead of buying quality Australian-made paper. In the three months from July to September of last year, the federal government only purchased around a third of Australian-made copy paper. This is nothing short of outrageous. At the height of the pandemic, the federal government ditched paper made in Merivale in favour of cheap overseas imported paper. 
I thought we were all in this together. Clearly not. Clearly the workers at the mill couldn't even count on the federal government to be on their side. The CFMEU Manufacturing Division is calling on this government to commit to purchasing 100 per cent Australian-made paper. A commitment like that will provide workers with stability and job security at a time when it is so badly needed. Australians and regional communities are already experiencing high levels of instability and unemployment compared to Australians in major cities. So why would this coalition, whose partner, the National Party, claims to be the party of regional Australia to have regional Australians' best interests at heart put the jobs of these workers at risk? It beggars belief. Regional Australians deserve a government that puts their interests first. They deserve a government who is on their side. Instead, they get a government who has taken no serious action to arrest the decline of manufacturing jobs, no serious action to support and invest in regional jobs, and to put the jobs of Maryvale paper mill workers at risk. My message to the coalition is this. Commit to procuring 100 per cent Australian-made paper. Do more to support and invest in regional Australia. Now, with the uh, one and a half minutes I've got left on the clock, I also want to turn to another matter. Recreational hunting in Victoria contributes $356 million to Victoria's economy, with almost three quarters of this going directly into Victoria's regions. In my home state, recreational hunters take, on average, six hunting trips per year. They visit regional towns patronise local establishments and purchase goods from local stores. In total, they are estimated to support over 3,500 jobs, either directly or as a result of flow and activity. These benefits are particularly felt in towns like Mansfield, Wangaratta and Traugan, where recreational hunters and the economic benefit they offer are significant contributors to the local economy. Now, I know that for some, duck hunting can be a sensitive issue. There are those on both sides of the divide that feel very passionately about the sport and its place in our community. Looking beyond these emotive arguments, the recent changes to the arrangements for the 2021 duck hunting season uh, are quite disappointing. And whilst I'm certain that the decision has been made this year, one on the basis of the very best advice, I'm sure there are many country towns in Victoria would say it is regrettable. Senator Green. Thank you. The Morrison government's industrial relations omnibus, omnibus bill will make job security worse. But that's not all the government is going after. They are using the pandemic as a disguise to launch a full-scale attack on the pay conditions and the working security of the very people that have helped us get through this pandemic. Make no mistake, this bill will not only hurt workers, it will also hurt the economy. Because what the pandemic has shown us is that insecure work has an impact on the way that we are able to manage this pandemic. The bill that the, that the government hasn't brought forward yet and is still working on changes to make uh, a deal with crossbenchers to try to slip it through in this uh, sitting will make bargaining for better paying conditions harder for workers. It will give more power for employers to casualise jobs and instead of making them permanent. It will weaken wage theft punishments, the ones that we have in place in Queensland, thanks to a good Labor government. And up until this morning, the planned, they had planned to scrap the better off overall test. This is what the Morrison government is choosing to do after the pandemic. Labor will not support them in these changes because Labor is on the side of workers. We know that insecure work has increased under this government's watch. The gig economy is exploiting workers so they're being paid less than the minimum wage in unsafe conditions. We know that dodgy labour hire firms are still getting away with employing workers who do the same job as someone employed directly through the company but for less pay and entitlements and weaker conditions. Australians are prepared to work hard. They worked hard through the pandemic, but this government is turning their back on them, and they need a government that is on their side. 
Labor understands that being in a good, secure job allows families to plan for the future with certainty. Every Australian deserves a good, secure job, and workers deserve to feel safe in a job that they can count on. It is true that the amount of insecure jobs has increased under this government. Right now, one in every four employees is a casual. Insecurity in work impacts on people's livelihoods, then their well-being. 80 per cent of the 800,000 hospitality workers across Australia are currently casuals. The Morrison government turned their back on casual workers during the pandemic by excluding them from JobKeeper. And now they are trying to change their workplace conditions to make it even harder for them to have security of work. The pandemic has shown us that we cannot continue to treat workers in this way. We must have a system that respects workers. That is why the Labor, Go Labor, government, will a Labor government will ensure that the Fair Work Commission has the ability to inquire into all forms of work and determine what rights and obligations should apply. The Morrison government will argue that being employed as a casual has the benefits of flexibility. But we know that when this mob over here talk about flexibility, what they're really talking about is insecurity. And no workers know this better than the workers in central Queensland who are working in the mines and in manufacturing uh, in our regions. Because labour hire has continued, has continued to make work conditions of people in those industries um, minimised beyond a same job, same pay ratio. We know that there are workers working alongside other workers. One is on an EBA, one is employed by a labour hire firm, but the labour hire worker is being paid less money. And not only does it mean that this per person who is working for a labour hire firm is unable to plan for the future, have a uh, secure financial future, get a mortgage, uh, plan holidays with their family, but it also undercuts the EBA worker. It undercuts the worker who is already directly employed by that mine, by that business. And this is something that this mob over here has talked about fixing for years, but it's not in their IR bill, and it never will be, because they don't care about making sure that workers don't have insecurity in work. What their bill will do is entrench casualisation, and that's why Labor won't be supporting it. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this adjournment debate. In August, the Premier of Queensland, Anastasia Palaszczuk, said that the government that she leads is committed to developing a treaty with our people. And then just a week, just last week, she announced a knee-jerk policy that will particularly entrench First Nations kids in the quicksand of the criminal legal system. Because News Corp, the real Premier of Queensland, wants it. For our people, an encounter with a police officer is often not helpful but lethal. Over 445 of us have died in police or prison custody in the last 30 years. Our people have not forgotten that the very police services that control the government of Queensland or even my own state of Victoria were the ones that came to steal our babies from their mothers, creating the stolen generations, something that is still happening today. It was these very police services that enslaved our men in chain gangs, shackling them to each other by the neck and the waste, a practice that continued up until the 60s. Instead of working with us like she says she wants to, the Premier of Queensland is sending police officers into schools in Cairns to target children. We don't yet know if these officers will be armed or not. This after Australia's 
governments were condemned at the United Nations for our barbaric practice of targeting and jailing children as young as 10 in this country. Let's be honest here. What the Premier of Queensland is doing is not about community safety. It's about building the biggest school-to-prison pipeline that she can get away with. In Queensland, kids, our kids in particular, will be shackled again, except the colonial neck braces have now given way to ankle monitors. The Premier of Queensland, because News Corp told her so, also wants to remove the presumption of bail for a lot of young people, as well as giving cops portable metal detectors to randomly check for weapons. We all know who will be most affected by these changes. First Nations children. 43 per cent of children in prisons in Queensland are First Nations kids, despite our people making up only 4 per cent of Queensland's population. The Premier isn't serious about doing the things that work because she's more interested in racing the LNP to the bottom and in keep, keeping News Corp happy. A Premier that actually wanted to prevent youth offending becoming devastating tragedies would keep kids out of the endless cycle of criminalisation in the first place. GPS enabled shackles or throwing kids in watch houses will not do this. A caring Premier that was interested in doing the things that would work be make, would be making sure that our children, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, uh, and their legal services have the resources they need to keep our kids out of the criminal justice system or the criminal legal system, because you don't get justice in that system. A good Premier would be moving heaven and earth, like she did for a Dani coal mine, extinguishing Jack Wang and Jangaloo native title for a coal mine, a dirty coal mine. Instead of backing and promoting better opportunities for our kids, she just wants to lock them up. We need culturally appropriate housing. We need better mental health services and family support services for everyone everywhere. A premier with a spine would be raising the age of legal, legal responsibility to the age of at least 14 and impl implementing strong, culturally safe diversion programs. The Premier of Queensland should be ashamed of saying she wants a treaty with our people while also implementing policies that will hurt our kids even more. That is not a treaty. That does not create peace. That creates more harm and locks more of our kids up. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise today to reject a statement made recently in this place by Queensland Senator Scar, who cynically used the protection of parliament to impugn the integrity of a former parliamentarian with no basis in fact. On 3 February, Senator Scar did not name the former federal member for Fremantle, Melissa Park, but he precisely identified her as the initial Labor candidate for the WA seat of Curtin in the 2019 federal election. He accused her of uttering a vile lie, of spreading vile misinformation, and by direct implication he accused her of being an anti-Semite. His false accusations relate to events that occurred when Melissa worked as a lawyer for the United Nations in Gaza in 2003. One of those events involved a well-documented case of Palestinian refugee woman being forced by an Israeli soldier to drink a bleach-like cleaning fluid. We must engage with what is occurring here. The senator is using parliamentary privilege to defame Melissa Park. He is using parliamentary privilege in an effort to silence criticism of the Israeli government for the human rights, rights abuses it has and continues to perpetuate against Palestinian citizens. I challenge Senator Scar to reiterate his assertions that Melissa Park has spread a vile lie and a vile misinformation and that she is an anti-Semite outside the walls of this place. 
If he is unwilling to do so, he must retract his assertions and apologise to Melissa Park for the record of this parliament. If Senator Scar is willing to do neither of these things, he must look at his integrity as others certainly will. For there are only two explanations for his professed ignorance about the facts of Militia Park's experience in Israel-Palestine and the human rights abuses perpetrated by Israel. One is that he has not taken the trouble to research the documented history of the matter before he proceeds to defame people of integrity. The other is that he does not wish to be troubled by the facts. There are no other options. I put it to my colleagues in this place that the cynical use of the slur of anti-Semitism as a tool to silence critics of Israel for that state's exhaustively documented human rights abuses against Palestinians must stop. Equally, this place must not be used as a refuge from reality from which false accusations can be hurled against people of greater integrity than their accusers. Thank you. And while um, Senator McLaughlin is just making his way to uh, the, the lectern, I will call Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I bring to the attention of the Senate the incredibly valuable work of the Taiwanese Buddhist International Humanitarian Organisation, Zhu Shi, and its founder and spiritual leader, Dharma Master Cheng Yen. Around the world, Zhu Shi conducts year-end blessing ceremonies. They are usually an occasion for great fellowship and celebration, attended by members and volunteers alike. During the ceremonies, leaders distribute red envelopes of blessings and wisdom as a token of Chen Yin's appreciation for their unwavering support of her organisation's mission throughout the year past. Zhu Shi is active in my state of South Australia, and we are very grateful for their charitable work. Upon entering public life, I have had the privilege of attending their year-end blessing ceremonies held in Adelaide. It is always a joy to spend time with Zushi volunteers who do so much great work in our community. As senators would be well aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused restrictions to be imposed on large gatherings all over the world. This challenge has seen organisations such as Zushi take an innovative approach to engaging with their membership. So, whilst the format in which this year's ceremony was conducted had to be changed, it still went ahead earlier this year, but in a digital setting. I, along with my state parliamentary colleague, the Hon. Tung No, a member of the South Australian Legislative Council, had the opportunity to deliver a message to the Dharma Master Cheng Yen on behalf of all those South Australians who have benefited from Zhu Shi's valuable charitable work. In 1996, Zhu Shi began with a group of 30 women who Cheng Yen asked to save 50 cents per day from their family budget and store it in a bamboo saving banks to help needy families. When the women asked Cheng Yen why they could not give the same total just once a week, she replied, because giving is a practice and we need to give every day. If we have a yearning or a positive desire in us, we must nourish it and bring it to fulfilment. Just as Buddha was guided by a noble desire to help others, we too can listen to those who are sad or help those who are in pain. As I've said, a key part of, this, of the year-end blessing ceremony is when members of Zhu Shi are given a coin. It also symbolises the 50 cents those 30 women saved at the time of the founding of the organisation. It is amazing to think that at the age of 83, the founder, Cheng Yin, still waits at 3.45 each day in the morning to start her work and devotions, including a daily morning broadcast address known as Wisdom at Dawn. She is considered one of the most influential figures in the development of modern Taiwanese Buddhism and is recognised as one of their four heavenly kings. 
I had the great honour and privilege of meeting Dharma Master Cheng Ying during a parliamentary visit to Taiwan in 2016. Zhu Xi has now in excess of 10 million members worldwide and branches in over 63 countries. It operates over 6,500 recycling stations and provides disaster relief aid in over 85 countries. Its critical work is based on the concept of four endeavours. This stands for its four major causes, which are charity, medicine, education and humanity. This translates to eight footprints, which include, among a number of items, medical research in hospitals, international disaster assistance, volunteering in the community and environmental protection. Around the world, Zhu Xi has undertaken many long-term and complex projects, such as building schools, hospitals, homes and places of worship for those communities devastated by natural disaster. I have witnessed firsthand the work that they are doing to assist those in need, especially during the bushfires in my home state of South Australia. I will conclude my remarks with the words of Dharma Master Cheng Yin which not only apply to the objectives of the humanitarian organisation that she founded and, continue to, and she continues to inspire, but also the challenging times that we are all facing. With perseverance and courage, the roughest roads can become smooth. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator, or on my list, Sir, Senator Ferravani Wells. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. There are various reasons to remember 7 April 2020, the drama of the High Court acquittal and later the dramatic film taken by helicopter of Pell's release from 12 months of solitary confinement in Victoria's Barwon High Security Prison. But another reason is the response of the Victorian Premier, alias Chairman Dan. Andrews could barely conceal his upset at the decision. Not prepared even to concede that the seven High Court judges may have released an innocent man, Andrews said he would make no comment about today's High Court decision, but I have a comment for every single victim and survivor of child sex abuse. I see you, I hear you, I believe you. Vintage Andrews, a two-fingered salute to the High Court and an eloquent sign of his willingness to accept a complaint however improbable because it involved a member of the Catholic clergy. Is that to be Victorian government policy? As Chris Merritt wrote in The Australian, relevant evidence about Pell's complaint, complainant, whom I shall call Jay, was kept from the jury by virtue of legislation enacted for the clear purpose of protecting those who claim to be victims of sexual assault. Unquestionably, there are thousands of Australians whose lives have been damaged, often irreparably, by sexual abuse, as the McClellan Royal Commission found. But it does them no favours when a government overreaches by replacing the presumption of innocence with one of guilt. But there are certain Royal Commissions that Andrews pays less attention to. The Lawyer X Royal Commission that exposed corrupt police practices, which resulted in tainted prosecutions and trials and overturning of criminal convictions. Despite months now having passed, and notwithstanding the recommendation of a special investigator, uh, we haven't seen the appointment of that investigator, and perhaps the Victorian police um, might just um, hoping that the Victorian public may just forget about Lawyer X. Perhaps the praise lavished by the Premier who described uh, Deputy Commissioner Ashton in 2020 after the evidence was in about him being an outstanding Victorian might make adverse action against him a bit too difficult. And so I turn to Pell's prosecution in Victoria. In early 2013, a decision was made within VicPol to get Pell. So much was considered in evidence given by Detective Superintendent Paul Sheridan at Pell's committal hearing. In November 2012, VicPol set up Task Force Sano, led by uh, Michael Dwyer. It was the same Dwyer who, in March 2013, set up Operation Tethering on a hunch, according to Melbourne journalist uh, Morrison Ma. The progress of Operation Tethering is intriguing. When Pell's barrister asked Sheridan at the committal uh, whether Operation Tethering was a get Pell operation, given that it was set up a year before any complaints about Pell had been made, Sheridan told the court, I wouldn't use those words, but I guess you could term it in the way you did. 
Confined to only Pell, a more accurate name would have been Operation Pell. That is why some have characterised the probe as having uh, an accused in search of a crime. Nothing much happened until 2014, when uh, Vic Pole Constable Ray, Senior Constable Ray, took a statement from a man who I shall call Smith, who made some bizarre allegations against Pell concerning Lake Bogger. Smith, as it happened, had a history of admissions to psychiatric hospitals. Um, Vic Pohl put Smith's allegations to Pell, who told police they were false and absurd. By the end of March 2014, high-profile radio hosts would tell Victorian listeners of a story to break, describing Lawyer X as one of the biggest law and order scandals in Victorian state history. On 11 April, on 1 April 2014, Ashton knew well of the scandal. In an email exchange with Associate Director of Media and Corporate Communications, Morton, uh, advised Ashton not to make a media appearance in response to the Lawyer X scandal because forth forthcoming announcements about Cardinal Pell could distract media and public attention. Morton wrote, the Pell stuff is coming tomorrow and will knock this way off the front page. What was the Pell stuff? Perhaps it was a reference to the forthcoming ABC 730 report, which would make serious allegations against Pell, which went to air the following week. Were the police working hand in glove uh, with the ABC? In December 2014, once again, Bernard Barrett becomes something of a middleman between Jay's mother and Vic Pohl. The initial contact did not concern Pell, but a former priest, uh, Galea, uh, who had died back in 2002. Somehow the complainant would come to allege vicious assaults against him and another choir boy who I shall name R. Barrett referred Jay to Ms Waller. Waller, Broken Rights, Barrett and the ABC Four Corners become topics on the Twitter sphere throughout this period. Some ha someone knows something is happening behind the scenes. By April 2014, uh, Tethering's uh, record logs show the operation, i.e. Pell investigation, had essentially lain dormant from 2013 and the matter now has priority. Why all of a sudden? What had happened with Vic Pohl? When Richter QC probed informant Reid as to why, after two years, the investigation had been given priority status, Reid untruthfully answered, oh, I don't recall, just simply that it had been sitting there, I would presume. He repeated that he did not recall what made it a priority. In May 2014, Barrett spoke with Jay regarding his allegations. Barrett, of course, was centrally involved in 2002 in encouraging a chap called Scott to make allegations against Pell going back to the 1960s. 60s. Perhaps Barrett had unfinished business. In June 2014, Jay made his first police sta uh, statement. In July 2014, Jay made a second statement, correcting aspects of the first one. In the months that follow, complainants suddenly appear in Ballarat, giving inconsistent and improbable accounts of abuse. Vic Pohl appeared to accept them as gospel truth. In September 2015, Tethering had worked up three sets of allegations against Pell at three different locations and at three different time periods. They were looking promising in the campaign to get Pell. Just before Christmas 2015, Sano Task Force makes a public call for witnesses of sexual abuse of an unknown number of male victims who were 14 years of age at the time, allegedly occurring at the cathedral. By June 2017, after a series of back and forth manoeuvres with the Office of Public Prosecution, Vic Pohl decided to lay charges against Pell. Did Andrews know of what was happening behind the scenes? After all, Andrews' former chief of staff, Brett Curran, was now working with Ashton. Was there a Belt and Road Chinese wall to prevent whispers? The laying of criminal charges against the most senior Australian Catholic would eviscerate the reputation of the cardinal in the community. The police knew that from the moment going forward, it would be not so much for the prosecution to prove guilt, rather it would be for Pell to prove his innocence. That was so even before the ABC devoted thousands of dollars and hours uh, to attempt and other media attempted to poison the mind of the community against the Cardinal. Lots of smoke, there must be fire. Uh, experienced prosecutors publicly expressed their concerns as to whether Pell could ever receive a fair trial given the hostility of the media against him. 
Senior police, armed with their potpourri of allegations, decided they would conduct a police um, interview of Pell. Three policemen went to Rome, Patton, Sheridan and Reid. Um, and of course, the, the trip could not have happened without Ashton authorising it and sending his deputy. But that was odd in its own way, for having flown all the way to Rome for the purpose of interviewing Pell, Patton stood outside the interview. Why did Patton go? What occupied him while he was there? What did Patton report to Ashton? Did Ashton report further along the chain? And those who walked the corridors in Victoria speak of Sheridan as an honest, hard-working detective. That is why Sheridan's own role in the investigation is worth looking into, for it likely that he, that he knows everything of what was going on behind the scenes within Vic Pohl. Sheridan was one of the two persons present throughout the entire interview in Rome, and Sheridan barely asked a question. He certainly did not challenge any of Pell's answers to the myriad of allegations put to him by Reid. Pell answered every question, forcefully denying the allegations and telling them whom they should speak to for corroboration. Despite all of that, Vic Pohl decided to press, uh, uh, to press on with charging Pell. Why? The time had come for a royal commission, not a tame and inconclusive inquiry into the relationship between a Victorian Labor government and Vic Pohl. All of the ALP red shirts matter. Again, Curran and Ashton were central. Lawyer X, the Pell prosecution, the connections between the Ashton and Spring Street over private security and hotel quarantining and other matters all need examination. This is more than just about Cardinal Pell. It is about whether the people of Victoria can have confidence in Vic Pohl to be properly independent of government and not an agency of the executive of the day. Senator Rice. Deputy President. As the Australian Greens spokesperson on foreign affairs, I rise to speak out about human rights violations wherever they occur, because we believe that universal human rights are fundamental and must be respected in all countries and for all people. That's why we call out human rights violations here in Australia and we'll do the same for other countries where they occur. We call on the Australian government to consistently advocate for human rights internationally wherever violations and attacks on human rights occur. Tonight I want to start in Myanmar. We are incredibly concerned by the reports overnight of military forces being deployed against protesters. People have been injured by rubber bullets, students have been detained, and those who are protesting for freedom and democracy are facing an internet blackout. And many have been detained, including Aung San Suu Kyi, President U Win Mint, and Australian Sean Turnell. We affirm our support for those protesting. There have been protests around the country, as well as a strike by government workers. I want to quote particularly the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Myanmar, Tom Andrews, who said, It's as if the generals have declared war on the people of Myanmar. Late night raids, mounting arrests, more rights stripped away, another internet shutdown, military convoys entering communities. These are signs of desperation. Attention, generals, you will be held accountable. I reaffirm the Greens' calls for the military leaders who have undertaken this coup in Myanmar to release those who have been detained and to cease interference with election outcomes and democratic transition. And I urge the Australian government to take clear steps to address this assault on democracy and work to free those who have been detained. The Australian Defence Forces must immediately suspend their military relationship with Myanmar. And we should immediately impose targeted sanctions on General Min Aung Hlaing and all others involved in this action by the military. And if Myanmar's generals continue to refuse to release those who are arbitrarily de detained, the Australian government should be considering further options, including extending the targeted sanctions to um, the corporate holdings of the key generals and to their immediate family members. We welcome the decisions of the United States and, the, and New Zealand providing a clear response to the coup. But sadly, some of Myanmar's regional neighbours have not sent the same clear message. As some recent coverage noted, the coup d'etat this week has thrust China back into the uncomfortable position it held for years with Myanmar as the principal defender of a military dictatorship 
facing an international firestorm of criticism. And that's particularly noticeable given China's failure to acknowledge the coup, referring to it instead as a major cabinet reshuffle. So the world is watching with regard to the Chinese government's relationship with the Myanmar military coup. They are on notice. And I now want to continue to focus on the Chinese government and on two of their most egregious recent attacks on human rights, and to call on the Australian government to do more to support people in China and in Hong Kong. And the attacks on democracy in Hong Kong are incredibly concerning. The most recent changes in Hong Kong will prevent recognition of dual citizenship. And as the ABC and others have reported, an estimated 100,000 Hong Kongers hold an Australian passport. But if the local laws are enforced, dual nationals will be recognised as Chinese citizens only and could be prevented from accessing Australian consular support. Now, I recently met with Hong Kongers who were incredibly sad for the assault on democracy we've seen in Hong Kong and concerned about the changes impacting Hong Kongers with dual citizenship. We welcome the, government, the Australian government's safe haven offering visa extensions of five years and potentially a permanent pathway to residency. But we call on the government to do more and to grant permanent protection for all Hong Kongers who currently reside in Australia. I am also glad to see that the Australian government has changed its travel advice to highlight the risks to Australian citizens who are Hong Kongers. I also want to particularly mention um, again the tragic situation in Xinjiang in China. Many words have been spoken about the cultural genocide the Uyghurs are facing, and I was appalled to see the recent reports of systemic rape of people detained in camps in Xinjiang. The situation demands a UN investigation, and we call on the Chinese government to allow full and unfettered access to UN officials and call on the Australian government to advocate directly and multilaterally for this access and for human rights overall. One of the key international institutions that aims to seek justice for those who are subject to the gravest of human rights abuses is the International Criminal Court, or the ICC. And last week, the ICC determined that it had jurisdiction in Palestine. Disgracefully, Australia was one of only seven countries that argued that the International Criminal Court should not have jurisdiction because Australia does not recognise Palestine as a state. The Australian government's position is a disgrace and deeply disappointing for Australians who support accountability for crimes, including alleged crimes, no matter who commits them or where they are committed. And the Greens' position is that in any military occupation or conflict, such as exists in Israel-Palestine, everyone loses. It is clear that peace and sustainable coexistence can only occur if there is justice for all and if there is a commitment from all parties to reject all forms of violence and cease all forms of human right, rights violations. Many countries have modelled for us that reconciliation depends fundamentally on truth-telling, hence the famous Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. Wise leaders will view this ICC decision not as a threat to Israel, but as a tool towards the goal of truth and reconciliation, which helps to frame the context of a sustainable and lasting peace. Human Rights Watch has highlighted some of the actions that the ICC have indicated may constitute war crimes in their statement. This included their statement that for over 50 years, Israeli governments have transferred their citizens into the occupied Palestinian territory, even though such transfers to occupied territories are unlawful under international humanitarian law. The alleged crimes at issue at the I of the ICC are not limited to unlawful settlement-related activity. Human Rights Watch documented unlawful attacks, including war crimes and apparently deliberate attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure during the 2014 hostilities in Gaza that killed more than 1,500 civilians in the Gaza Strip. Human Rights Watch also highlighted that Palestinian armed, armed groups, including Hamas, launched thousands of rockets and mortars indiscriminately towards Israeli population centres 
killing five Israeli civilians and wounding 36. I visited the West Bank and Israel in 2017, and despite having known for decades about the rolling tragedies in the Middle East, it was only on visiting that it really hit home. And I will remember to my dying day meeting with the widow of Yaqub Abu al kiyan in the ruins of their home in the Bedouin village of Umm al-Haran, three months after her husband had been shot to death during the destruction of their village. The ongoing violent killings, loved ones being left to grieve and to cope with massive losses, individuals and whole communities living with lifelong injuries and trauma, and every element of life is impacted by not having the security of peace. And it's because of how important this is for people's lives, as well as for the peaceful future of the two nations, that the Australian Greens welcome the ICC's recent decision. If international justice is to apply equally, then war crimes should be investigated wherever they occur. And I'd also like to highlight here the point raised by Human Rights Watch, which is an important one, that an ICC probe is not about taking sides in a political conflict. It's about ensuring that perpetrators of serious international crimes, both Israeli and Palestinian, answer for their actions at a fair trial. As a court of last resort, the ICC has a critical role to play in situations like Palestine where the path to domestic justice is closed and impunity is the norm. We call on the Australian government to advocate for human rights equally everywhere and to cease its opposition to this ruling by the ICC. And of course, at the same time, we reiterate our call that they should recognise the state of Palestine as so many other nations have done. Thank you. Uh, the, Senate, the Senate stands adjourned and will reconvene tomorrow at uh, 9.30.